Chapter 12 It was late when Diana fell asleep, and even later when she woke up on Sunday morning. With Rita gone, the house seemed empty, and prospects for breakfast weren't good. On her salary, eating out wasn't something Diana could afford often, but that Sunday morning seemed like a time to splurge. Both she and Davy had been through enough of a ringer that a special treat was in order. They drove to Uncle John's Pancake House on Miracle Mile and waded through the Sunday morning crush. Over brightly colored menus, Diana explained that Davy could choose from any number of Milgon foods. Eggs and bacon, buttermilk pancakes, Swedish pancakes, German pancakes. But popovers with honey or tortillas with peanut butter were not an option. The waitress, a crusty old dame from the eat it or wear it school of food service, arrived at their table, pad in hand. She fixed her eyes on Davy. What'll you have, young man? Shyly, he ducked his head. Swedish, he said in a strangled whisper, with the red berries. And what to drink? Milk. How about you, ma'am? German pancakes and coffee. The waitress nodded and disappeared, returning a few moments later with coffee and milk. She put the milk in front of Davy. How'd you get all those stitches? she asked. Davy blushed and didn't answer. He was in a car accident, Diana explained, speaking for him, out on the reservation. The waitress frowned at that, but she left the table without saying anything more. A few minutes later she was back, carrying a section of the Sunday paper. "'This you?' she asked, holding the paper up so Davy could see it. Davy looked at the picture and nodded. "'What's that?' Diana asked. The waitress looked at Diana in surprise. "'You mean you don't know about it?' Handed the paper, a stunned Diana lad found herself staring into the eyes of a clearly recognizable picture of her son, complete with stitches. "'Your breakfast on me this morning, sweetie,' the waitress was saying to Davy. You sound like a regular little hero to me, saving that old woman's life. Now, wouldn't you like something else along with your pancakes? A milkshake, maybe? No, Davy said. Thank you. Just milk. The waitress left, and Diana turned on Davy. How did you get your picture into the newspaper? Her son glanced nervously at the paper. Next to his own picture was a smaller one, a headshot of the man who had spoken to him the previous afternoon. The man had a camera. He took my picture yesterday while you were inside the hospital with Rita. You talked to a reporter? Diana demanded, her voice rising in pitch. You let him take your picture? Davy squirmed lower in his chair until his eyes barely showed above the top of the booth. Yes. Why didn't you tell me? He was a friend of my father's, Davy told her. I was afraid you'd get mad. And, of course, he was right. From George's Beat, a bi-weekly column by George O'Connell in the Arizona Daily Sun, June 14, 1975. Seven years ago Friday, a young Papago woman died brutally in the desert west of Tucson. Two men were eventually implicated in the death of 22-year-old Gina Antone. One of them was a student of creative writing at the University of Arizona. And the other was the English professor in charge of that same program. The professor, Andrew Carlyle, was eventually convicted of voluntary manslaughter and second-degree rape. He was sentenced to serve time in the Arizona State Prison at Florence, while his student, Garrison Ladd, committed suicide rather than face arrest and conviction. Now, seven years later to the day, two of the families involved in that earlier tragedy are once more linked together in the news, only this time with a far different result. On Friday, Rita Antone, the slain girl's 65-year-old grandmother, was severely injured in an automobile accident on Highway 386, 40 miles west of Tucson. Mrs. Antone now makes her home in Tucson with Diana Ladd, Garrison Ladd's widow, and her son, David. Medics from the scene report that Mrs. Antone would probably have died without reaching the Indian Health Service Hospital in cells, had it not been for the quick-witted thinking of six-year-old David, who was himself injured in the accident. 
One of the first to arrive on the scene after the single-vehicle rollover accident was Joe Baxter, a Tucson resident on his way to Rocky Point for the weekend. Baxter said that it was David Ladd's firm insistence that there was an ambulance available at the Kitt Peak Observatory that prompted him and a traveling companion to seek help there. Aid summoned from either Sells or Tucson probably would have arrived too late to save Mrs. Antone's life. Years ago, when I was finishing my graduate degree in English at the University of Arizona, I was enrolled in a literature class with David Ladd's father, who, like many of our classmates, had the delusions of being the great American novelist and creating a heroic masterpiece to leave as a legacy. Mostly those dreams were just that, all dream and no action. However, I'm realizing now that there's more than one kind of masterpiece. Garrison Ladd's son, reticent about his own brave behavior despite injuries that required twelve stitches, is that heroic masterpiece. But he's certainly not the only hero in the drama. Talking to him, I learned that Rita Antone, grandmother of the girl whose murder was linked to Garrison Ladd, is now a well-loved member of the Ladd family. It strikes me as ironic, and more than a bit inspiring, that these two women, Diana Ladd and Rita Antone, an Anglo woman and an Indian whose lives were first linked by death and mutual tragedy, have gone on to forge a relationship based on love and mutual respect. It is an atmosphere in which two courageous women are raising a very responsible young man, one who in no way can be regarded as a chip off the old block. In a world where bad news usually outweighs the good, where there are always far more questions than there are answers, it's refreshing to know this kind of thing can happen. Long ago, Evil Siwani a powerful medicine man, became jealous of E.E. E. Toy. Three times the medicine man and his wicked followers killed E.E. E. Toy, and three times E.E. E. Toy came back to life. The fourth time, when morning came, E.E. E. Toy was still dead. That's all right, his followers said. In four days he will come back to life. But on the morning of the fourth day, E.E. E. Toy was still dead. Many years passed. One day some children from a village found an old man sitting next to a charco near where Iitoy's bones had been left to dry in the sun. The old man was making a belt to carry an olla. "'What are you doing, old man?' the children asked. "'You must watch carefully,' he said. "'Something surprising is going to happen.' So the children went home and told their parents. All the people from the village came to see the old man. They found him filling his oya with water. The people knew at once he was E.E. E. Toy, grown to be very old. They wanted to talk to him, but before they could, he picked up his oya and started off toward the east. There were many people along the way, but E.E. E. Toy knew these were the Sobsgam, the Apache-like followers of evil Siwani, so he didn't speak to them. When Iitoy e. arrived at the village in the east, he asked to see the chief. Then he sang his song and told them he was Iitoy e. who had made them. He told them how the Ob, the enemy, had killed him four times, and how each time he had come back to life. The chief of the east listened to Iitoy's e. song. When it was finished, he said, I may not be able to help you, but go to my brother in the west. Tell him your story. I will do whatever he says. Iitoy e. traveled far until he found the chief of the West. He sang his song and told about how the medicine man and his followers, the Sobskam, had killed him four times, and how each time he had come back to life. The chief of the West shook his head. I don't know if I can help you. Go to my elder brother, chief of the North, and ask him. I will do whatever he says. So Iitoy e. went to the chief of the north, who listened to his song. "'I do not know if I can help you,' the chief said. "'Go to my elder brother, chief of the south. I will do whatever he says.' Once more Iitoy e. traveled a long, long way, and once more he sang his song about how evil Siwani and the Sobskam had killed him four times and how he had come back to life. As soon as the chief of the south heard this, he sent a messenger to the villages of all his brothers. Come, 
he told them. Whoever wants to prove his manhood must come with me. This man has suffered much at the hands of Siwani and his sobskam. We must go and help him. And this, my friend, was the beginning of the final battle between evil Siwani and Iitoi. Morning came, and so did breakfast. Rita lay with her eyes closed, but she didn't sleep. Understanding woman went to the circle to visit with her friends, while dancing quail gravitated to the younger women. Unfortunately, her new clothing and job at the mission didn't purchase what she wanted most, respect and acceptance from her peers. To the others, she was still Hegel Wiikam, still orphaned child. Girls who worked in Tucson still looked down on her. Laughing easily, they gossiped endlessly about the latest one of their number who had done bad and been shipped home in disgrace. They giggled about exploits from their latest day off and speculated about who would marry next. On the fringes of their laughter, Dancing Quail had nothing to say. Several girls who were planning weddings were younger than she. Finally, one of them turned on her, a mean girl she had known briefly in Phoenix. "'What about you?' the girl asked. "'Who will marry you?' "'I don't know,' Rita answered despairingly, ducking her head. The other girl giggled. "'Since you already live with the sisters, maybe you should be one of them. If no Othum will have you, maybe you should be a bride of Christ.' At that, all the girls broke into gales of laughter. Ashamed, Dancing Quail took her sleeping mat and blanket and fled into the night, far from the fires and songs of the feast, far from the other girls' deriding laughter. She stumbled up the mountain to a place where she had played and hidden as a child. There she lay down and wept. Much later, long after she'd quit crying, Dancing Quail heard someone calling her name. Worried when he found her missing from the group, Father John came looking for her. Here, she called in answer. What's wrong? he demanded, blundering into the clearing. Why did you run away? Is someone here with you? I am Hezelko, she answered. I am alone. But why? What's wrong? He knelt beside her. As he reached out to touch her face, the tears started again. I am not brave enough to choose for myself. The girls say no one will choose me. Nonsense! Father John gathered her into his arms. You're young and beautiful, strong and healthy. Of course someone will choose you. Despite his intention of making only an obligatory appearance at the dance, it had been necessary, in order to be polite, that Father John drink the thick, pungent wine. He had sat in the circle while servers had come around several times, dispensing wine from ancient wine-stained baskets. Without his being aware of it, the volatile drink had overtaken him. The comforting fatherly caress with which he intended to console dancing quail soon evolved into something quite different. The mutual but unacknowledged attraction between them had long been held at bay by sobriety and by the singular force of Father John's convictions. Now those convictions crumpled. What passed between them then was as unanticipated and as electrifying as a bolt of lightning on a clear, still night. It happened once, and only once, but, as is so often the case, once was more than enough. The damage was done. Again, Andrew Carlyle took his time at the scene of his latest triumph. He treated himself to a luxurious bath. Johnny Rivkin's bathroom held numerous wonderful bath potions. Finished bathing, Carlyle meticulously removed all body hairs from the drain and flushed them down the toilet. He went through the room, looting it at leisure, taking all the cash, leaving everything else, and thoroughly cleaning each surface as he finished with it. The closet was another matter entirely. 
There were some things in there that he simply couldn't bear to leave behind, including a loose-fitting, lush, pink silk pantsuit that fit him perfectly. Two more wigs, these of much better quality than the one he had purchased, some underwear, and two pairs of hooker-heel shoes that might have been made for him. After choosing some items to wear, Carlyle stowed the rest, including the clothing he'd worn into the hotel, in one of Rivkin's monogrammed Hartman suitcases. He took more than usual pains with his makeup, so that shortly after six that Sunday morning, when a well-dressed woman walked through the lobby carrying a suitcase, nobody paid the slightest attention to her. She paused outside the door long enough to pull a Sunday edition of the Arizona Daily Sun out of a vending machine, but nobody noticed that, either. Three blocks away, totally out of sight of the Santa Rita, Andrew Carlyle climbed back into Jake Spaulding's waiting valiant. As he drove north, he took perverse pleasure in anticipating the kind of effect his costume would have on his mother. Myrna Louise had never approved of him dressing up not even when he was little. Oh, well, he thought, dismissing her. Other than packing his lunch and maybe washing a few clothes now and then, what had Myrna Louise ever done for him? Driving home from breakfast, Diana seethed with anger. Some of it was aimed at Davy, but most was reserved for that damn full-of-business columnist. It was despicable for him to have taken advantage of an innocent child to interview him and pry out information. Not only that, what, if anything, had he told Davy about his father? How much did George O'Connell know to tell? Not as much as I do, Diana thought, with her whole body aching from the pain of remembering. Not nearly as much. Garrison Ladd had slept the entire day away while Diana waited with her stomach roiling inside her. She wanted him to wake up and talk to her. Feeling so physically ill bothered Diana. It wasn't like her to be sick. Since she wasn't feverish, she chalked it up to lack of sleep and a bad case of nerves. She steeled herself for what she regarded as the worst it could be. Another woman, she supposed. The very thought of it sent her spinning into a dizzying wash of memory of coming home to Eugene from Joseph unexpectedly one weekend during her mother's final illness, of walking into her own house and finding Gary in bed with one of the female teaching assistants. Already worn by the constant strain of caregiving, Diana snapped, turning into a wild woman and running, raving through the house. She screamed and threw things and broke them, while the terrified T.A. cowered naked behind a locked bathroom door. Gary followed Diana from room to room, trying to keep her from hurting herself, pleading with her to listen to reason. Reason? He had balls enough to use the word reason on her, as though she were a child pitching a temper tantrum. Still raging, she left the house, vowing divorce. She went straight back to Joseph and to caring for her mother. What else was there to do? Predictably, Gary appeared in Joseph two days later, bearing flowers and candy and gift-wrapped apologies. He begged and cajoled. He hadn't intended for it to happen, but he was so lonely with Diana gone all the time. It never would have happened if he hadn't missed her so much. He'd change, he promised. As soon as Diana got her undergraduate degree, they'd leave Eugene, whether he was finished with his Ph.D. program or not. They'd go somewhere else and start over, if she'd please just take him back. Christ, she thought, waiting for him to wake up and fighting back a wave of nausea. How could I have been so dumb? How could she possibly have believed him, she wondered. And yet she had. Why? Because believing was easier than admitting you were wrong, easier than telling your dying Catholic mother that her only daughter was getting a divorce. But most of all, because believing was what Diana Ladd had wanted to do more than anything else. In spite of everything that had happened, she loved Garrison Ladd. She wanted him to love her back with the same unreasoning devotion. At four that afternoon, Gary got up and came out into the living room of their shabby, school-owned, thirteen-by-seventy-foot mobile home. Hello, he said sheepishly. Hello, she returned. How are you? Hung over as hell. That cactus wine is a killer. 
Gary had uttered the words without even thinking, and then, as they registered, he turned ashen gray. Diana didn't understand what was happening at the time, but she remembered the incident later with terrible clarity, as the nightmare of Gina Antone's death began to unfold around her. What he said was nothing more than a slip of the tongue, but it was a clue. If she had paid attention, it might have warned her of what was to come, but she wasn't smart enough to pick up on it, and what difference would knowing have made? She couldn't have prevented what happened any more than she could have hoped to stop a speeding locomotive barehanded. She remembered Gary groping blindly for the back of a chair and dropping heavily into it. He had buried his face in his hands and wept. It was the first time Diana ever saw her husband cry. Her own nausea totally forgotten, she hurried to comfort him and to bring him a glass of chilled iced tea. Whatever was wrong, she would do her best to fix it for him. Whatever it was, she would somehow smooth it over. After all, she had Iona's shining example to follow, didn't she? That's exactly what her mother would have done, had done, for all those years, all her life. Smoothed things over. For everyone. Fat Crack's tow truck looked at home among the others parked in the dusty San Xavier parking lot. Many of the vehicles had out-of-state licenses or rental stickers, but by far the majority were beat-up old pickups, station wagons, and sedans that belonged to the regular parishioners. Hard as it was for out-of-state guests to fathom, the musty-smelling mission still functions as a church with a regular schedule of well-attended masses. While looks at nothing stayed in the truck, Fat Crack went to the door of the church and waited for Father John to come out. He did at last, accompanied by a somewhat younger-looking priest. "'Father John?' Fat Crack asked tentatively. "'Yes?' Uh, "'My name is Gabe Ortiz, Juanita's son, Rita Antone's nephew.' A concerned frown furrowed the old man's forehead. "'I hope your aunt's all right,' Fat Crack nodded. "'She's fine.' She's in the hospital, but fine. I have someone over here who needs to speak to you. Of course, Father John said, excusing himself from his colleague. Fat Crack led the way. They entered the row of parked cars a few vehicles away from the tow truck, just as Looks at Nothing climbed down from his seat. The old medicine man stood leaning on his cane. He seemed to stare right through them, with his glazed and sightless eyes. Father John stopped abruptly. This is, the fat crack began. Sub need pihas, Father John supplied, speaking looks at nothing's Indian name in perfectly accented papago. This old Siwani and I have met before, he said. Father John stepped forward, reached out took looks at nothing's gnarled old hand, and shook it. "'Now, Wash,' he said. "'Welcome.' Brandon Walker was worn out with trying to find a comfortable position on the postmodern waiting-room furniture. But he had, nonetheless, managed a few catnaps during the early morning hours, while his mother came and went from brief visits with her husband. It was just like when President Kennedy died, Brandon thought. The doctors didn't tell everything they knew all at once for fear of starting a panic. Brandon suspected they had known last night that there was no hope of recovery for Toby Walker, but they wanted to give the family a chance to adjust to the situation. Brandon took the news as a direct act of mercy from a god he was surprised to learn he still believed in. Luella might continue to insist it wasn't true, couldn't possibly be true that Toby was dying, but her son knew better. Each time a pale and shaken Luella emerged from the room, she was that much more entrenched in her disbelief. "'I want a second opinion,' she announced at last. Brandon rubbed his forehead. "'What's a second opinion going to buy you except another doctor's bill?' His question provoked Luella to outrage. How can you mention money at a time like this? That man in there, that, that, that so-called doctor says we should turn off the respirator, just like that, as though it's nothing. Pop's not there, Mom, her son said gently. 
He hasn't been for a long time, really. Turning off the machine would be a blessing. He started to add, for us all, but thought better of it. No, absolutely not. I won't have it. If he lives, he'll be a vegetable, Mom. He won't know either one of us. He won't be able to eat on his own or stand or breathe. But he's still alive, his mother hissed. Your father is still alive? Too tired to argue any more, Brandon capitulated. I'll go talk to the nurse about a second opinion, he said. He went to the nurse's station and asked to speak to the head nurse. Oh, she's on her break, the clerk said. He nodded. That's all right. I'm going to the cafeteria for some coffee. I'll talk to her when I get back. He walked down the long breezeway to the cafeteria. It was mid-morning now and hot, but he felt chilled inside and out. The air conditioning seemed to have settled in his blood and bones. How would he ever make Luella see reason? She was his problem now, and no one else's. Toby was still breathing with the help of his respirator, but he was really out of the war zone. It didn't seem fair for the focus of the battle to be immune to it. Brandon took his cup of muddy coffee and a cigarette. He had finally bought a pack of his own. To a table in the far corner where someone had left most of a Sunday paper lying strewn with a layer of toast crumbs and speckles of greasy butter. He started to toss the paper aside and then stopped when he recognized Davy Ladd's serious picture staring out at him from the top of the page. He read the article through twice before his weary brain finally grasped the material. Why in the world would Diana Ladd have permitted Davy to be featured in a paper like that? He would have thought she'd want to preserve her privacy. After all, if she had an unlisted phone number, why go advertising her location on the front page of the second section of a Sunday paper? Shaking his head, he tore out the page and stuffed it in his pocket. Brandon Walker was the very last person to pretend to understand why women did some of the crazy things they did. If, prior to the fact, Diana Ladd had asked his advice, he would have counseled her to keep Davy's name and picture out of the paper at all costs. You could never tell what kind of fruitcakes would be drawn to that kind of an article or how they would behave. But, truth of the matter was, Diana Ladd hadn't asked his advice. So, M-Y-O-B, buddy, he told himself, you got trouble enough of your own. The three men wandered over to one of the many Ocotillo-shaded food booths that lined the large dirt parking lot. In each shelter, two or three women worked over mesquite-burning fires, cooking popovers in vats of hot grease, filling them with chili or beans, and then selling them to the hungry San Xavier flock, churchgoers and tourists alike. Father John led them to a booth where he evidently had a charge account of sorts. The women took his order and quickly brought back three chili popovers on folded paper plates and three cans of orange crush. No money changed hands. "'Shall we go into my office to eat?' Father John asked. "'It's much cooler in there.' They went to a small office hidden behind the Mission bookstore, where Father John was obliged to bring in two extra chairs so they could all sit at once. While eating his own popover, Father John observed the fastidious way in which the medicine man ate. Chili popovers are notoriously messy, but looks at nothing consumed his meticulously, then wiped his entire face clean with a paper napkin. Father John flushed to think that there had once been a time when he would have thrown a visiting Siwani out of the mission compound, especially this particular Siwani. He had learned much since those early days, not the least of which was a certain humility about who had the most direct access to God's ear. Over the years, he had come to suspect that God listened in on a party line rather than a private one. Patiently, although he was dying of curiosity, the old priest waited to hear what looks at nothing had to say. Father John knew full well that it was the medicine man, and not Fatcrack, who was the motivating force behind his visit. 
and he knew also that whatever it was, it must be a matter of life and death. Nothing less than that would have forced stiff-necked old looks-at-nothing to unbend enough to set aside their ancient rivalry. It was August, hot and viciously humid. The summer rains had come with a vengeance, and the Topawa mission compound was awash in thick red mud. As Father John picked his way through the puddles from rectory to church, the Indian materialized out of the shadow of a nearby mesquite tree. He moved so easily that at first the priest didn't realize the other man was blind. "'Understanding woman has sent me,' the man said in slow but formal English. "'I must speak to you of dancing quail.' Father John stopped short. "'Dancing quail? What about her? Is she ill? She missed her catechism lesson yesterday.' The other man stopped, too, unexpectedly splashing into a puddle. As he struggled to regain his balance, Father John finally noticed that his visitor couldn't see. "'Dancing Quail will have a baby,' he said. "'No! Whose?' For the first time the blind man turned his sightless eyes full on the priest. Without being told— Father John understood his visitor must be the young medicine man from Many Dogs Village, the one people called looks at nothing. The blind man faced the priest, but he did not answer the question. He didn't have to, for under the medicine man's accusing stare, Father John knew the answer all too well. His soul shriveled within him. His fingers groped for the comforting reassurance of his rosary. How far along is she? Since the rain dance at Ban Thak, she has missed two mashathka, looks at nothing said, two menstrual periods. Dancing Quail has told you this, Father John managed. Dancing Quail says nothing. It is her grandmother who has sent me. We who have no eyes have other ways of knowing. I will quit the priesthood, Father John declared. I will quit and marry her. No. Looks at nothing was adamant. You will not see her again. She is going far away from here. It is already arranged with the outing matron. She will go to a job in Phoenix. You are not to stop her. I'll speak to Father Mark. I'll— You will do nothing. A man who would break one vow would as easily break another. An undercurrent of both threat and contempt permeated looks at nothing's softly spoken words. Besides, he added icily, Father Mark has already been told. You want her for yourself! The accusation shot from Father John's lips before he had time to think. Looks at nothing recoiled as though he'd been slapped. In his earlier hot-headed days, such an insult might have merited a fight to the death. The man he had killed in Aho had died for much less, but now the medicine man simply stepped back, putting a yard or so of distance between them. I am Manico, looks at nothing said slowly and with great dignity. A cripple, marked by Iitoi as a holy man. You would do well to be the same. With that, he turned and walked away. Determined to plead his case to his superior, Father John left at once for San Xavier. Father Mark refused to consider the idea of the younger priest renouncing his vows to marry the girl. "'What's done is done,' he said. "'She's gone. Forget about her. You have a vocation.' Father John returned to Topawa to find that both dancing quail and understanding woman had disappeared from the mission compound. He heard that the old woman died the following year, alone in her hut in Ban Thuk. Father John didn't see Dancing Quail again for almost thirty years, but he prayed for her daily, for her, and for her child as well. Looks at nothing pulled a cigarette and lighter from the cracked leather pouch he wore around his waist. Father John watched with some admiration as the blind man, with steady hands, used a Zippo lighter to fire the ceremonial cigarette, the peace smoke, as the Papagos called it. 
The medicine man took a long drag and then passed it to the priest. Nawaj, he said. Nawaj, Father John returned. He had never learned to appreciate the sharp, bitter taste of Indian tobacco, but he inhaled without betraying his opinion. He passed the cigarette along to Fat Crack, who took his turn. "'We are here to talk about the boy,' looks at nothing announced. "'What boy?' Father John asked, confused by the medicine man's statement. Who was he talking about? "'His name is Davy Ladd.' Looks at nothing continued. He is the son of the woman Dancing Quail lives with. Rita Antone's old name spun out of the past in a whirlwind of memory that gathered both old men into its vortex, while Fat Crack was left temporarily mystified. Dancing Quail? Who was that? It was a name he'd never heard before. Father John caught himself. Oh, yes, he said. Davy Lad. I remember now. What about him? He is unbaptized, looks at nothing answered. For a moment, nothing more was said as the cigarette once more made the rounds. Unbaptized in both the Milgan way and the Ootham way. He is a danger to himself, to his mother, and especially to Dancing Quail. Why do you tell me this? Father John asked. What does this have to do with me? His mother was once a child of your church, your tribe. She has fallen away and has never taken her baby to the church. You must fix this. Father John's first impulse was to laugh, but he had long since learned to suppress those inappropriate inclinations. Sirwani, the priest said placatingly, baptism is a complicated issue. I can't just fix it, as you say. Looks at nothing, Rose, and for a moment stood over the other two men, leaning on his cane like a strange three-legged bird. You must, he said in a matter-of-fact tone that brooked no argument, you must, or dancing quail will die. With that, the old medicine man turned and made his way out of the room, while Fat Crack followed closely behind. Chapter 13 They say it happened long ago that some quail were out eating during the harvest. Coyote crept up on them and ate them all, except for one small quail who hid himself under the thick, flat leaves of Ibahai, or prickly pear. The frightened quail waited while Coyote ate up all his brothers and sisters. When it was safe, quail ran home crying. Coyote has eaten us all. He has eaten all my brothers and sisters. One wise old quail heard this and decided to get even. He waited until one day when Coyote was sound asleep. He cut Coyote open and took out some of his tail fat. Then quail sewed him back up, filling the empty space with rocks. After that, quail flew off somewhere, started a fire, and began roasting the fat. Coyote woke up and sniffed the air. "'I smell something good,' he said. He started to follow the smell, but as soon as he moved, all the rocks inside him began to rattle. The sound made Coyote very proud. "'That is the sound of my medicine drum,' he said. Rattling all the way, Coyote walked until he found the place where quail were having their feast. "'Your food smells good, little brothers. Let me have a taste.' They gave him some, and Coyote liked it. "'Where did you get this meat?' he asked. "'Way over there,' Quail said. "'Beyond the mountains. Baskets are traded for it.' Coyote set off to go get some meat of his own, but as soon as he left he heard the quail laughing and saying, "'Look, Coyote has eaten his own tail fat.' Coyote came back. "'What did you say?' he asked, but the quail wouldn't answer. Just then a cottontail came running by. "'What did the quail say?' Coyote asked. "'They said, Coyote has eaten his own tail fat.' As soon as he heard this, Coyote knew he had been tricked, and he was very angry. He chased after the quail, who disappeared down a hole in which they had hidden a cactus all wrapped in feathers. 
Coyote dug in the hole after them. When he pulled out the first quail, he asked, Did you do this to me? No, the quail answered. It wasn't me. Coyote dug further and pulled out another quail. Did you do this to me? No, the second quail answered. It wasn't me. And so it went until he pulled out the very last one. Did you do this to me? But the last quail didn't answer. Aha, said Coyote. Since you don't answer me, you must be the one. And he bit hard on the quail, but he only hurt himself, because the last quail was really the cactus. And that, Nawaj, is the story of how quail tricked Coyote. Andrew Carlyle was in no hurry to get home. Avoiding the freeway, he drove up the back way from Tucson to Tempe, coming into town through Florence Junction and Mesa. He stopped at the Big Apple for a late breakfast. As usual, the previous night's exertions left him feeling wonderfully alive and ravenously hungry. He had been out of prison for only two days. Already, two people were dead. One a day, sort of like multiple vitamins, he thought. It was only fair. He'd been saving up for a long time. But Margie Danielson and Johnny Rivkin had been mere appetizers, something to hold him until the main course came along. Thinking about Margie Danielson made him remember the newspaper waiting in the car. He asked the waitress for one more cup of coffee and went out to retrieve the Arizona sun. It was important to stay abreast of how the Picacho Peak investigation was going. If the cops suddenly moved away from their Indian suspect, if they somehow stumbled on a lead that would point them in the right direction, Andrew Carlyle needed to know at once so he could take appropriate countermeasures. He turned to the second section, the local news section, and the name Lad jumped off the page at him. How lucky could he get? There he was, Garrison Ladd's own kid, complete with a picture and more than a few helpful details. Hardly able to contain his excitement, Carlyle read through the column. The names were all there, ones he'd thought he would have to search out, one by one, over a lengthy period of time. Rita Antone, Diana Ladd, and David Ladd. If the boy had been in a car accident, his name and address were now part of an active police report. Carlyle knew from personal experience that, for a price, almost everything in the Pima County Sheriff's Department was up for sale, cash on delivery, discretion advised. Jubilant, he paid his bill, adding in an extra tip, and headed for Weber Drive. Maybe he'd take his mother out to celebrate that night. She wouldn't have to know exactly what they were celebrating— He'd spend some of Johnny Rivkin's cash and take her someplace nice, like Casa Vieja in Old Tempe, or maybe Little Lulu's just up the street. Myrna Louise was sitting in her rocker when he came into the house. Fortunately, he had left the Hartman bag in the car. His mother sniffed disapprovingly when she saw the pink pantsuit. "'You shouldn't dress like that, Andrew. What will people think?' Roger was right. You should have had that first haircut much sooner. Carlyle felt far too smug to let Myrna Louise draw him into that decades-old argument. Don't look so upset, Mama. Your neighbors won't even notice. They'll think your sister came to visit, or your cousin from Omaha. I don't have a cousin in Omaha, Myrna Louise insisted. It was just a figure of speech, Andrew Carlyle told her. I don't know why this disturbs you so— it's like wearing a disguise. Maybe you should try it sometime. It's fun, like playing dress-up. Didn't you play dress-up when you were a child? When I was a child, she replied stubbornly, but not when I was fifty years old. Carlyle went into his bedroom. He saw at once that the stack of manuscripts was missing from the bookshelf. Turning on his heel, he charged back down the hall to the living room. Where are they, Mama? he demanded. "'Where are what? Don't give me that. You know what I mean. Where are my manuscripts, the ones that came in the mail?' "'I burned them,' she replied quietly. "'Every single page.' Carlyle's jaw dropped. "'You what? Outside, in the burning barrel. I burned them all.' Andrew Carlyle went livid. His hands shook. 
What the hell do you mean you burned them? They were trash, Andrew. Smutty, filthy trash. You have no business writing such terrible things about all those people killing and being killed. It made my blood run cold. Wherever did you get such terrible ideas? Andrew Carlyle sank into a chair opposite his mother, hoping she wasn't lying, knowing she wasn't. Mama, he croaked, do you have any idea what you've done? Those were my only copies of A Less Than Noble Savage. I'll have to rewrite it from scratch. I'd set about getting started then, but try to write it a little nicer this time, Andrew, and leave out the woman who gets burned up, the one who gets set on fire with paint thinner. That was horrible. It reminded me of the Harvey's cat. Even now she could remember the agonized screams of that poor dying cat, her next-door neighbor's cat, after Andrew and some of his friends had lit it on fire with paint thinner and matches. Over the years she had almost managed to forget about it, but reading the manuscript had brought it all back in vivid detail. The remembered sound in her head had kept her awake for hours. Temporary relief had come when, around midnight, she had donned a robe and gone outside to burn the book. It had taken a long time, hours even. Myrna Louise had wanted to be sure that each page was properly disposed of, with every shred of it reduced to crumpled ash. So she had fed the manuscripts into the flame, one typewritten page at a time. The problem was, after she was finished, and when she went back inside, the sound came back anyway. It was screaming in her head even now, as she sat staring at this stranger in the pink silk pantsuit who was supposedly her son. Yes, the cat was back with a vengeance, and Myrna Louise was afraid it would never go away again. They took away the breakfast tray without Rita's noticing. This time, understanding woman took her concerns straight to the convent superior. After hearing what the old Indian woman had to say, Sister Veronica made arrangements for a hasty trip to San Xavier, where they spoke at length to Father Mark. He listened gravely and agreed to take immediate action. The next afternoon, while Dancing Quail was busy with her endless dusting, she heard visitors being ushered into the convent. Soon Sister Mary Jane came looking for her. "'Someone is waiting to see you, Rita.' Dancing Quail was thunderstruck when she came to the arched doorway of the living room and found her grandmother sitting on the horsehair couch with Sister Veronica. Across a small table, in matching chairs, sat Father Mark from San Xavier and the BIA outing matron from Tucson. Dancing Quail stood transfixed for a moment, looking questioningly from face to face. "'Good afternoon, Rita,' Father Mark boomed heartily. "'Come in and sit down.' Dancing Quail slipped warily into the room. She made for a small footstool near understanding woman. When she sat down next to her grandmother, she looked to the old woman's weathered face for answers. But understanding woman made no acknowledgment. "'We're here about you and your baby.' Father Mark said brusquely. Father Mark's loud, forthright ways were often offensive to the politely soft-spoken papagos who made up his flock. At this frontal attack, Rita's features darkened with shame, but she made no attempt at denial. "'You must go away at once, of course,' he continued. "'Your staying here is entirely out of the question. To that end I have contacted Mrs. Manning here.' Between us, we've made arrangements for you to have a position with a good family in Phoenix. Isn't that right, Lucille? Over the years, the outing matron's once red hair had faded to a muddy gray, but Dancing Quail still remembered the withering look the woman had given her years before when the mill-gone woman discovered that the little girl from Bon Thoc had no shoes. Lucille Manning nodded. They are a very respectable family in Phoenix. Under most circumstances, they wouldn't consider taking someone in your, in your condition. But Adele and Charles Clark are old friends of Father Mark's. They're also very interested in Indian basketry. When I told them you were a basket maker, they decided to make an exception. I don't understand, Rita began. The priest cut her off. 
Of course you do, girl. You're not stupid. It would be very bad for Father John if you stayed here to have this baby. It would drive him out of the priesthood, destroy him completely, leave him to rot in hell. Now, you wouldn't want to do that now, would you? No, but... And we found a place where you can go. It'll be a good job, one that pays more than the sisters can. But what about my grandmother? Dancing Quail asked. What will happen to her? I will go home understanding woman said, speaking for the first time. I will go home to Bonthok and wait to die. Father Mark told Rita to pack her things, that the outing matron would leave shortly to take her to Tucson and the train. The girl left the convent with understanding woman. Please, Nikok, Dancing Quail begged. Grandmother, please don't send me away. Understanding woman was adamant. You must go, she said firmly. To lead a holy man or a priest away from his vows is very bad luck for you and for him as well. You must go far away and never see him again. Without further argument, Dancing Quail gathered her things. This time she didn't use a burden basket. The girls who worked in town said that burden baskets were old-fashioned and clumsy. One of the nuns had given her a cast-off leather case. Into this battered relic she put her own meager possessions. She was about to strap the case shut when understanding woman appeared at her side. Nika Ahmad, the old woman said, Granddaughter, here. This basket is not as good as that other one. Be careful not to lose it this time. Tentatively, Dancing Quail picked up Understanding Woman's medicine basket, the last one the old woman ever made. She opened the top and peered inside. There were the things she remembered, a clay doll, another fragment of the same beautiful spirit rock, an arrowhead, and a hank of long black hair. Tears streamed down the young woman's face as she replaced the lid and carefully wedged the basket in one corner of the case. Because of Father John, her grandmother was sending Dancing Quail away, but with her blessing rather than without. The old woman's puny medicine basket could offer only the slightest protection against the outside world, but it was far better than no protection at all. Besides, it was the only gift understanding woman had to give. The two Indians left San Xavier and drove to the Pima County Sheriff's Department. The fat crack had been here on business numerous times, and he knew his way around. He also understood the kind of treatment they could expect. "'I want to speak to Detective Walker,' he said, going up to the glass-enclosed cage that separated clerk from waiting room. "'He's not in,' the clerk said. "'Can you call him?' He's not on duty today. I need to talk to him. I'm telling you, he's not in. We'll wait, Fat Crack said, and showed looks at nothing to a chair. An hour later, they were still there. Sheriff Duchesne didn't usually come in on weekends, but he had forgotten his golf clubs at the office, and he needed them now. He was surprised to find two Indians seated stolidly in the front waiting area. There were usually plenty of Indians in the cell block, but not that many out front. "'What's with the powwow in the lobby?' he asked. The clerk shrugged. "'Who knows? He want to talk to Walker. I told him plain's day that's his day off.' "'Like hell it is,' Duchesne growled. "'You call him and tell him to get in here and take care of it. I don't need a bunch of Indians sitting around stinking up my place.' But he's at the hospital with his father. I don't give a rat's ass where he is. You get him on the horn and tell him to take care of it. Brandon Walker's in deep shit with me about now. He, by God, better not drag his heels. Brandon Walker was both mystified and relieved by the departmental phone call that summoned him from Tucson Medical Center. The relief came from having a legitimate reason to abandon his distracted mother, who was still waiting for the appearance of the second opinion doctor a process that Brandon could neither stop nor speed up. He wondered why two reservation Indians would insist on seeing him this ragingly hot Sunday afternoon. 
In the waiting room, he immediately recognized the younger of the two as the person looking after Davy Ladd in the hospital at Cells. The old man, blind and bent, leaning on a gnarled ironwood cane, was a complete stranger. "'Would you like to come back to my office?' Walker asked. The fat crack translated Brandon's words. The old man shook his head emphatically, speaking rapidly in Papago. "'He wants to talk outside.' Fat Crack explained. He wants to smoke. The crazy old coot could smoke in here where it's cool, Brandon thought, but he shrugged his shoulders in compliance and followed the other two men outside into the ungodly heat. Fat Crack led them to a small patch of shade under a thriving mesquite tree. The old man sat cross-legged on the ground and opened the flap of a leather pouch that he wore around his waist. Removing a homemade cigarette, he started to light up. Brandon reached for his own cigarettes, but the younger man stopped him. "'Looks at nothing would like you to join him,' Fat Crack said, sitting down next to the old man. Obligingly, Walker left his package of filter tips where they were. He squatted down close to the other two and waited. He tried unsuccessfully to estimate ages— the younger man was probably in his mid to late forties, but the older one's sun-dried, weathered skin defied categorizing. After deftly lighting his cigarette with a worn brass lighter, the old man puffed on it in absorbed concentration. He reminded Brandon of the aged Vietnamese villagers he had seen during the war, venerated old wise men who had seen one regime topple after another, and who had waited patiently for the inevitable time when the Americans would disappear as well. At last the old man turned his sightless eyes in Brandon's direction. He held out the cigarette, offering it to the detective. "'Now, Wash,' he said. Brandon's first inclination was to say thanks, but no thanks, that he'd have one of his own— but instinct warned him that there was more at stake here than just refusing a certain brand of cigarettes, homemade or not. "'Take it,' Fat Crack urged. "'Say, Nawaj. "'Say what?' Nawaj. Fat Crack repeated. "'It means friend or friendly gift.' "'Now which?' Brandon said, hesitantly, mimicking the strange-sounding word as best he could. He accepted the cigarette and took a deep drag while Fat Crack nodded approval. The smoke was far stronger than the white man had anticipated. He managed to choke back a fit of coughing. "'Indian tobacco,' Fat Crack explained as he in turn took the cigarette. "'This is crazy,' Brandon thought. "'What if someone sees me?' But just then the old man started speaking in Papago. For a gringo, Brandon Walker was fairly fluent in Spanish, but this language wasn't remotely related to that. He couldn't understand a word. When the old man stopped speaking, the younger one translated. He says he's sorry about your father, but that sometimes it is better to die quick than to be old and sick. Brandon's jaw dropped. How did this aged Indian know about Toby Walker? How does he— Brandon sputtered, but the old man spoke once more. Again, Fat Crack interpreted. He's sorry to bother you like this, but we must speak to you about my cousin, about Gina Antone, who was murdered years ago. The blind man's mysterious knowledge about Toby Walker was forgotten— as Brandon's finely honed detective skills took charge. Gina Antone, what about her? We want to know about the other man, the one who went to jail. He's still in prison, in Florence. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. We would like you to check. This time Fat Crack spoke on his own without waiting for the old man. When? Now? Fat Crack nodded. The Indians showed no inclination to move. Shaking his head in exasperation, Brandon Walker rose to his feet and went back inside. He was gone a long time, fifteen minutes to be exact. 
During that time, looks at nothing, and Fat Crack sat smoking in the shade in absolute silence. Finally, Brandon Walker returned. He stood over the other two men for a moment, examining each enigmatic face. Finally, he squatted back down next to them. I just talked to the records department in Florence, he said. Andrew Carlyle was released on Friday. Now tell me, what's this all about? Once more the hairs on Fat Crack's neck stood up straight beneath the weight of his Stetson. Do you remember when my cousin was killed? he asked. Yes. Do you remember her whippy, her nipple? I remember, Walker said grimly. It was something he had never forgotten. But the man who did that's dead, Brandon added. He committed suicide. He is not dead, Fat Crack declared quietly. It has happened again, just like that. On Friday, near Picacho Peak, the sheriff has arrested an Indian, but an O'Thum wouldn't do this, wouldn't bite off a woman's nipple. Neither would a dead man. A spurt of adrenaline surged into Brandon Walker's system, but his face betrayed nothing. "'How do you know about this?' he asked. "'From an Indian who was in jail in Florence,' Fat Crack answered. "'And why did you come to me? Why not go to the sheriff in Pinal County? They're the ones who have jurisdiction in the case.' "'Because,' Fat Crack said simply, looking at the second Indian, "'my friend here is an old man.' He doesn't like to travel so far. To release her anger, Diana's first impulse on arriving home was to clean her house from top to bottom. Not that the house was dirty. She had to find something to occupy her hands and body. She swept and mopped and scrubbed. She even ventured into the root cellar behind a door she seldom opened, where she still kept all those packed boxes. Gary's stuff and her mother's stuff, sitting there like ticking time bombs of memory, filled with things she couldn't throw away because she couldn't stand to sort them. Against one wall were Gary's boxes. Rita had packed those for her. It was the first thing Rita had done for Diana, packed Gary's belongings into tidy stacks of boxes. During the three days, Diana was in University Hospital, having Davy. And across the narrow room, stacked against another wall, labeled in Diana's stepmother's bold, careless printing, were the boxes that held all that remained of Iona Dade Cooper's worldly possessions. The last month and a half, Iona Cooper was in the hospital in Le Grand. During that time, Diana's world shrank even smaller. Sympathetic nurses brought Iona's food and looked the other way when Diana ate it, not that she ate much. She was listed as a guest in the Legrand Hotel, but she went there only to shower and change clothes. Most of the time she slept, sitting up in a chair beside her mother's bed. The two women spent most days entirely alone, with sporadic interruptions by passing doctors and nurses. Max Cooper came by a few times during the first week or so. Then he disappeared and didn't return. Iona asked for him sometimes, but Diana refused to call him and beg him to come. If he couldn't come on his own, the hell with him. There was nothing Diana could do except be there with a comforting word and touch during Iona's occasional lucid moments whatever hour those increasingly rare moments surfaced. The rest of the time, Diana's sole function and focus was as her mother's advocate, as an insistent voice in the bureaucratic wilderness, demanding medication and attention from busy nurses and attendants, whose natural tendency was to ignore an uncomplaining patient. During the last week, Diana prayed without ceasing for the struggle to be over, for it to be finished. The afternoon before Iona died, Diana went back to the hotel to shower and change clothes. She checked for messages, as she always did. There was one. See the manager. Mr. Freeman, the manager, a bespectacled older gentleman who had always treated Diana with utmost kindness— 
came out from his little office behind the desk. He was carrying a check that Diana recognized instantly as one she had written only the day before. "'I'm very sorry, Mrs. Ladd, but there seems to be some problem with the check.' Diana was mystified. "'How could there be a problem?' she asked. "'There's plenty of money in the account.' Constantly worried about money, her mother had waited far longer than she should have before agreeing to go to the hospital, but then she maintained that her daughter and son-in-law shouldn't have to shoulder any additional expenses on her account, including Diana's bill at the hotel. Since Iona's initial hospitalization, Diana had been a signer on her parents' checking account. Iona insisted Diana use that account and no other each week when she paid her hotel bill. Tentatively, apologetically, the manager handed over the offending check. Stamped across the face of it in screaming red letters were the words, Account Closed. I don't know how this can be, Mr. Freeman. I'll have to check on it later. I need to get back to the hospital right now. Of course, Mrs. Ladd. Don't you worry. Later we'll be fine. That afternoon, before the bank closed in Joseph, and while nurses were busy changing Iona's bedding, Diana called Ed Gentry. He was full of apologies. "'Your father came in and closed that account two days ago. Since he's a bona fide signer, there wasn't a thing I could do about it. If you're short, Diana, I'd be happy to advance you some cash.' "'No,' she told him. "'I'm fine.' The next morning, when it was finally over, Diana prepared to have it out with Max Cooper. He hadn't even bothered to come tell his wife goodbye. She tried calling, but no one answered. Finally, after paying the bill with her own money, she checked out of the hotel and drove back to Joseph. She'd done what she could, but all other arrangements would have to wait until her father arrived in Legrand with his new checkbook. Driving up to the house, Diana tried the door, but it was latched from the inside. She knocked, only to have the door opened by a complete stranger. The last thing Diana expected was to find a strange woman ensconced in her mother's place, someone Diana didn't recognize and who didn't know Iona's daughter either. Yes, the woman said tentatively, as though Diana were some kind of suspicious door-to-door -door salesman. Something about the possessive way she opened the door warned Diana this wasn't some thoughtful neighbor come to help out in time of trouble. "'I live here,' Diana said, pushing her way into the kitchen. "'Who are you?' Just then Max came into the room from the living room. One thumb hooked under his suspenders, he carried a can of beer in his other hand. At nine o'clock in the morning, he was already swaying slightly from side to side. "'What's going on here?' he demanded. Diana looked at him with absolute loathing. "'Who is this?' she spat, pointing at the woman. "'Francine! Francine Duncan! You mean you two haven't met? Francine, this is Diana!' "'Oh,' Francine said. "'And where were you?' Diana demanded furiously, moving past Francine to stand directly in front of her father. "'Where have you been for the last month and a half?' "'Busy,' he mumbled. "'I've been real busy around here. Besides, like I told you and your mother both, I can't stand hospitals.' "'You won't have to worry about it any more,' Diana said. "'It's over. She's gone.' Max Cooper sank to the floor as though someone had suddenly lopped him off at the knees. Francine rushed to his side. "'Oh, Max, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. You stay out of this,' Diana snapped. "'Nobody asked you.' She left Joseph that afternoon and never went back. The boxes came two months later, a week after Max and Francine's handwritten, after-the-fact wedding announcement. Diana came home from school and found the boxes sitting, waiting for her, on the patio of the apartment in Eugene. A note on the top one said, Your mother's things. 
Ten years later, Diana had yet to crack the masking tape on even one of those boxes. Knowing Francine had packed them had somehow desecrated Iona Dade Cooper's possessions. Diana didn't know if she'd ever be able to bring herself to touch them. Andrew Carlyle had looked down on Myrna Louise for as long as he could remember, but this was the first time he ever remembered hating her. He went to the tiny Spartan bedroom assigned to him in his mother's house and fell under the narrow bed while his whole body throbbed with abhorrence. How could she have done this to him? How could she? A less than noble savage was gone, completely gone. Oh, he still had a rough, rough draft, but six years of refinements had been obliterated. It was as though Myrna Louise had amputated a part of his body. This was his baby, his creation, something he'd nurtured and suckled throughout the endless days in prison. At times, polishing the exploits of his main character was all that had kept him sane. Carlyle had liked his brute of a protagonist, Clayton Savage, had related to him both as a man and as a character. This modern-day, self-appointed, bloodthirsty renegade had only one objective while slicing and dicing his way through 643 double-spaced manuscript pages, making sure Custer died for your sins, that powerful Native American polemic, was more than just a catchy title. And now the new and revised Clayton Savage was lost to him. Another sin to lay at Diana Ladd's door. Something else for which that bitch would be held accountable. Practicing biofeedback, a trick they'd taught him in the joint, Carlyle managed to get his breathing back under control. Don't get mad, get even, he told himself. That was the secret. Finally, with the embryo of a plan forming in his head, he got up and went over to the dresser. Deliberately, he felt along the front of it until he found a loose piece of fascia board. He tugged at it until it broke off in his hands. Then he went out into the living room, still carrying the broken piece. He walked past his mother, who had not yet moved from her rocker. "'Where are you going?' She asked the question mechanically, strictly out of habit, even though she didn't want to. She had no need to know where her son was going or what he would do, but she was unable to change a lifetime's worth of asking. "'To the lumber yard, he said. "'I need some glue. A piece of wood broke off the dresser in my room.' Away from the house, away from her, he was able to think more clearly. He bought the glue for the dresser. He also bought some caulking compound and a caulking gun. He told the man at the check stand that he was installing a tub in an add-on bathroom. By the time he came back home, Andrew Carlyle was his old self again, his old charming self. "'Sorry I was so upset earlier, Mama,' he said. "'It's not that big a deal, really. Besides, you're right. It probably wasn't all that good a book in the first place.' "'You're not mad at me any more. No, he lied. Not at all. How about going out to dinner? We could go someplace special for a steak or, or whatever you like. Myrna Louise's eyes lit up. She was always game for going out to dinner. I really like that place over in the shopping center, she said. Lulu Bells or, or whatever, they have good ribs. That settles it, her son told her with an easy smile. That's where we'll go then. And tomorrow, if you like... We could ride down to Tucson together. I have a few more errands to run. It's a long drive. It would be fun to have some company. Late in the afternoon, Diana and Davy drove out to Sells. Right after they arrived, Diana took Davy around to the side of the building and held him up so he could speak to Rita through the open window. Then, warning him not to talk to anyone else in her absence... Diana left him in the lobby and went down the hall to Rita's room. "'Davy sure looks good,' Rita said. "'The cut on his head isn't too bad.' "'No, it's fine. He's proud of all his stitches.' 
The two women were quiet for a moment. Over the years they had spent so much time alone together that long silences between them were not unusual. There was nothing in the older woman's placid countenance to warn Diana that a storm was coming. "'My nephew was here earlier,' Rita said at last. "'He came to give me some news.' "'Oh, what's that?' "'Carlyle.' At the sound of the name, Diana's heart caught in her throat. What, what about him? He's out. When? Friday. Already he has killed again. No. Are you serious? Rita nodded. Fat Crack told me. They have arrested an Indian, but it was Carlyle who did it. He bit her. My God! Diana breathed. I'll have to get in touch with Detective Walker right away and let him know. No, Rita said. Detective Walker already tried with Carlyle, and he failed. Gina is dead. Your husband is dead, and now Carlyle is free. We will not give Detective Walker another chance. What are you saying? Diana asked. She knew what Rita was thinking, but she didn't dare put it into words. I remember what he said in the hallway, Rita continued slowly, when the deputy's back was turned, and when he thought no one else was looking, he said he would come for you, for us. Let him. Let him? Do nothing and wait for him to come after us? Rita nodded. That's right. I have one very old friend who is a powerful medicine man. He and my nephew will help us. An involuntary shiver ran up and down Diana's spine. You're saying we should take care of Carlyle ourselves? Yes. But how can we when we don't even know where he is? He will come to us. We must let him. And then what? Rita considered her words carefully before she spoke. The Tohono O'Otham only kill to eat or in self-defense. If Carlyle comes after us, then it is self-defense, isn't it? It wasn't as though Rita Antone was attempting to talk Diana Ladd into something she had never considered on her own. Selling the idea wasn't necessary. For almost seven years now, Diana had longed to throttle Andrew Carlyle with her bare hands. "'How do we find him?' Diana asked. "'We don't,' Rita answered. "'Windmill doesn't go looking for wind man. Neither will we. While we wait for him to come, we have much to do.' Chapter 14 It is said that long ago a young woman from the desert people fell in love with a young Hyakim, a Yaki, and went to live with his family far to the south. The mother of the girl, old white-haired woman, loved her daughter very much and missed her. Every evening she would go out to the foothills and call to her daughter's spirit, and every night there was an answer. One night, though, she heard nothing. That night she went to her husband and said, My daughter needs me. I must go to her. Her husband, who was also old and lame besides, shook his head. You are a bent old woman, and the Hyakim live far from here. How will you find your way? The little people will help me, she said. So the next morning she got up and called to Ali Chuchum O'Otham. The little people, in their own language for old white-haired woman, still remembered how to speak to them. As soon as they heard her call, the animals came right away. "'What do you want, old mother?' the little people asked. "'My daughter's spirit is calling me from far away in the land of the Hyakim. I must go to her, but I am old and do not know the way.' We will help you, old mother. We will help you. Go to your daughter. 
And so the birds brought old white-haired woman seeds and grain to eat along the way. The bees brought her honey, and Coyote, who had once been in the land of the Hiakim, guided her footsteps. After many, many days they reached the village where old white-haired woman's daughter lived with her husband and her baby, but the bent old woman found that her daughter was very sick. Mother, the girl told old white-haired woman, my husband's people are waiting for me to die so they can take my baby off into the mountains and teach him to be a warrior. I want you to take him back home to the Tohono O'otham so he can grow up to be kind and gentle. You must leave tonight. Tomorrow will be too late. Old white-haired woman was tired and wanted to rest, but she knew her daughter was right. Late that day she loaded the baby into her daughter's burden basket and went through the village, this way and that, so people would think she was gathering wood. Then, when she was out of sight, she started back north. Once more the little people came to help her, but the next morning she could hear that a band of Hiakim warriors were following her trail. When they were almost upon her, she called out to Iitoi for help. He sent a huge flock of Shashani, blackbirds, who flew around and around the Yaki warriors' eyes until they could see nothing. Meanwhile Iitoi led old white-haired woman and her grandson into a wash that became a canyon. In this way they went north toward the land of the Tohono O'otham. But old white-haired woman was very tired after her long journey. Finally, one day, she could go no farther. "'I must stop here,' she said. So Itoi took the boy the rest of the way home. When he came back, he found that the old woman's feet had grown underground, and all that was sticking up were two sticks of arms. "'You are a good grandmother,' Itoi said. "'You may stay here and rest forever, but once a year you will be the most beautiful flower on the earth. He touched the sticks. Wherever he put his fingers, beautiful white flowers grew. Once each year, Iitoi said, during the night, Windman will be heavy with your perfume, but when the sun comes up in the morning, you will be gone. And that, Nawaj, is the story of old white-haired woman and the beautiful flower that the mill gun called the night-blooming Sirius. The desert people call it Kokoi, U, which means ghost smell, or Ho'okwa O, which means witch's tongs. Brandon Walker never clocked in, but he worked all afternoon Sunday just the same. Trying to get a lead on Andrew Carlyle, he finally was put in touch with Ron Mallory at home, taking the frustrated assistant superintendent away from his typewriter. "'My name's Brandon Walker,' he said, by way of introduction. "'I'm a homicide detective with Pima County.' "'What can I do for you, Detective Walker?' Mallory asked, cordially enough. But all the while he was wondering who the hell had given this joker his home telephone number. "'I'm trying to locate Andrew Carlyle. Your records department couldn't give me a current address. Carlyle, Mallory thought, alarm bells chiming in his bureaucratic cover-thine-ass mentality. Carlyle had only got out on Friday, and somebody was already looking for him? Oh, he's in Tucson somewhere, Mallory answered. I can probably have an address for you next week. What's this all about? The slight hesitation in Walker's answer alerted Mallory that everything wasn't entirely as it should have been. "'I was the arresting officer in that case years ago,' Walker said. "'I'm concerned about him being released into the same area where some of the witnesses still live. He may go after them.' Mallory took a deep breath and used his shirt-sleeve to wipe the beads of sweat that suddenly dotted his forehead. "'Look, Detective Walker!' he said, all trace of cordiality disappearing. Andrew Carlyle was an exemplary prisoner. He never made a bit of trouble. He was released after paying his debt to society for that particular crime. Sounds to me as though you're out to harass a poor guy. Harassment's got nothing to do with it, Brandon Walker countered. I'm not the one who'll be looking for him. What do you mean? 
when they come asking, Brandon added. I'd have that address handy. He put down the phone and then sat there looking at it. He had wanted to have some solid information before he called Pinall County. He wondered how his information would be received once the homicide detectives knew it had been gleaned from some aging Indian medicine man over a ceremonial smoke of native tobacco. Brandon had already looked up the phone number and even partially dialed it twice, hanging up each time before the connection was made. This time he dialed and let it ring. When the call was answered, he asked to speak to the detective in charge of the Picasso Peak case. It was Sunday. Walker guessed correctly that the detective assigned to that case would be hard at work. "'Detective Farrell,' a voice said gruffly into the phone. "'My name's Walker,' Brandon told him. "'Detective Walker from Pima County, just down the road a piece. "'What can I do for you?' "'I'm calling about your Picasso Peak case. "'I may have some relevant information. "'Shoot!' I was the arresting officer years ago on a homicide that happened out near the reservation, the Papago. A young Indian woman was murdered. Two Anglos were the perpetrators. Brandon Walker paused. So, Farrell prodded, that case may be related to the new one. What makes you think that? The young woman's breast was bitten. One nipple was completely severed. Walker could hear the other man shifting in his chair, sitting up straight, coming to attention. Now wait just a goddamn minute here, Farrell exclaimed. We haven't released one particle of information about that. How the hell did you know about it? Well, that's not important, Brandon said. How about if we meet and exchange the information? Where? Uh, the coffee shop at the base of Picasso Peak. I'd like to look over the crime scene if I could. Farrell drew back. That's a little irregular. You work in a case? The bastard already rent a prison for my case. At the time, most of the blame was passed along to somebody else who happened to be dead. Material evidence about the bite that would have linked this joker to that part of it mysteriously disappeared between the crime lab and the evidence room. It was never found again. Detective G.T. Jeet Farrell was nobody's dummy. I see, he said after a short pause. You think this is the same guy, but because of double jeopardy, you can't lay a glove on him for the other case. You got it. Meet you at the Nickerson Farms in one hour, Farrell said. Bring everything you got. We'll compare notes. Right, Brandon Walker said. I'll be there. Coming back from visiting Rita in cells with Davy asleep in the back seat, Diana Ladd pulled into the driveway of her house and felt a sudden knot of fear form in her stomach. For the first time, she was daunted by the isolation, by the vast distance two miles or more, from her house to that of her nearest neighbor. It hadn't seemed nearly so far with Andrew Carlyle locked safely away in prison, but now that he was out... Bone's welcoming woof came from just inside the door. The sound made Diana feel much better. Davy sat up. "'We're home already?' he asked. "'We're home,' Diana told him but without the internal thrill those words still sometimes gave her. Knowing Andrew Carlyle could come looking for her any time made the house seem less a refuge and more a trap. A trap or a battleground. But then Andrew Carlyle had been a battleground from day one, from the moment she first heard his name. She had almost finished earning her bachelor's degree by then. Carrying extra loads and going to summer school, she had graduated only one semester late. Gary was eager to get out of Eugene. He said he was only keeping his promise about going elsewhere and starting over. She found out much later that he had nearly come to blows with his advisor over plagiarism in his dissertation. If he hadn't left the University of Oregon voluntarily, he would have been thrown out. Gary was the one who first heard about the creative writing program being offered in Arizona. He claimed that a similar one being offered in Eugene wasn't nearly as good. Both Diana and Gary had applied, but only one was accepted. Diana still smarted at Gary's words the day the two matching envelopes came. They matched on the outside, but the contents differed. One said he was in, while the other announced that she wasn't. 
I guess there's only going to be one writer in our family, Gary had said with that infuriating grin of his, and I'm it. Those words gnawed at her still, kept her tied to her desk when she ought to have been outside, enjoying her child and her life. Later, when Gary learned how hurt she was over it, and, more important, when he'd wanted her to find a job in Arizona to support them, he claimed it was all a joke, that he hadn't meant a word of it. But that was after his parents learned about the cancelled dissertation at the U of O, after they cut their fair-haired boy off from any further financial aid. And so, in the spring of 1967, Andrew Carlyle entered Diana's and Gary's lives, insidiously almost, like some exotic, antibiotic-resistant strain of infection that ordinary remedies don't touch. Diana didn't like the man from the moment she met him at that first faculty tea, the only one to which spouses were invited. She had wanted to be there as a full participant, not as some extraneous guest. She resented what she regarded as Professor Carlyle's oily charm. Gary, on the other hand, was captivated. Once classes started, that was all he could talk about. Professor Carlyle this, and Professor Carlyle that. Sometime during that first semester, she couldn't remember exactly when, the professor part was dropped, first in favor of last name only, and later in favor of Andrew. Meanwhile, she found herself a job, not in Tucson, where applicants outnumbered positions ten to one. She went to work in the boonies, teaching on the Papago for one of the most impoverished school districts in the entire country. The pay wasn't all that bad, and the job did come with housing, a thirteen-by-seventy mobile home parked in the teacher's compound at Tupawa. It wounded Diana's pride to be forced to accept company housing, but with Gary in school full-time, every penny counted. At first, Gary carpooled into Tucson with two other students, but then, as his days got longer, as he came more and more under Carlyle's spell, he bought himself a beater pickup so he could come and go as he liked. Did Diana see trouble brewing? Did she read the writing on the wall? Of course not. She was too much her mother's daughter, too busy maintaining a positive mental attitude in the face of mounting disaster, too busy believing that what Gary Ladd said was the gospel. Every once in a while the smallest splinter of doubt might worm its way into her consciousness, but she ruthlessly plucked it out. Gary was working hard, she told herself. The stack of typewritten pages on his desk grew steadily taller, offering mute testimony about work on his manuscript. Besides, Diana had interests enough of her own to keep her occupied. There weren't any Indians living in Joseph, Oregon, when Diana grew up. The Nez Perce had long since been exiled from their ancestral lands to the wilds of Oklahoma, and back to a reservation in Idaho. But Diana had learned something about them in her reading, had discovered in books things about Chief Joseph and his loyal band of followers that would have given her father apoplexy. After all, to Max Cooper's unenlightened way of thinking, the only good Indian was still a dead Indian. So the job teaching school on the Papago was good for Diana in more ways than one. It supported them while Gary was in school, it gave them a place to live, and it provided another avenue of attack in her unrelenting rebellion against her father. She threw herself into her work with all the enthusiasm and energy she could muster, if she was going to be a teacher for the time being, she'd be the best damn teacher the reservation had ever seen. While doing that, she was also, unwittingly, giving Gary Ladd more and more rope, enough to hang himself, enough rope to destroy them both. Gary, she had pleaded finally, for God's sake, tell me what's the matter. It was early afternoon the following Friday a full week after he'd stayed out until broad daylight after the dance at San Pedro. "'I can't,' he whimpered. "'I don't know what to do.' She went to him then, held him and comforted him as she would have a small lost child or a wounded animal. She couldn't believe those frightened, despairing words came from the lips of the man she loved, from the mouth of Garrison Walther Ladd III, 
someone who always had a ready answer for everything. It had been a terrible week for Diana, a debilitating, virtually sleepless week. She alternated between bouts of fury and bleak despair over what was wrong with her husband, all the while battling her own recalcitrant body, which seemed determined to throw off every morsel of food she had tempted to put in her mouth. Gary spent the week in front of the TV set, watching everything from news to soap operas to game shows with almost catatonic concentration. He ate a bite or two of the food she brought him and sipped the iced tea or coffee, but he barely spoke to her, barely moved. With every passing moment, her sense of foreboding grew more overpowering until she wanted to scream at the very sight of him. Once, while he slept, she went out and examined the pickup in minute detail, looking for a clue as to what might have happened. She dreaded finding evidence that he had been in an accident, maybe a hit-and-run, but the combat scars on the Ford's battered body were all old, rusted-over wounds. In a way, finding nothing made Diana feel worse. What was the matter? she asked herself. What had panicked her otherwise self-assured husband to the point that he couldn't leave the house? On Tuesday morning, Andrew Carlyle called to find out why Gary had missed class the previous day. Diana put her husband on the phone, despite his desperately signaled hand motions to the contrary. He stammered some lame excuse about food poisoning that didn't sound at all plausible to Diana, and probably not to Andrew Carlyle either. Gary promised faithfully that he'd be in class the next day, but Wednesday came and went without him moving from the couch other than to visit the bathroom. On Thursday evening, Andrew Carlyle himself showed up at the door. Diana was surprised to see him, amazed that he'd go so far out of his way in an attempt to talk Gary out of his stupor. She didn't like Andrew Carlyle, but she grudgingly gave the man credit. She wasn't privy to the conversation that passed between them, but she was grateful that Gary seemed in much better spirits after Carlyle left. "'What did he tell you?' she asked curiously after the professor drove away. Oh, that all creative people go through black periods like this, Gary told her. He says it's nothing unusual. It'll pass. On Saturday morning, Diana went to the high store for groceries. The trading post on top of the hill was abuzz with talk about the murder and the now-identified victim, Gina Antone. Diana bought a newspaper and read the ugly story for herself. She was shocked to discover the victim was the granddaughter of someone she knew. Diana worked at the school, and so did Rita Antone, Diana as a classroom teacher, and Rita as a cook in the cafeteria, although the two women were only slightly acquainted. Rita was known for striking terror in the hearts of children who came to the garbage cans to dump their lunch trays without first having tried at least one bite of everything on their plate. Rita, standing guard over the garbage cans like a pugnacious bulldog and waving a huge rubber spatula for emphasis, would order them, "'Eat your vegetables!' Usually the frightened Indian kids complied without a murmur. So did a few cowed Anglo teachers. By the time Diana got back to Topawa with both the groceries and the newspaper, it was almost noon. She was in the kitchen fixing lunch when Gary turned away from the television cartoons and picked up the paper. She saw his face go ashen. The knuckles on his hands turned white. He let the paper fall to the floor and began sobbing into his hands. She went to him. Kneeling on the floor in front of him, she begged him to tell her what was wrong. For a long time he sat weeping with his face buried on her shoulder. The paper lay face up on the floor with the headlines screaming at her. Without his saying a word, she knew. Terror and revulsion took over. She drew away from him, grabbed up the paper, crumpled it into a wad, and shook it in his face. "'Is it this?' she demanded, not caring that her voice had risen to a shriek. "'Is this what the hell's the matter?' and he gave her the only answer she ever got from him, an agonized three-word reply that offered no comfort even while she pinned her every hope for both the past and the present on it. "'I 
don't remember. Not, of course not. Not, how could you say such a thing? Not, that's crazy. But, I don't remember. A murderous King's X, as though he'd kept his fingers crossed while Gina Antone died. The room reeled around her. Overwhelmed by nausea, she dashed for the bathroom and vomited, while her chicken noodle soup cooked a blackened charcoal splinters on the kitchen stove. When Diana came back out to the living room, Gary was gone. She ran to the door in time to see his pickup turning out of the teacher's compound onto the highway, headed for cells. She could have driven like a demon and caught up with him on the highway, but what would she have done then? Forced him off the road? Behind her, an unearthly howl from the telephone receiver told her that the phone hadn't been hung up properly. At first, staring after the receding pickup, Diana was unable to respond. Soon a disembodied voice echoed through the house, telling her to please hang up and try again. Shaken and too spent to do anything else, she put the phone back on the hook. Gary left the house, and she never saw him again. Not alive, anyway. And that last phone call, placed to Andrew Carlyle's home just before Garrison Ladd fled the house to go to his death, was one of the key pieces of evidence that linked the two men together. Yes, Diana thought, almost seven years later, going into the house in Gates Pass, closing and locking the door behind her. Andrew Carlyle was the invader here, the enemy. He had not yet set foot inside her home, but when he did, he would meet with implacable resistance, to the death resistance. Rita Antone had said so, and so had Diana Ladd. Detective Jeet Farrell of the Pinal County Sheriff's Department was a cop's cop, someone who had been in the business a long time, someone who knew his way around people. Everyone in the Arizona law enforcement community was familiar with the problems in the Pima County Sheriff's Department. At first, Farrell was worried that Brandon Walker might be one of Sheriff Duchesne's bad guys. "'You dragged me all the way down here with some cockamamie story, so tell me, who is this character?' Farrell asked, leaning back in the booth, eyeing Brandon Walker speculatively. "'His name's Andrew Carlyle,' Walker answered. "'Formerly Professor Andrew Carlyle of the University of Arizona.' Years earlier, the professor's case had been notorious statewide. Farrell remembered it well. Well, if it's the same case I'm thinking about, he got himself a pretty slick plea bargain. That's the one, Walker nodded. The other guy, his student and co-conspirator, committed suicide rather than go to jail. Tell me about the bite. Like I said on the phone, one nipple was completely severed, and the key piece of evidence that could have been matched to a bite impression the thing that would have determined once and for all who was responsible, disappeared off the face of the earth. Farrell nodded. You boys have a man-sized hole in your evidence room down there. Somebody ought to plug this son of a bitch. Both men knew Farrell was referring to Duchesne himself, and not some mythical hole. They ought to, Walker agreed. But that's easier said than done. What makes you think Carlyle's my man? Farrell asked. He was released from Florence at noon on Friday, put on the bus for Tucson. My guess is that he never made it that far. How'd you know about Margie Danielson's nipple? Farrell asked. The Penal County detective didn't play games. He had already made a favorable judgment call about the quality of his Pima County colleague. From two Indians, Walker answered, an old one, a medicine man, and a younger one, too. At least, I think the younger one is a medicine man. They'd heard you'd arrested an Indian. Arrested, but not charged, Farrell agreed. But how'd they know about that? They didn't say, and I didn't ask. They were also the ones who came up with a possible connection between this case and the old one. They came to town this morning and asked me to find out whether or not Andrew Carlyle was out of prison. And he was, Farrell finished. Walker nodded. At exactly the right time, Florence released him Friday at noon. Farrell blinked at that, as though he hadn't made the connection the first time. 
Noon Friday. From Florence to Picasso Peak a few hours later was indeed the right time and place. So where is he now? That I don't know. I talked to a guy named Ron Mallory, who's assistant superintendent in Florence. He played real coy, acted like he had no idea where Carlisle might have gone, but the person in records let something slip when I was talking to her. She mentioned that most of the time Carlisle was locked up, he worked as Mallory's inmate clerk. So chances are, Carlisle's got something on Mallory. He's not going to lift a finger to help us. Unless somebody holds his feet to the fire, Farrell said. Now, tell me, Walker, what's the real reason you're here? What's your beef? I can see how your ego might be hurt because this guy slipped off the hook once. But it seems like there's more at stake here than just the usual problem with the crook that got away. The other man's wife, Walker said, the widow of the guy who committed suicide. At the time, I convinced her that we'd take care of Carlisle. All she had to do was trust the system. And the system screwed her over. Without a kiss. So it is ego damage. <laughs> well, that's something this old man understands, Farrell said with a sly grin. I've been there, too. Finish your coffee, Detective Walker. We'll go have a look up the mountain. Rita lay in the hospital bed and thought about her plan. It was a daring trickster plan, one both E.E. E. Toy and Coyote would have liked. She was surprised Diana had agreed so readily. After all, Diana would run the greatest risk, for she was the bait, the one Carlyle would come looking for. They would lure Carlyle to the deserted cave by Rattlesnake Skull Village and dispose of him. Would he fall for it? Rita couldn't be sure, but she knew that people saw what they wanted to see, heard what they wanted to hear. She had already tried that once, and back home in Tucson, she had Understanding Woman's original medicine basket stored safely away among her treasures as proof that it worked. Mrs. Charles Clark wasn't particularly nice as she conducted the initial interview with her new employee. The Clarks were not accustomed to dealing with girls of dubious virtue, but Father Mark had begged them to make an exception in this case. Rita would be allowed to remain and work, providing her behavior was absolutely above reproach. She must attend church regularly, do no drinking or smoking, and have no male visitors. There was another young Tohono Ho'otham working in the household, a slender, shy girl named Louisa Antone. Rita and Louisa shared the same last name, but they were not related. Rita was from Banthak, while Louisa came from Hikiwoni, or Jagged Edge. Although Louisa was two whole years younger than Rita, she was much more well-versed in the ways of the Clark household. Louisa explained Adele Clark's complex housekeeping system that allowed every room in the house to be dusted at least twice a week. It wasn't until the third day that Dancing Quail opened the door to what was known as the basket room. She remembered Father Mark saying that the Clarks were interested in baskets, but until she entered the sweet-smelling room, she had seen no evidence of it. When she stepped inside, the clean, dry smell of yucca and bear grass overpowered her. Smelling them made her want to weep for her home, for her grandmother, and for all that was both familiar and lost to her. Tempted to cry, she forced herself to work. Dancing quail came from a society where baskets and livestock were signs of wealth. At home, she had never seen so many baskets in one place. Many were crammed together, stacked against walls or piled haphazardly in corners, as though they'd been gathered in a hurry, and no one had yet taken the time to sort them. The girl recognized some of the designs and patterns as ones from the Tohono Ho'otham, but there were baskets of many other tribes as well, Hopi, Navajo, Yaqui, and even some of the hated Apache. Slowly, savoring the smell and touch of familiar objects, Dancing Quail worked her way around the room, 
coming at last to a glass-enclosed case where someone had bothered to arrange the fine baskets displayed there. Cautiously she opened one door, propped it up on its hinge, and began moving the baskets around on the shelf, gingerly dusting each basket as well as the shelf beneath it. She had finished the first shelf and was ready to start on the next when she saw it sitting there, waiting. Understanding woman's basket. Not the crude one from the leather case upstairs, but the original one, with its fine, straight seams and smooth, silky weave, the basket that had been taken from Dancing Quail's bedroll years before. With trembling fingers she took it in her hands and pried open the tight-fitting lid. Not only was the basket there, so were all of the things that had been inside— the sacred gifts her grandmother had given her, except for the missing geode. One at a time, dancing quail touched each precious item, the jagged piece of pottery with its etched turtle still clearly visible, the seashell her grandfather had brought back from the ocean, and the eagle feather dancing quail's father had brought to his own mother when he was still a boy. They were all there, and all perfectly safe, as though they had been waiting for dancing quail to find them. As she put each item back inside and carefully closed the lid, she felt understanding woman's spirit close beside her, guiding her. Brandon swung by Tucson Medical Center on his way back through town. Nothing had changed with Toby Walker. Luella refused her son's offer of a ride home. I've got to be going then, Mom, he said. Going? Luella asked vaguely. Where? I'm working, he lied. I'm on a case. Oh, she said distractedly. Oh, you go on then. I'll be fine. What did the doctor say? He asked gently. Luella's eyes filled with sudden tears. Then it's up to me, she said. And I don't want it to be. I want somebody else to make the decision, God or someone, just not me. She fell, sobbing, into Brandon's arms. He held her for several long minutes. Luella didn't ask her son to make the decision for her, and he didn't offer. It wasn't his place. We'll just have to wait and see then, won't we? he said. Luella gulped and nodded. Yes, she said. Wait and see. Brandon left the hospital and drove to Gates Pass. He had waited to contact Diana, hoping to have some definite news about Carlyle's whereabouts before he told her anything. Once he talked to Mallory, there wasn't time to reach her before leaving for Picasso Peak to meet Detective Farrell. Driving to Diana's house now, he worried about what he would say. He didn't want to alarm her unduly, but he was worried. If Andrew Carlyle was responsible for Margie Danielson's savage murder, and by now both detectives were fairly certain he was, that meant the man had somehow slipped over some critical edge. There was no telling who would be next. A snippet of radio intruded into his thoughts, giving the first sketchy reports of a stabbing victim found dead that morning in a downtown Tucson hotel room. At least he wouldn't be called out on that case, Walker thought. The Santa Rita was well inside the city limits, so the county would have nothing to do with it. He switched off the radio and kept on driving. Brandon heard the dog bark from inside the house as soon as he turned off the blacktop. Ho-ho, as Diana called him, was a monster of an animal, a rangy, ugly specimen whose teeth could inflict real damage. Right at that moment, however, Brandon Walker smiled at the dog's menacing presence. If Andrew Carlyle decided to try coming after Diana Ladd, he'd have to get past the dog first. In a fair fight, Brandon would have put money on the dog any day. He half expected the door to open, but it didn't. Remaining out of sight, Diana spoke to him through a partially opened window. Who is it? Brandon Walker. Is it safe to get out of the car? It's safe, 
she called back. Bones with me. Brandon waited outside while she unlatched a series of locks. That seemed strange. He didn't remember seeing multiple locks on the door before, but of course they might have been there without his noticing. When the door opened, Bone sat directly behind Diana with Davy hanging on the huge dog's neck. "'May I come in?' he asked. "'Yes.' He stepped over the threshold. "'I've got to talk to you,' he said urgently, "'in private.' Diana Ladd stared up at him, her eyes fixed in turn on every aspect of his face as though examining him in minute detail. "'Davy,' she said without looking away, "'take Bone out back and throw the ball for a while. I'll call you in a few minutes.' The child left the room, shoulders sagging, head drooping, with the dog following dutifully behind. "'What do you want to talk to me about?' she asked. All his careful plans for telling her flew out the window. "'Andrew Carlyle,' he replied. "'He's out.' "'I know,' she said. "'That's why I'm wearing this.' A raw recruit would have been drummed out of the academy for making such a mistake. It wasn't until she touched it with her hand that he noticed the gun and holster strapped to her hip. And not just any gun, either. A gigantic forty-five Colt single-action revolver. Jesus H. Christ, woman, is that thing loaded? It certainly is, she told him calmly, and I'm fully prepared to use it. Chapter 15 Diana ushered Brandon into the house and showed him to a seat on the couch. The detective still worried about the gun. "'You shouldn't do this, you know,' he said. "'Do what? Wear a gun? Protect myself? Why not? "'For one thing, if somebody gets shot with that thing, "'chances are it won't be Andrew Carlyle. "'In an armed confrontation with crooks, "'amateurs tend to shoot themselves, not the other way around. "'For another, it's 1975. "'We're not still living in the Wild West, you know.' "'Somebody forgot to tell the woman at Picasso Peak,' Diana returned. You know about that, too? The reservation grapevine is pretty thorough. And fast. Andrew Carlyle was the first thing I was coming to tell you, and Picacho Peak was the second. I've just come from there. I met with a detective on that case. His name's Farrell, Detective G.T. Farrell from Pinal County. He's a real pro. I've already pointed him in Carlyle's direction. I suppose that's only fair, Diana responded sarcastically since you're the one who helped Carlyle get off in the first place. Diana Ladd's remark cut through Brandon Walker's usually even-tempered demeanor. I didn't help him, goddammit! Brandon Walker snapped. The hard edge of anger in his voice surprised them both. How old were you seven years ago? he demanded roughly. Twenty-four. I was a little older than that, but it wasn't much wiser. When I told you to trust the system, I meant it, because I still did, too. I was young and idealistic and ignorant. I thought being a cop was one way to save the world. So get off your cross, Diana. You weren't the only one who got screwed. So did I. Diana Ladd was taken aback by this outburst. In the brief silence that followed, Davy and Bone edged back into the room. I'm hot, the boy said. Can I have something to drink? His request offered Diana an escape from Brandon Walker's unexpected anger. Sure, she said lightly, getting up. The tea should be ready by now. Would you like some, Detective Walker? He nodded. That'll be fine. After she left the room, Walker sat there, shaking his head, ashamed of himself for lashing out at her. What she'd said hadn't been any worse than what he'd told himself time and again during the intervening years. Diana Ladd didn't have a corner on the let's-beat-up-Brandon-Walker market. He could do a pretty damn good job of that all by himself. With effort, the detective turned his attention to the boy who sat on the floor, absently petting the dog. Davy seemed decidedly less friendly than he had been the day before. Wondering why, Brandon made a stab at conversation. "'How's the head?' 
he asked. It's okay, I guess, Davy muttered. Does it still hurt? Not much. Will my hair grow back? Where they shaved it, I mean? It'll take a few weeks, but it'll grow. Have the barber give you a crew cut. It won't show so much then. Mom cuts my hair, Davy said, to save money. I don't think she knows how to do crew cuts. Brandon glanced toward the swinging kitchen door. It seemed to be taking Diana an inordinately long time to bring the tea. Did you know my daddy? Davy asked. It was a jarring change of subject. No, Walker replied. I never met him. Was my father a killer? Brandon found the unvarnished directness of the boy's questions unnerving. "'Why are you asking me?' he hedged. "'Everybody says my daddy was a killer,' Davy answered matter-of-factly. "'They call me Killer's Child. "'I want to know what happened to him. "'I'm six. "'That's old enough to know what really happened.' Brandon Walker realized, too late, that he'd been sucked into an emotional minefield. "'What did your mother tell you?' he asked. "'That my daddy was afraid he was going to get into trouble about Gina Antone, so he killed himself.' "'That's right. At least Diana had told her son that much. "'Mom said you were the detective. Did you arrest him?' "'No,' Brandon said. "'By the time I got to the house, your father was already gone.' "'Gone where?' "'Out to the desert.' to kill himself. That's where he did it, isn't it? In the desert? Yes. Davy turned his immense blue eyes full on the detective's face. Why didn't you get there sooner? he demanded. Why didn't you hurry and stop him? That way I could have met him before he died. I could have talked to him just once. Your father was a scumbag, Walker wanted to say looking at the wide-eyed boy. Garrison lad didn't deserve a son like you. Instead, he said, I did the best I could, Davy. We all did. It is said that long ago in a small village lived a very beautiful young woman who was the daughter of a very powerful medicine man. She was so beautiful that all the young men of the village liked to look at her. This made her father so angry that he made her stay in the house. If she went out, he scolded her. Whenever he found the young men of the village trying to spy on her, he scolded them, too. In those days, Wind Man spent much of his time in that same village. One day the young men of the village went to Wind Man and teased him and said that since he was strong enough and clever enough, he should catch the girl when she came out to get water and take her up in the air so they could all see her. At first Wind Man refused, saying that it would be wrong to do this and make her father angry. But the young men begged and pleaded, and at last that is what happened. When the girl came out of her house to get water, all the young men in the village were watching. Holding her in his arms, Wind Man took her high up into the air, very gently carrying her around and around. Her long hair was loosened. It fell down and wrapped itself around her until it touched the ground. Then it caught up the nearby leaves and dust and carried them back into the air with her. And that is the story of how the very first whirlwind there ever was on the desert. Brandon Walker remembered the whirlwinds. A fierce wind was kicking up a line of them and propelling them across the desert floor as he drove south toward Topawa for the second time. The first trip had been the day before to notify the victim's grandmother that Gina Antone was dead. The second time he returned to Topawa, he was looking for Gina's killer. Walker was called in on the case as soon as it was determined that the water hole in which the body had been found was in the county rather than on reservation land. A dead Indian wasn't high on Sheriff Duchesne's list of priorities. As a result, Walker wasn't assigned in a very timely fashion. 
The body was discovered by a pair of city slicker hunters out shooting coyotes, mostly for the hell of it, and only incidentally for the bounty paid for each stinking coyote carcass. The two men found the girl floating face down in the muddy pond, and had called the sheriff's office to report it only after getting back to town. Walker theorized that some of their hunting may have been on reservation land, and they hadn't wanted to call attention to either the body or themselves until after the dead coyotes were well away from Papago boundaries. A deputy was dispatched to the scene. Not realizing that the fence with the cattle guard took him onto the reservation, and the second took him back off, he left the girl where he found her and reported that it was up to the Papago tribal police. Only after all jurisdictional dust had settled was Brandon Walker assigned the case. By then, someone had already collected the body. He went to the scene, accompanied by a tribal officer named Tony Listo, and discovered the crime scene area so picked over that there was nothing left to find. Tony pointed Brandon in the direction of the Charco, but he himself was reluctant to leave his pickup. "'This is a bad place,' he said. "'People don't like to come here.' "'That hadn't stopped the great white hunters,' Walker thought. "'You mean Indians don't like to come here?' "'Yes,' Listo nodded. "'They sure don't.' "'You're saying the girl wouldn't have come here on her own?' Brandon Walker asked. "'No, I don't think so,' Listo replied. This short exchange happened prior to the autopsy, while speculation was still rife that the young woman was nothing but a drunk who had fallen in the water and drowned. Later, after the autopsy, the rope burns on her neck and wrists, among other injuries, had more than borne out Listo's initial theory. Gina Antone hadn't gone to the waterhole because she had wanted to, but because she was forced. The other things that happened to her weren't by choice either. Walker left the charcoal, following the Indian police officer's direction. He made his way first to Sells and then south to an Indian village called Topawa, where the dead woman's grandmother lived in an adobe shack behind a small mission church. He went to the rough wooden door and knocked, but no one answered. He was about to leave when a vintage GMC creaked into the yard behind him. A wide-bodied old woman stepped out. He waited by the door. "'Are you Rita Antone?' he asked. She nodded. He held out his card, which she looked at but did not take. "'I'm with the sheriff's department,' he said. "'I came to talk to you about your granddaughter.' "'I know,' the old lady said. "'My nephew already told me.' Silent now, Brandon and the boy waited until Diana returned to the living room, bearing a tray laden with glasses of iced tea and a plate of freshly made tuna sandwiches. "'We have to eat to keep up our strength,' she said. The air of false gaiety in her tone grated on Brandon's nerves. She still wore the gun. Who the hell was she trying to kid, Brandon wondered. Him? Her child? or, more likely, herself. "'I heard you two talking,' she said, placing the tray on the table in front of the couch. "'What about?' Davy shot the detective a quick, meaningful look. "'I asked him if my hair would grow back,' Davy replied. "'You know, the part they shaved off? He said yes.' Brandon Walker was impressed. The kid was a talented liar. Well, they had indeed talked about Davy's hair growing back, but they had talked about a lot of other things besides. Walker was surprised that Davy didn't mention any of them. Something was going on between the boy and his mother, an undercurrent, a tension that had been missing when he had seen them on Friday and Saturday. "'How long will it take?' Diana asked, chewing a bite of sandwich and falling completely for Davy's lie of omission. It took a moment for Brandon to reorient himself to the conversation. To grow out his hair? A few weeks, he said. Not much longer than that. A crew cut would help. I don't do crew cuts, 
Diana said. I don't have clippers. And that was the end of that. Davy took his sandwich, tea, and dog, and melted, ghost-like, into another room, leaving the two grown-ups in another moment of awkward silence. I can't get over how you've changed, Brandon said, still thinking about the gun. Since that first time I met you, I mean. Murder and suicide do that to you, she responded. They make you grow up quick. You're never the same afterward. No matter how hard you try, you can never be the same. After watching Gary drive off and hanging up the phone, Diana stumbled blindly back to the couch and sat there for what seemed like hours, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Briefly, she thought about jumping in the car, driving into town, and looking for him. But where would she go? Gary had mentioned lots of places where he and Andrew Carlyle hung out together, lowbrow places where Andrew said you could see slices of real life, the tally-ho, the green dolphin, the golden nugget, the Grant Road Tavern, the shanty. She knew the names of the bars, the joints, but she hadn't been to any of them personally and couldn't bear the humiliation of going now, of trailing after him, of being just another foolish, hapless wife asking jaded, snickering bartenders if they had seen her drunk of a husband. Because Gary was drinking more now, she finally admitted to herself, just like her father and she, just like Iona, continued to stand by him for no apparent reason. She could see now that she should have stayed in Eugene, should never have agreed to come to this terrible place where she would be without resources and where he would fall under the spell of that man. That man. Andrew Carlyle. It was easy to blame all of Gary's shortcomings on Andrew Carlyle. Diana saw the professor as a sort of evil pied piper, as someone who had cast a terrible spell over her husband's psyche and bent it to his own purposes. Some of Carlyle's catchphrases whirled back through her memory, just as Gary Ladd had reported them to her. Write what you know. Experience is the greatest teacher. If you want to write about it, do it. Do it? Do what? For the first time she allowed herself to frame the question. What was Gary writing? She had never asked to look at his manuscript, had never interfered with his work. That was an act of faith on her part, a self-imposed test of her loyalty. Of course, she had passed the exam with flying colors. She was, after all, Iona Dade Cooper's daughter. How could she do anything else? She had buried her head in the sand and refused to see anything beyond the fact that the stack of manuscript pages on his desk in the spare bedroom had grown gradually taller. That had been the only proof she'd ever required to convince herself that Gary was working that he was doing what he was supposed to and living up to his part of the bargain. But now, trembling with fear, Diana sprang from the couch and went looking for the manuscript. Naturally, it wasn't there. The Smith Corona still sat on the desk in the spare bedroom, and the blank paper was there where it should have been, but the manuscript itself was gone. She had seen it earlier in the day, when she'd been straightening up the house. That could mean only one thing. Gary had taken it with him when he left. Why, she wondered, why would he? Diana looked at Brandon Walker across the top of her iced tea glass. She seemed much more composed now, as though she had made up her mind about something while she was making the sandwiches. "'So why are you here?' she asked. "'Why did you come all the way out here? "'Are you worried about me?' "'Yes,' he admitted. "'And you're convinced, just like I am, "'that he may come looking for me?' "'Yes,' he said again. "'It was true. That was his concern. "'He could point to no concrete evidence to that effect, "'but all his cop instincts screamed out warnings "'that this woman was in danger.' She laughed aloud in the face of his obvious distress. <laughs> Me too, she said. At least we're agreed on that score. 
Now tell me, if you don't want me to wear a gun, and if you don't want me to protect myself, what do you suggest I do? Leave, he said simply. Go away for a while. Stay with friends or relatives and give us a chance to catch him. Once Detective Farrell gets going on this case, Carlyle won't be on the loose for long. He has no way of knowing that we're already on to him, and if it weren't for the Indians, God knows we wouldn't be. What Indians? Diana asked. Two papagos came to see me this morning, an old blind one and a younger one, an enormous man whose name is uh, Gabe Ortiz. Fat Crack came to see you? Diana said incredulously. His name is Fat Crack? You know him? He's evidently some kind of relative of the murdered girl. Diana nodded. Her cousin. He's Rita's nephew. But I can't imagine him coming to town to talk to an Anglo cop about this. Well, he did, Brandon said defensively, and he brought the old blind man with him. They tipped us off early, so we're on Carlyle's trail while it's still relatively warm. When I left him, Farrell was on his way to Florence to see if he could pick up any useful information, the name of Carlyle's relatives or friends in the area, for instance, someone he might turn to for help now that he's out. I remember his mother hanging around town during the time when his case was about to come to trial. It seems like she was from North Phoenix somewhere, maybe Peoria or Glendale, but I don't think she had the same last name. Farrell will try to get a line on her as well. And meanwhile, you want me to run away and hide? Right. Well, I won't, Diana declared stubbornly. I'm going to stay right here in my own home. And if he comes looking for me, I'll kill a son of a bitch. I'll put a damn bullet right between his eyes. That's premeditation, Brandon countered. If you kill him, you'll be in big trouble. Too bad. It's a whole lot more likely, though, that you'll choke up when the time comes and not have nerve enough to pull the trigger. I'll have nerve enough, she replied. She was determined, tough, and foolhardy. Brandon Walker wanted desperately to talk her out of it. He had only one other weapon at his disposal, and he didn't hesitate to use it. What will that do to Davy? he asked. Diana paused and swallowed. Davy? He'll be fine, she said. He'll have Rita. Willie? Will that be enough? People already call him Killer's child. Her eyes flashed with sudden anger. How do you know that? Who told you? Davy did, Brandon said, watching as shocked dismay registered on her face. You'd better leave now, Diana said. Brandon Walker unfolded his long legs from the couch and got up to go, but first he stood for a moment, staring down at her. Think about it, he said gravely. Davy's only a boy, Diana. How much of this do you think he can take? He paused at the end of the driveway and berated himself for betraying the boy's confidence, but it was the only possible means of pounding some sense into Diana's thick skull. Meantime, he looked around him in despair for other signs of civilization. No one else lived anywhere around here, for God's sake. She couldn't have picked a worse place. Help would be miles away if and when she finally needed it. Enclosed behind the forest of cactus and with a high wall surrounding the patio and backyard area, the house had a fortress-like appearance, but appearances were deceiving. Once someone breached that walled perimeter, if the dog were taken out of the picture, for instance, the people in the isolated house would be totally vulnerable. Diana talked a good game, but Walker didn't believe for a moment that she'd actually use the gun. She would threaten, but then hesitate at the critical moment. Even veteran cops made that potentially fatal mistake at times. But even as he worried about her, Walker was struck by the difference between Diana now defiant and resourceful, and the way she was when he first saw her, broken and worried sick about that bastard husband of hers. He had driven up to the mobile home in Topawa late in the afternoon of an oppressively hot June Saturday. The sky was blue overhead, 
but far away across the desert a red wall of moving sand topped by black thunderheads announced an approaching storm. Diana came to the door wearing a shapeless robe. Her eyes were red as though she'd been crying. Her face was drawn from lack of sleep, and her coloring sallow and unhealthy. When he showed her his ID, she turned even paler. "'Does Garrison Lad live here?' he asked. She nodded. "'Is he home?' "'No, he's not. He's gone.' "'Do you have any idea when he'll be back?' "'No.' "'Are you Mrs. Ladd?' "'Yes.' "'Could I come in and speak with you for a few minutes?' She stepped aside and held the door for him to come in without asking what he wanted or why he was there. As soon as he saw the crumpled newspaper on the floor, he guessed that she already knew. He took a small notebook from his pocket. "'I'd like to ask you a few questions. Mind if I sit down?' "'No. Go ahead.' He sat while she remained standing, her arms wrapped tightly around her body as if she were desperately cold, although the cooler was off and the temperature was stifling. Outside, the wind kicked up, and the first few splatters of rain pelted against the metal siding. "'Was your husband home last Friday night?' he asked. "'He was out,' Diana answered woodenly. "'He went to a dance.' "'Where?' "'One of the villages, San Pedro.' What time did he get home? Saturday, in the morning. The dance lasted all night. Did he go by himself? No. His professor went with him, his creative writing professor from the U, Andrew Carlyle. And did this Andrew Carlyle come home with your husband? No. Gary came home by himself. How did he seem when he came home? Was he upset? Did he act as though something was wrong? Diana had been answering his questions as though in a fog. Now she seemed to rouse herself. I shouldn't be talking to you, she said evasively. Brandon played dumb. Why not? You're going to trap me into saying something I shouldn't. So he was upset. I didn't say that he was fine when he came home. Tired from being up all night and maybe from having had too much to drink. He was drinking? A little. Brandon stared meaningfully at the newspaper lying on the floor, its front page crumpled into a wad. He made sure there could be no doubt about where he was looking. You've seen the paper, he said. Did you know the girl? In the stricken silence that followed, both became aware of the steady drum of wind and rain on the outside of the trailer. For the longest time, Diana Ladd didn't answer. No, she said at last. I didn't know her. What about her grandmother, Rita Antone? She lives just across the way, a few hundred yards. Diana nodded. I know Rita from school, but we're not necessarily friends. Did your husband know Gina? Maybe. I don't know everyone my husband knows. Why did he go to the dance? Why does anyone? To eat at the feast? To drink the wine? Is your husband a student of Indian customs? he asked. My husband is a writer, she answered. By the time the detective finally left the house, he drove into the teeth of a raging desert storm. Fierce winds shook the car, while sheets of rain washing across the windshield made it difficult to see. Walker had been told that the dance at San Pedro had been a traditional rain dance. It worked with a vengeance, he thought, as he slowed down to pick his way through a dip already filling with fast-moving brown water. Two miles east to Three Points, he was stuck for forty-five minutes at one of the larger dips, waiting for cascading water to recede. He was still there when a call came over the radio telling him to turn around and go back to the reservation. A pickup truck had been found in a flooded wash off Highway 86, 
west of Kihotoa. When the highway patrol was finally able to reach the vehicle, they found a body inside, that of a male Caucasian with a single self-inflicted bullet hole in his head. That was how Brandon Walker first laid eyes on Garrison Ladd. As he told Davy years later, Garrison Ladd was dead from the bullet wound long before Walker had met him. Rita had hated living with the Clarks. All that week, no matter what she did, the mill gun woman found fault with Dancing Quail's work. She didn't work fast enough. She wasn't thorough enough. She wasn't good enough. And all that week, Dancing Quail kept silent in the face of Adele Clark's angry onslaughts, but she began planning what she would do. I'm very unhappy here, she told Louisa one night as they were getting ready for bed in their stuffy upstairs room. I must go someplace else to find work. My brother Gordon is in California, Louisa offered. I could write and ask him. He might know some place you could go. How far is California? Dancing Quail asked. Louisa shook her head. A long way. How can I go there? On the train, I think, Louisa answered. Will you write down where your brother is so I can find him? Louisa's eyes grew large. You would go there? By yourself? I can't stay here. Rita answered stubbornly. Louisa wrote her brother's address on a scrap of paper, which Dancing Quail tucked inside the leather case. "'What about Mrs. Clark?' Louisa asked. "'What will she say?' "'She won't know until after I am gone.' Dancing Quail surprised herself when she talked so bravely, but a river of courage flowed into her from Understanding Woman's medicine basket. She was determined that once more she would have that basket as her own. She waited impatiently for the next occasion when she would be scheduled to dust the basket room. At the appointed time, she took the other medicine basket with her, concealed under her apron. When she finished dusting, the new basket, now empty, had been exchanged for the other. That very night, important guests came to visit the Clarks and were shown through the basket room. Breathlessly, Dancing Quail waited to see if the switch would be discovered. But it was not. No one opened the glass case. The mill gone woman either couldn't tell or didn't notice the difference in quality between the two medicine baskets. Two days later on Thursday, Girls' Day, the domestic workers' traditional afternoon off, Rita declined Louise's invitation to visit the park. Instead, she stayed behind. First, she cut off her long braids, hiding the clipped hair in her leather case. Then, with her hair cut short and taking only the precious medicine basket with her, she made her way downtown. Going to one of the few stores that catered to Indians, she bought a set of men's clothing telling the clerk she was buying it for her younger brother who was coming from the reservation to visit. Dancing Quail took her purchases and slipped away into an alley where she donned the new clothing. At first it felt strange to be wearing stiff pants, a long-sleeved shirt, and heavy shoes, but she soon got used to it. That night, with the help of two young men, Papagos she met in the train yard, Dancing Quail headed west on a slow-moving, California-bound freight train. It was hot on the train and noisy, but not nearly as frightening as it had been long ago as she headed to Phoenix from Chukchon for the very first time. Dancing Quail told the two Indian boys she was traveling with that she was going to join her brother in California. A job waited for her there in a place called Redlands. Each time the train slowed for a station, the Indians would jump off and hide so that when the railroad police, the boys called them bulls, checked, no one would be there. Then, as the train started up again, they would run and jump on it. Sometimes the three were alone in the car, sometimes other travelers, mostly Mexicans, but also a few other Indians, joined them. For a long time they rode and talked. But late that night, when the towns and stops got farther apart, 
dancing quail found herself growing sleepy. She was dozing when she felt something pressing against her. Opening her eyes, she found another papago, smelling of alcohol and very drunk, trying to unfasten her pants. Stop, she hissed. Stop now. Marsh, he whispered back. You are promiscuous. You want it. If you did not, you would not be here. But she didn't want it. What she had done with Father John was one thing. That she had wanted to do. But this was different. Struggling away from him in the swaying, noisy box car, she groped inside her shirt and found the medicine basket. She pried off the tight-fitting lid as he came after her again. In addition to the items that had been there originally, and the ones she had added from the other basket, there was now one other item, the awij, the awl, which dancing quail used to make her baskets. Her trembling fingers sought the awl, found it, and clutched it in the palm of her hand. Her attacker reached for her again, grabbing her pants, fumbling them down over her hips. But as he leaned over her, thinking her helpless, he felt something hard and sharp press painfully into the soft flesh at the base of his throat. He grunted in surprise. Pia, she whispered fiercely. No. When he didn't back off, she increased the pressure on the awl. Any moment she would cut him, and then what would he do? Cry out? Kill her? She should have been terrified, but understanding woman's spirit was still strong inside her. For a long time they stayed frozen that way in the darkened box-car, with him above dancing quail, pinning her down, and with the awl pricking his neck. Finally he pulled away. Hook, he said, backing off. Monster! But it didn't matter to Dancing Quail what he called her, as long as he left her alone. Once he was gone, she pulled her pants back up and refastened them. She lay there then, wide awake, waiting for morning, afraid to close her eyes for fear he would come after her again. Finally, as the orange sun rolled up over the rocky far horizon, she did drift off for a little while. She woke up with a start a few minutes later. The awl was still clutched firmly in her hand. Only later did she realize that the arrowhead had disappeared from the opened basket. Andrew Carlyle waited until he was sure his mother was asleep before he crept out of the house. He drove until he found a payphone at an all-night Circle K. His hand shook as he dialed the old, familiar number, and then waited to see if it would ring. It had been so many years. Perhaps the phone had been disconnected by now. Perhaps the system no longer worked. The telephone was answered on the third ring. J.S. and Associates, a woman's voice said. He plugged the required change into the phone. I'm an insurance investigator, he said. I'll be in town tomorrow, and I need a copy of a police report on the double. I don't want to have to wait around for it once I get there. Have you done business with our firm before? Yes, but it's been several years. Are you familiar with our new location? No. We're on Speedway, just east of the university, in a house that's been converted into offices. Just the thought of being close to the university made Carlyle uncomfortable. He was always afraid of running into someone he knew. Will you be coming by in person? No, he said. Someone will be in to pick it up. Fine. What report is it you need? The accident that happened on the Kitt Peak Road last Friday. Case number? I don't have it with me. Anything else? No, that's all. Very good. That'll be $150 cash on delivery. Please place the cash in an envelope. We'll have another envelope here waiting for you. What name should I put on it? Spalding, he said, suddenly unable to resist the joke. Myrna Louise Spalding. She'll be in to pick it up around noon. Very good. Anything else? No, ma'am, Carlyle responded cheerfully. It's a pleasure doing business with you. 
Fat Crack brought Looks at Nothing home to his house, where Wanda Ortiz, the younger man's unfailingly cheerful wife, served them a dinner of chili, beans, and fresh tortillas. She was mystified about her husband spending so much time with the old medicine man, but she said nothing. As a good husband and provider, Gabe was allowed his little foibles now and then. "'We will need some clay,' looks at nothing said. "'White clay from Babo Kivari to make the gruel.' Fat Crack nodded. "'Right. I know where to find such clay.' And the singers? Looks at nothing asked. I know nothing at all about singers. The best ones for this come from Crow Hang. It will be expensive. You must feed them all four days. Fat Crack nodded. My aunt says she will pay whatever it costs from her basket money. The singers can stay here at my house. Wanda will do the cooking. I will see about them tomorrow when I pick up my aunt from the hospital to take her home. Your wife is a good woman, looks at nothing said. You are lucky to have her. I know, Fat Crack agreed. They were sitting outside under the stars. Looks at nothing, lit another crooked cigarette from his seemingly endless supply. He took a puff and passed it. Nawash, he said. Nawash, Fat Crack replied. Far away from them, across the horizon, a bank of clouds bubbled with lightning. The rains were coming, probably before the end of the week. You would make a good medicine man, looks at nothing said thoughtfully. You understood how the enemy could be both Apache and not Apache long before I did. Perhaps I am getting too old. You are old, Fat Crack returned, but not too old. Besides, in my religion, I am already a medicine man of sorts, a practitioner. What kind of religion is this? White man's religion? Christian scientist. Christian, I understand. That is like Father John. What is scientist? Fat Crack considered for a moment. We believe, he said, that God's power flows through all of us. Looks at nothing, nodded. You are not a practitioner, he insisted firmly. You are a medicine man. Fat Crack smiled into the night at the old man's stubbornness. Perhaps you are right, he said, laughing. A medicine man with a tow truck. Chapter 16 with Brandon Walker gone and Davy fast asleep in his room, Diana was wide awake and stewing. It had been easy to turn on the bravado when the detective was there, to act as though she were ten feet tall and bulletproof, but it was a lie. She was petrified. Having Walker confirm that he, too, believed Carlyle was coming for them, gave form and substance to a once vague but threatening specter. Walker's fear, added to Rita's as well as her own, created in Diana a sense of fear squared, terror to a higher power. What before had seemed little more than a fairy tale was now disturbingly real. Brandon Walker wasn't in the business of fairy tales. Cops, particularly homicide cops, didn't joke about such things. Diana went to bed and tried to sleep but found herself tossing and turning, hounded by a series of waking nightmares, each more terrifying than the last. What was it like to die, she wondered. What did it feel like? Did it hurt? When her mother had died, it had been a blessing, a release from incredibly agonizing pain and worse indignity. But Diana wasn't terminally ill. 
and she wasn't ready to die. Not yet. That hadn't always been the case. In those first black days right after Gary's death, she hadn't much cared if she lived or died. She was so physically ill herself that sometimes death seemed preferable. That was before she found out the cause of her raging bouts of nausea, before she knew she was pregnant, newly widowed and newly pregnant. Max Cooper didn't come to Gary's memorial service for the simple reason that he and his second wife were neither notified nor invited. Gary's folks flew in first class from Chicago and took over. Gary's mother, Astrid, wanted a big funeral at home in her home church with all attendant pomp and circumstance. Diana respectfully demurred. All she could handle was an unpretentious and poorly attended memorial service at the faded funeral home on South 6th. Afterward, Gary's parents left for Chicago, and the real production number of a funeral, while Diana skulked back home to the reservation and shut herself up inside the trailer. By the time the authorities finally got around to releasing the bodies, Gina Antone's funeral was scheduled two days after Gary's hurried memorial service. With no one to offer guidance, Diana Ladd spent the two days agonizing over what she should do about it. Should she go or stay away? Would her appearance be considered an admission of guilt or a protestation of Gary Ladd's innocence? For Diana Ladd believed wholeheartedly in Gary's innocence. She believed in it with all the ferocity of a child who clings desperately to his soon-to-be outgrown belief in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. She could not yet look at who and what her husband really was. Accepting the burden of his guilt, the only option offered her by Brandon Walker, the detective on the case, would have forced the issue. Instead, she took the line of least resistance. Gary's three-word equivocal statement transformed itself into a full-fledged denial. I don't remember became I didn't do it. Guilt became innocence, and fiction became truth. With all this boiling in her head, Diana peeked out between threadbare panels of drapes and looked across the muddy quagmire that separated the Topawa teacher's compound from the village proper. The church parking lot was filling rapidly with cars and pickups as Indians gathered to pay their final respects. It was time for Diana to make a decision, and she did. Dressing quickly, she put on the same blue double-knit suit she had worn to Gary's memorial service, the same suit he had picked out as her going-away dress for their honeymoon. She pulled her hair back in a bun and fastened it up with hairpins, the same way Iona used to wear hers. Wearing it that way made Diana look older, much older. It made her look like her mother. Dressed in the suit, but with sandals on her feet because of the mud, Diana Ladd started across the hundred yards or so of no man's land, the vast gulf between the Anglo teacher's compound and the Indian village, between her home and Gina Antone's funeral, between Diana's past and what would become her future. Once she set foot on that path, there was no turning back. The mission church was filled to capacity, but people in the back row shifted aside just enough to let her in. She wanted to be small, invisible, but her arrival was greeted by an inevitable and whispered notice. Everyone knew she was there. She felt, or maybe only imagined, the stiffening backs of people around her. She flushed, sensing that they disapproved of her presence, although no one had the bad manners to say so outright. Topawa Mission itself was small and plain, and reminded Diana of the church back home in Joseph, Oregon. There was no side room where Gina's mourning relatives could have grieved in private. They sat stolidly, shoulder to shoulder, in the front row next to Rita. In addition to the grandmother, there were two couples, an older one and a younger. Were two of them Gina's parents? Did they know she was here in church with them? Diana wondered. 
What would they do when they found out? Spit at her? Throw her out? The service started. Gradually, Diana allowed herself to be caught up in the familiar strains of the mass, the sounds and smells of which came back from the dim reaches of her childhood. Iona Ann Dade Cooper's daughter, Diana Lee Bernadette, had been a devout child growing up in Joseph, but she had left the church without a backward glance in early adulthood, not only over the issue of birth control, but also over her marriage to a non-Catholic. Garrison Walther Ladd III, the only son of staunch Lutherans, never would have consented to his child being brought up in the Catholic Church. Somehow, in a way Gary's memorial service hadn't, Gina's funeral became a requiem for everything Diana had lost, her childhood as well as her marriage, her husband, and her mother. When the Mass was over, instead of bolting out first as she had intended, she was too overcome to leave until after Rita and the others had already trudged down the aisle and were waiting at the door to greet the attendees. There was no escape. As soon as she stood up, the people parted around her as though she were a carrier of some contagious dread disease. And that was how she arrived in front of Rita and Tone, isolated and alone in the midst of the crowd. The old Indian woman held out a leathery hand and grasped Diana's smooth one. The younger woman looked up and met Rita's fearsome, bloodshot gaze. "'I'm so sorry,' Diana whispered. Rita nodded, pressing her hand. "'Are you coming to the feast?' the old woman asked. "'The, the, the feast?' Diana stammered uncomprehendingly. "'At the feast-house after the cemetery. You must come. We will sit together,' Rita said kindly. "'You see, we are both Hegel we Ithog. "'Pardon me?' "'We are both left alone. You must come. Sit with me.' Behind them, People in line shifted impatiently. Stunned by such kindness and generosity, Diana could not turn it down. "'I'll come,' she murmured. "'Thank you.' Detective G. T. Farrell arrived in Florence in the late evening and set about putting the Arizona State Penitentiary on notice. Farrell was a man unaccustomed to taking no for an answer. When one person turned him down, he automatically moved up to the next rung on the ladder of command and turned up the volume. By two o'clock in the morning, he had done the unthinkable. Warden Adam Dixon himself was out of bed and working on the problem. When the warden discovered that Ron Mallory's home phone was either conveniently out of order or off the hook, he sent a car to fetch him. Ron Mallory made his way into the warden's well-lit office, feeling distinctly queasy. Obviously, he should have paid more attention to the guy on the phone, the one who had been looking for Andrew Carlyle earlier, because whoever was looking for him now had a whole lot more horses behind him. "'What seems to be the problem?' Mallory asked, putting on as good a front as possible. "'Carlyle's the problem,' Warden Dixon growled. "'Where the hell is he?' "'Tucson, as far as I know, sir,' Mallory answered quickly. "'We put him on the bus to Tucson.' "'Where in Tucson?' "'He'd rented an apartment down off 22nd Street somewhere, "'but that fell through the day of his release. "'The landlord called me while I was waiting for a guard to bring in the prisoner. "'The guy told me Carlisle couldn't have the apartment he wanted after all. Since he was already half signed out, there wasn't much I could do but let him go. He said he'd check in as soon as he found some other place to stay. Has he? Well, that's as far as I know, sir. I glanced at my messages on the way in. I didn't see anything from him, although I'll be glad to go back and check. You do that, Warden Dixon said. You go check, and if you don't find it, 
you might consider cleaning out your desk. Come tomorrow morning, and you're going to find yourself back on the line, mister. I kid you not. In the cell blocks? Mallory's jaw dropped. I don't understand what's going on. I'll tell you what's going on. This detective here thinks Carlyle went on a rampage within minutes of checking out of this facility. Do you hear me? Within minutes. We've got one woman dead so far, a dame over by Picacho Peak with her tit bitten in two. Does that ring any bells with you, Mr. Mallory? Because if it doesn't, it by God should. Mallory took a step backward, edging toward the door. Furthermore, Dixon added ominously, you shake up whatever clerks there are on duty around here, and you start them looking through every goddamn record we have for any name or address that might give this detective a lead. You're in charge, Mallory. Do I make myself clear? Y yes, yes, sir, perfectly. Get moving, then. Mallory bolted from the room. As he panted toward his soon-to-be former office, he swore under his breath. If he ever got his hands around Andrew Carlyle's neck— Assistant Superintendent Ron Mallory would kill the bastard himself, personally. Diana fell asleep at last and dreamed about Gina's funeral, except it wasn't Gina's at all. It was her mother's. The two were all mixed up somehow. Instead of being in the mean funeral home in La Grande, where Max had held the funeral in real life, with half the mourners having to stand outside the doors because there was no more room. It was in the mission church at Topawa. Even the graveside part was in Topawa. And that, too, was like Gina's. Instead of a mortuary's canopy, four men from Joseph had stood as corner posts, holding up a sheet to provide shade, while someone else, she couldn't tell who, intoned a prayer. Although he hadn't attended Iona's real funeral, one of the four sheet-holders was George Deason, her rodeo queen mentor. Another was Ed Gentry from the First National Bank. There was Tad Morrison from Pay and Tote Grocery and George Howell from True Value Hardware. At Gina's graveside, an old blind man in Levi's and cowboy boots had offered a long series of interminable papago prayers that, out of deference to Diana, the only Anglo in attendance, were translated into English by someone else. This was true in her dream as well, except instead of a blind man in cowboy boots, the main speaker was a priest praying in what seemed to be Latin. After that, they moved on to the feast. Like the rest, this, too, was a strangely muddled mixture of Topawa and Joseph, of near-past and far-past, of Anglo and Indian. Instead of traditional Indian fare, the food was like the food at the cheap Joseph Day's barbecue, with grilled steaks and corn on the cob, homemade rolls and fresh fruit pies. People were dressed in their cheap Joseph Day's finery, including Diana in her rhinestone boots and her coronation Stetson with its rhinestone tiara. Diana was visiting with someone, an old lady, when her father came striding over to her, grabbed her hat and held it just out of reach while she tried desperately to reclaim it. "'Couldn't you find something better than this to wear?' he sneered down at her, shaking the hat but still holding it well beyond her fingertips. Did you have to come to your mother's funeral all tarted out in your hussy clothes? I'm not, she said. I'm not a hussy. I'm the queen. I get to wear these clothes. You can't stop me. You're not the queen, he leered back at her. Not really. You cheated. You cheated. You cheated. Diana woke up drenched in sweat with the hateful words still ringing in her ears. Her father had shouted those words at her in real life and left them echoing forever in her memory. But not then, not at her mother's funeral. When was it? When had it been? It would sure as hell be nice if I had a little help with the chores around here of a Saturday morning, Max Cooper had grumbled. I'm sick and goddamn tired of you getting all tarted up and taking off every goddamn weekend. Dad, she said, I'm the queen, remember? I have to go. I signed an agreement saying that I'd represent Joseph in all the rodeo parades around here. I'm the queen, he mocked, imitating her. 
My aching ass, you're the queen. Like hell you are. You're no more the queen than I am. You cheated. Max, Iona cautioned. Don't you max me. How long are you going to go on letting her believe she's Little Miss Highness? God's gift to everyone. How long? Max. He turned on her then. Diana knew he wouldn't hit her. Not any more. He'd only really come after her once, after George Deason, that goddamn coffee-drinking Jack Mormon, as Max called him, appeared on the scene. It happened early on in the course of Waldo and Diana's training. George was just coming up the outside steps that led to the kitchen to collect his morning coffee and biscuits when all hell broke loose. Diana never remembered what that particular fight was about, and it didn't matter, really. She said something to her father, and Max hit her hard across the mouth with the back of his hand, sending her spinning into the corner of the kitchen. She waited, head down, expecting the next blow, which never came. When she finally dared look, George Deason had a chokehold around her father's collar, holding him at arm's length with a knot of a fist twisted into her father's protruding Adam's apple. "'Don't you ever do that again, Max Cooper, or so help me God, I'll kill you!' George was old enough to be Max's father, and he didn't raise his voice when he said it. But Max went stomping out of the house like a whipped dog, while George calmly sat down to butter his biscuits and drink his coffee. Evidently, Max Cooper took George at his word. He never struck Diana again, not once. Not ever, although he tried the night she came home with her clothes torn to pieces. Later, much later, in the hospital in Legrand, when her mother was dying, Diana had asked Iona about it. Why had her father called her a cheater? Because of George, Iona said. George? What did he do? He bought two hundred dollars worth of rodeo tickets the last day of the contest, Iona said. He gave them away to a bunch of poor kids here in Legrand who couldn't have gone otherwise. He didn't buy them from me, Diana said. She had sold tickets until she was blue in the face, but she didn't remember selling more than one to George Deason. I gave him the tickets and took the money, but they were from your ticket allocation. Even though you didn't sell them yourself, that batch of tickets put you over the top. Remember, there was only a quarter of a point difference between you and Charlene Davis. So Dad was right. Diana said, feeling her one moment of triumph, her rodeo queen victory, slipped through her fingers in retrospect. I did cheat, after all. No, Diana, Iona had said firmly, squeezing her daughter's hand, despite the pain it caused her. You've earned every damn thing you've ever gotten. It was the only time Diana ever remembered hearing her mother use the word damn. As years went by, she was beginning to understand it a little. Her name, not Charlene's, had been the name on the scholarship at the registrar's office at the university in Eugene. Her name, Diana's name, was what it said on the two degrees, one from the University of Oregon, and now a master's from the University of Arizona. She had earned it all, with the timely help of both George Deason and her mother. Lying in bed at her home in Gates Pass, Diana's eyes misted over. What would have happened to her if George Deason hadn't driven into her life, bringing Waldo with him? Where would she be now? Married to some drunken logger in Joseph like Charlene was, or else still living in the house by the garbage dump? Would her life have been worse or better? There was no way to tell. Her grief for George Deason, dead now these four years, spilled over into grief for Waldo, who had broken a leg during her first semester in Eugene and had to be put down. While she was at it, she shed a tear for her mother, and finally a few for herself as well. What if Brandon Walker was right? What if she didn't have guts enough to pull the trigger? What if Andrew Carlyle killed her? What kind of legacy would she leave for her child? 
Still wide awake, she thought of all those boxes sitting in the root cellar, waiting for someone to sort through them, her mother's boxes, and, more than that, her husband's. Whose job was that? Who was the person whose responsibility it was to go through them, to sort the wheat from the chaff, so Davy or someone else wouldn't have to do it later? There were things in those boxes that should be kept and saved for him, and others that should be thrown away and never again see the light of day. It was weeks before she could face returning to Gary's office, weeks before she could approach the desk again with its stilled typewriter and haunting stack of blank paper. She started with the bottom drawer, thinking that would be the least painful, but, of course, she was wrong. Had Gary been smart enough, he would have got rid of it, would have destroyed it, but she found the damning envelope with its University of Arizona return address almost immediately. Curious, she pulled out the sheaf of loose papers and scanned through them, recognizing at once the clumsy effort of one of her own early short stories, the one she had submitted as part of her application to the creative writing program. At first she noticed only the stilted phrases, the graceless prose that flows at tedious length from the minds and hearts of beginning writers, but then her eyes were drawn to the handwritten comment at the end. Gary, it said, your work here is naturally a beginning effort, but it shows a good deal of promise. We'll discuss the possibilities for this manuscript in greater detail once you're enrolled in the program and fully underway. It was signed, A. Carlyle. For a full minute she stared down at the paper, trying to make sense of it all. Then the full weight of Gary's betrayal thundered over her, burying her in a landslide of emotion. Gary had gained admission to Andrew Carlyle's program using her story, not his own. Not that she would have wanted to be in it after all, she thought bitterly, but the rejection had caused her to doubt her own ability, to retreat into teaching, to settle for second best rather than following her own aspirations. Up to that very moment, in spite of everything else, Diana Ladd had grieved for her dead husband. Now she exploded in a raging fit of anger. "'Damn you!' She screamed in fury at Gary Ladd's unconcerned Smith Corona. Damn you! Damn you! Damn you! Having once allowed herself to succumb to anger, it never once left her. It functioned as a whip and a prod, goading her to succeed at writing no matter what obstacles might fall in her path. Diana dropped the papers, scattering them like leaves across the desk and floor. She fled Gary's office and never returned. Only as she left for the hospital to have Davy, with the arrival of the movers barely minutes away, did she give Rita permission to go into Gary's abandoned office and pack up whatever she found there. With the exception of appropriating the typewriter for her own in the intervening years, Diana had never examined any of the boxes, but Rita was nothing if not thorough. Therefore, that purloined short story must still be there, carefully packed away among all of Gary Ladd's other books and papers. That story was one of the things that demanded both attention and destruction, although there were probably plenty of others. Only Diana could tell the difference. It was her job, her responsibility, and nobody else's. Mom? A small voice asked from the doorway. Are you awake yet? I'm awake, Davy. I'm hungry. Are we going to have breakfast? We're still out of tortillas. We're going to have breakfast, she said determinedly, getting out of bed. I'm going to fix it. While Myrna Louise was making breakfast... Andrew Carlyle made a quick survey of her room. He found her extra checkbooks and the savings account book in the bottom of her lingerie drawer, the same place where she'd always kept it, along with a fistful of twenties in hard, cold cash. The balance in both accounts was pitifully small in terms of lifetime savings for someone of her age. It was just as well she wouldn't be around to get much older, Carlyle thought. He was actually doing her a favor. 
Maybe she was planning to land on his doorstep when the time came, expecting her son to support her in her old age. Fat chance. Out in the garage, he eased Jake's partially opened bag of lime into the trunk, careful not to spill any of it on Johnny Rivkin's Hartman bag. Garden-variety lime probably wouldn't be enough to strip all the meat off the bones, but it would help kill the odor. They had breakfast, a cheerful, family-style breakfast. Myrna Louise was careful not to fuss too much. Afterward, while she cleaned up the kitchen, Andrew loaded the car. Lida Gibbons, that nosy old bat from next door, came over to the fence to see what he was doing and to chat for a while. "'Going on a trip?' she asked. He nodded. "'It's been a long time since Mama had a chance to get out of town. We're going to drive up past the Grand Canyon and maybe on up through the canyon country of Utah. That's always been one of my favorite places.' "'Never been there myself,' Lida Gibbons asserted. "'Wouldn't know it from a hole in the ground. I much prefer California.' Andrew started for the car, then paused snapping his fingers as if at a sudden afterthought. "'Say, are you going to be in town for the next week and a half to two weeks?' "'Reckon. Don't have any place to go at the moment. The kids are busy with their own jobs and families. They don't like me dropping in unless I give them plenty of advance warning. <laughs> Why? Would you mind bringing in the mail? And if you see the paper boy, tell him to put us on vacation until we get back. Oh, sure thing. I'll be happy to. I'd appreciate it, Andrew Carlyle told Lida Gibbons with a sincere smile. Living far away, it's been a real blessing for me to know my mother's in a place with such terrific neighbors. Oh, think nothing of it, Lida said. That's what neighbors are for. Myrna Louise was delighted to get in the car and go for a ride someplace, even if it was just an overnight jaunt. Excited as a little kid, she packed a bag and had it waiting by the door for Andrew to load while she did the breakfast dishes. Years ago, not even that long ago, she would have left the dishes sitting in the sink to rot while she went away, but not any more, not in her cozy little house on Weber Drive. What would the neighbors think if they happened to glance in a window and see that she'd left without doing the dishes? She was pleased that Andrew seemed to have forgiven her for burning up his stupid manuscripts. She probably shouldn't have, really. Writing had to be a lot of work, but he seemed totally at ease this morning, whistling to himself as he loaded the car. She watched out the window as he stopped briefly to chat across the fence with Lida Gibbons, the lady from next door. Thank God Andrew was making the effort to be sociable for a change, Myrna Louise thought. And thank God he hadn't done anything to dispel the Phil Horton myth. Lida Gibbons had a son who was a dentist and a daughter who sold real estate out in California somewhere. It was particularly important that Andrew keep up the Phil Horton charade with Lida Gibbons, even if he didn't do it with anybody else. At nine, they headed for Tucson. The heat was incredibly oppressive, and the Valiant had no air conditioning. They drove with the windows open and the wind roaring in their ears. Far to the south and east, thunderclouds edged over the horizon, but they were only teasers, hints of the coming rainy season that would bring blessed relief from some of the heat, but they would bring additional humidity as well. "'Have you made any plans?' Myrna Louise shouted over the noise of the car. It was fine for Andrew to come and visit for a day or two, but she certainly didn't want to be saddled with him on a permanent basis. She was eager to know how soon he'd be moving on. "'I'm looking for a place somewhere around Tucson, someplace I can afford so I can get back to writing.' "'Good,' Myrna Louise breathed. Tucson was both close enough and far enough away. "'I don't like oatmeal.' Davy complained, picking at the cereal in his bowl. "'Not even with brown sugar and raisins?' Diana asked. Davy shrugged. "'They help, I guess. I just like tortillas better. Why don't you fix tortillas?' "'I don't know how.' "'Will Rita make tortillas for us when she gets home today?' 
Diana thought of the huge cast covering Rita's smashed left arm. She won't be doing that for a while, Diana said. At least not until after her arm comes out of the cast. You mean we can't have any until she gets better? That could take a long time. Maybe I could try making some, Diana offered tentatively. I mean, if Rita were here to coach me and tell me what to do. Davy's jaw dropped. Really? You mean you'd learn to make them yourself? I said I'd try. Do you swear? Davy's unbridled enthusiasm was catching. This was the first sign of life Diana had seen in her son for several days. She put her hand over her heart and grinned at him. I swear, she said. Davy helped clear the table, then went to feed the dog, fairly skipping as he did so. He'd been so strangely subdued that it pleased her to see him acting like his old self. It was such a small thing, really, promising to make tortillas, but it signified something else, she realized, something much more important. Promises made meant they would have to be kept, and that implied a future, a future with her in it. Before, she had thought about sorting Gary's and her mother's things as an ending, as a means of putting her house in order in preparation for yet another catastrophe. Now, for the first time, she saw the other side of the coin. It could go either way. She might just as easily be doing it as a beginning, as a way of putting the past behind her, and finally getting on with her life. I'll do the dishes first, she thought. Then I'll get started. It is said that on the third day, Iitoi gave each tribe a basket. When all the women were busy learning how to make baskets, Iitoi saw that it would be good for each one to mark her baskets in a different way so they would know who had made each different basket and what it should be used for. So Iitoi brought the women seed pods from the planting, which the Milgan called Devil's Claw. He showed all the women how to weave the black fiber from the seed pods into their baskets to make a pattern to mark their baskets, and by each pattern the baskets would be known. Now while all the women were working so hard learning to make the baskets, many of the little people were watching as well. The birds especially, watching from a big mesquite tree, were curious about what Iitoi and the women were doing. Finally, Uuhuig, the birds, came down from the tree and stole some of the fiber for making baskets. They flew back to the tree with it and tried to make a basket of their own. But they had not watched Iitoi closely enough, and when their basket was finished, it slipped around and hung upside down on the bottom of the branch. When this happened, the birds began to laugh. Iitoi heard them laughing and came to see what was so funny. When he saw what they had done, Iitoi was very pleased. He told the birds that they might make baskets for themselves. He said they should call their baskets nests and use them for homes. And that is why, my friend, the Uuhuig, the birds, make nests even to this day. And all this happened on the third day. Diana had barely moved the first stack of boxes out of the root cellar and into the kitchen when the phone rang. She looked at it warily, afraid of who might be calling. Her number was unlisted, but there were probably ways to get unlisted numbers if you knew how to go about it. Hello, she said. Diana, lad? questioned a strange male voice. Who's calling, please? she asked while her heart hammered in her throat and her knees wobbled. "'My name is Father John. I'm the associate priest, semi-retired, actually, out at San Xavier Mission on the reservation. Is Diana Ladd there? I need to speak to her.' "'The priest? She didn't know any priests, not any at all. Why would a strange priest be calling her? Was this a trick? Was it Andrew Carlyle pretending to be a priest? She wouldn't put it past him. This is Diana, she said at last. Good. I'm sure this is all going to sound very strange. 
the man continued. "'But I was wondering if it would be possible for me to stop by and pay you a visit.' "'Pay a visit? At the house? Did he know where she lived?' "'Why?' she asked. "'We have a mutual friend,' he said mysteriously. "'Rita Antone, the lady who lives with you.' "'Funny,' Diana returned. "'I don't recall her ever mentioning your name. "'I'm not surprised. "'We had a falling out years ago. "'I'm just now getting round to mending fences. "'Look,' Diana said impatiently, "'Rita isn't here. "'If you want to talk to her when she gets back, "'it's you I need to talk to, Mrs. Ladd,' the priest interrupted. "'It's about Rita, but I don't need to see her.' In fact, it would probably be better if I didn't. I saw her in the hospital yesterday. I'm afraid my visit upset her. He sounded priestly. The inflections were right, the tone of voice, the attitude. Father, Diana said, I'm very busy right now. Couldn't this wait a few days? It's a matter of life and death, he insisted. I must see you today. Where? I could come there. No, she said at once. Absolutely not. She wasn't dumb enough to invite a strange man into her home. I could come out to the mission, I suppose, she suggested. If the caller had been Andrew Carlyle posing as a priest, that would have been the end of it. Instead, he agreed readily. Good, he said. But would you please not bring the boy? I have to bring him. "'Diana told him. "'Rita is my only sitter. "'She isn't here.' "'Well,' he said, "'all right, then, "'but I must speak to you in private. "'Perhaps the boy can go over to the convent "'and visit for a little while. "'One of the nuns over there, "'Sister Catherine, is particularly good with children. "'I'm sure she would be happy to watch him for us "'if I ask her to. "'How soon can I expect you?' By the time we get cleaned up and ready to go, it'll probably be around an hour. Fine, he said. I'll be waiting in my office, which is just behind the bookstore. Ask anyone, and they'll direct you. Diana hung up the phone. So, Father John wasn't a fake, but why would a former friend of Rita's want to talk to Diana? That was more than she could understand. She went to the back door. Davy was swinging high on the metal swing set his grandparents from Chicago had sent as his previous year's Christmas present. On her own, Diana never could have spent that much money on a single toy. "'Come on, Davy,' she called. "'You have to come in now and get cleaned up.' "'How come? Me and Bone are playing.' "'Bone and I,' she corrected firmly. "'Come on, we have to go to church.' He came to the door, frowning and sulking. "'To church? I didn't know this was Sunday,' he said. "'Now why do we have to go anyway? Rita goes to church. You never do.' "'Today is an exception,' she said. "'And it's Monday, not Sunday, so wipe that frown off your face and let's get going. If you're lucky, maybe somebody out there will be selling popovers.' "'Popovers?' he asked, brightening. His mother might as well have waved a magic wand. That's right. We're going to San Xavier. There are usually ladies selling popovers in the parking lot. The very mention of popovers put Davy in high gear. Tortillas and popovers, beans and chili. He much preferred Indian food to Anglo. Maybe she would have to break down and learn to cook Indian food after all. And not just tortillas, either. Chapter 17 They say this happened long ago. Cottontail was sitting next to a tall cliff when Bon, Coyote, saw him sitting there. Coyote was very hungry. Brother, he said to Cottontail, I am going to eat you up. Oh, no, said Cottontail. This you must not do, for I am holding up this cliff. If you eat me up, it will fall down and crush us both. Coyote looked up at the tall cliff, and he was afraid that Cottontail was right. Come over here, Coyote, said Cottontail. You stand here and lean against the cliff. You hold it up while I go around to the back of the mountain, 
and find a big stick to help hold it up. All right, said Coyote, and that's just what happened. He came over and stood beside Cottontail to help hold up the cliff. As soon as Coyote was standing there, Cottontail ran off somewhere. Coyote stood there for a long, long time, leaning against the cliff, holding it. He waited and waited, but Cottontail didn't come back. Finally, Coyote got tired of just standing there. He thought that if he ran very fast, perhaps he could get out of the way before the cliff could fall on him. So Coyote let go of the cliff and ran as fast as he could. But when he let go, the cliff didn't fall down after all. That was when Coyote knew Cottontail had tricked him. This made Coyote very angry. "'I will follow Cottontail's trail,' he said. "'The next time I see him, I will eat him up.' And that, Nawaj, is the story of the first time Cottontail tricked Coyote. They stopped in front of an old two-story house along Speedway. "'What's this?' Myrna Louise asked. Andrew reached in his pocket and pulled out an envelope. "'Run this inside for me,' he said. "'They'll give you another envelope.' "'But what is this place?' she asked again. "'It's a rental agency,' he said. "'They're helping me find a place to live. I'll wait here in the car. Give them this and tell them your name.' But Myrna Louise started to say that she was a lot older than he was, and if anyone was going to sit in the car, it ought to be her. But it didn't seem worth starting an argument when the day was going so well. She got out of the car. Inside, behind a counter, a young woman was busy talking on the phone. Myrna Louise grew impatient standing there, because the receptionist was only talking to her boyfriend. While waiting, she looked around. Nothing indicated that this was a real estate office. Shouldn't there have been signs, something that said what kinds of properties they rented? Finally, the young woman hung up. "'May I help you?' she asked. Wordlessly, Myrna Louise handed over the envelope. The receptionist opened it, removing a blank sheet of paper that had been wrapped around a small stack of bills. She counted them out one at a time. "'And... "'What is your name?' she asked, when she'd finished counting out one hundred fifty dollars. "'Myrna Louise Spaulding, but it's probably under my son's name, which is—' "'Here it is,' the young woman interrupted, taking another envelope from a drawer. Myrna Louise was surprised to see her name, not Andrew's, neatly typed on the envelope. So he really had intended for her to pick it up. "'Was that a deposit?' she asked, trying to make sense of the transaction. The young woman laughed. <laughs> well, you could call it that. Well, shouldn't you give me a receipt or something? No, the receptionist replied. That's not the way we do business around here. Rebuffed, Myrna Louise took the envelope and went back to the car. Andrew looked decidedly unhappy. What took so long? he demanded. I was afraid something had gone wrong. She was on the phone, Myrna Louise said. Andrew reached out to take the envelope, but his mother placed it in her lap, letting both hands rest on it. Something was wrong with that place, she thought. They didn't give me a receipt, she said. Andrew laughed. <laughs> That's all right. I won't need one. How could Andrew afford to throw away a whole one hundred fifty dollars in cash like that and not even get a receipt? Myrna Louise wondered. She had rented houses and apartments before, and she always got a receipt, especially when she paid cash. Why wouldn't Andrew insist on one, unless he had lied to her, and the money was for something else entirely, not for a rental at all? Suspicion, born of years of being lied to, made her hands itch with curiosity about what was in that envelope. She wished she had opened it for a peek before she ever came back out to the car. "'Where are we going now?' she asked. "'To the storage unit. I want a few things from there.' "'Couldn't we stop and get something to drink first? she asked. "'I'm thirsty.' Andrew sighed. "'I suppose. What do you want?' A root-beer float would be nice. The Dairy Queen isn't far. 
They stopped at a Dairy Queen, and Andrew went inside, where several people were already in line ahead of him. Cautiously, keeping the dashboard between his sightline and her hands, Myrna Louise slipped a bony finger along the flap of the envelope. It came loose, tearing only a little along one edge. Inside were two pieces of paper. She scanned through them in growing confusion. There was nothing at all about renting a house. She found herself reading some kind of police report about an auto accident. Finally, she noticed the names, Rita Antone and Diana Ladd and someone else named David. The names of those two women were branded into Myrna Louise's memory. David had to be Diana's son, her baby. Why had Andrew paid so much money to have something about them? You'd think he'd want to forget all about them. Hastily, she stuffed the papers back in the envelope and licked the flap. After a lifetime's worth of snooping, she knew there would be enough glue left to make the flap stick fairly well. By the time Andrew returned to the car, the envelope was once more lying innocently in her lap. He brought the root beer to the window on her side of the car. Here, he said, holding out his hand to take the envelope. Let me have that before you spill something on it. Reluctantly, Myrna Louise handed it over. She worried that he would notice the frayed flap, but he stuffed it in his shirt pocket without even glancing at it. Myrna Louise drank her root beer float with her mind in a turmoil, still trying to understand. Andrew was up to something, but what? He'd paid good money for those two pieces of paper, more than he should have. But why? To get their addresses, said a tiny voice at the back of her mind. To find out where they live? Why? Why would Andrew be interested in knowing that? For an answer, she heard only the nightmarish sound of a long-ago neighbor's cat screaming and dying. Brandon Walker woke up late and got ready to go to work. The house was empty. His mother had spent the night at the hospital. He had offered to bring her home, but again Luella refused. She would stay there as long as it took, she told him. He wondered how long that would be. At the office his clerk shook her head as he walked in the door. "'Oh, you're in real hot water this time,' she said. The big guy wants to see you. The big guy was Sheriff Jack Duchesne himself. If one of the shadows received a curt summons to the sheriff's private office, it probably wouldn't be for a pleasant early morning social chat or a hit from the bottle of wild turkey from the sheriff's private stash. On my way, Brandon said, turning away. How's your dad? the clerk asked. Hanging in there, he responded. But that's about all. Sheriff Duchesne sat with an open newspaper spread out on his desk. "'Well, this is a hell of a note,' he said, glancing up as his secretary escorted Brandon Walker into the room. He pointed to the upper left-hand corner of the page. "'You realize, of course, that this makes us all sound like a bunch of stupid jackasses?' "'Sorry,' Brandon said. "'I haven't seen a paper yet this morning.' Nonetheless, he had a pretty good idea about the contents of that offending article— he was sure it reported Toby Walker's unauthorized use of a police vehicle. "'You in a habit of letting your whole goddamn family use county cars whenever the damn well please?' "'It never happened before,' Brandon began. "'I had no idea my father would take the keys off the—' "'I don't give a good goddamn how it happened, but let me tell you this. "'If it ever does again, you're out of here, Walker. "'We don't need this kind of shit. Can't afford it. "'Lucky for you, the car wasn't damaged. "'You'd be on administrative leave as of right now, "'so keep your damn car keys in your damn pockets, you hear?' Brandon had seen news clips of Duchesne out in public, charming both the media and his constituents. He wondered if those people knew that, on his own turf, Duchesne was incapable of speech, free of profanity. The detective waited to see if there was anything else. Duchesne didn't exactly dismiss him, but he turned back to the newspaper as though Walker had already left the room. The younger man stood there, wavering, wondering if he shouldn't let Duchesne know of the possible problem brewing over Andrew Carlyle. Well, the sheriff said, what are you waiting for? Nothing, Brandon replied, deciding. Nothing at all. 
If Duchesne didn't even have the good grace to ask how Toby Walker was doing, why the hell should Brandon tell him anything? After all, it wasn't his case, not officially. Sister Catherine met them in the office when Diana and Davy arrived at St. Xavier. The nun, taking Davy under her wing with a promise of popovers, left at once. Diana was shown into a sparsely furnished office. She sat down on a rickety visitor chair facing a spare, balding old man who introduced himself as Father John. "'I hope my telephone call didn't alarm you, Mrs. Ladd,' he said. "'But I wanted you to understand that I consider this a matter of utmost importance.' "'About Rita?' Diana asked. He nodded. "'You see, her nephew and another man, a medicine man called Looks at Nothing, came to see me yesterday.' "'They came to see you, too?' she asked in some surprise. "'I knew they had spoken to Brandon Walker, but why you?' Father John seemed taken aback. "'You mean they discussed this situation with somebody else?' Diana nodded. "'With a detective at the Pima County Sheriff's Department. He came to the house last night and told me.' Father John folded his hands in front of him, thoughtfully touching his fingers to his lips. "'How very odd,' he said. "'Why would a detective have any interest in Davy being baptized?' Now it was Diana's turn to be puzzled. Davy? Baptized? What are you talking about? About the accident, Rita's accident. What does that have to do with Davy? Diana asked. And what does his being baptized have to do with anything? How long have you been here on the reservation? He asked. Since sixty-seven. Doing what? Teaching. "'Have you made any kind of study of the Papago belief system?' the priest asked. "'I'm a schoolteacher, Father John, a public schoolteacher. I don't interfere in my students' spiritual lives, and they don't fool around in mine.' "'That may be where you're wrong, Mrs. Ladd,' the priest said quietly. "'It's my understanding that you were raised in the Catholic Church, but that you've moved away from it as an adult.' Really, I don't see what that has to do— Please, Mrs. Ladd, hear me out. It is true, isn't it? Yes, she answered reluctantly. My husband was a Lutheran, for one thing, but there were other considerations as well. Your husband is dead, he pointed out. I'm well aware of that, Father, but I haven't changed my mind about the other things. I see, he said, nodding. "'What do you see?' Diana didn't try to conceal her growing impatience. "'You still haven't told me what this is about.' "'As I said earlier, it's about dancing quail. Who? Excuse me. About Rita. You know her as Rita Antone. Dancing quail was her name when she was much younger, when I first knew her. She was still a child then, not many years older than your own boy.' But to get back to what I was saying about Papago beliefs, these are people with a strong spiritual heritage, you know. They have accepted much the whites have to offer, while at the same time keeping much of their own. The reverse hasn't always been true. Meaning? Meaning we Anglos haven't always been smart enough to learn from them. As a race, we've been very pig-headed all caught up in teaching others, but not bothering to learn from our students. It's a problem I've been trying to rectify in my old age. For instance, I've learned something about Indian beliefs concerning illness and shamanism. In his youth, Rita's friend looks at nothing, that blind medicine man, probably was a victim of what the Indians call whore sickness which results from giving way to the temptations of your dreams. Eye troubles in general, and blindness in particular, are considered to be the natural consequences of succumbing to whore sickness. Looks at nothing could see as a child, but after he lost his sight in early adulthood, he went on to become a well-respected medicine man. Whore sickness? Diana repeated dubiously. Do you really believe that? Maybe I don't, not entirely, 
but the papagos do, and that's the point. There's tremendous power in belief, especially in ancient beliefs, and that's what we're dealing with as far as Davy is concerned, ancient beliefs. Looks at nothing is convinced that Rita's accident occurred because she lives in close proximity to an unbaptized baby. As such, your son is a danger to her, and will continue to be so until something is done to fix the problem. This is outrageous, Diana grumbled. It sounds like some kind of trick to trap me into coming back to church. Believe me, young lady, it's no trick. My concern is far more straightforward than that. In addition to the accident which has already happened, Rita is evidently suffering from what the Indians call forebodings. These pose an additional danger, a threat not only to Rita, but to Davy and yourself as well. So what are you saying? Would you have any objections to your child being brought up in the church? She shrugged. I never thought about it that much one way or the other. Mrs. Ladd, what I'd like to propose is this. Allow me to come give the boy some religious instruction. At his age he ought to have some say in the matter. Once he's baptized, we can work together to solve the catechism problem and prepare him for his first communion. Diana Ladd remained unconvinced. This is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Father John sat forward and hunched his meager frame over the desk. Mrs. Ladd, he said earnestly, I have been a priest in the Catholic Church for over fifty years. Priests are expected to live celibate, godly lives, and for most of my career that has been true. But once, very early on, I made a terrible mistake. I fell in love with a beautiful young woman. I almost quit the priesthood to marry her. But an older priest, my superior, took matters into his own hands. He shipped her far away. Years later I finally realized that I had a rival for her affections, a man of her own people. When she was sent away, not only did I lose her, so did he. But well, this is all very interesting, but I don't see— Father John held up his hand, silencing her. No, wait, let me finish. Afterward, the other man, the rival, swore that he and I were enemies. I always believed that would be true until our dying day. But yesterday he came to see me here at San Xavier. We smoked the peace smoke, and he asked me for my help. The blind medicine man? Diana asked, finally beginning to grasp the situation. Father John nodded. Believe me, he said, looks at nothing, never would have come to me for help unless he believed dancing quail to be in mortal danger. Naturally, I agreed to do whatever I could. The old priest fell suddenly silent. He turned away from her and sat gazing up at the rough saguaro rib crucifix hanging on the wall behind his desk. He averted his gaze, but not before Diana detected a tell-tale trace of moisture on his weathered cheek. She could only guess what telling that story had cost him, but she knew it wasn't an empty ploy. He had told her only as a last resort. Now she sat quietly, trying to assimilate it all, and understand exactly how it applied to her and to her situation. First, and by far most important, was the fact that Father John, right along with everyone else, believed that Rita and she were in danger. On that score, Diana and the priest were in complete agreement, although she had difficulty accepting the idea that Davy's being unbaptized was somehow the cause of it all. Diana's first choice of weapon to deal with the problem was a fully loaded forty-five peacemaker, but maybe a gun wasn't the only weapon she should consider using. Diana Ladd wasn't prepared to ignore anything that might prove helpful. "'When would you like to come speak to Davy?' she asked finally. Father John's shoulders sagged with relief. He wiped his eyes, said a brief prayer of thanksgiving— 
and then crossed himself before turning back to face her. "'Today?' he asked. "'Would later on this afternoon be all right?' Committed to action, she saw no point in delay. "'Yes,' she said. "'That'll be fine. I'll give you the address.' As soon as they tried to leave the Dairy Queen, things started going wrong. The Valiant wouldn't start. The battery was dead. In a huff, Andrew Carlyle stalked around the parking lot, looking for someone with jumper cables. Then, as they drove toward the storage unit, Myrna Louise began chattering away in her typically inane manner. "'Do you ever think about them?' she asked. "'Think about whom?' about those women, the ones from the reservation. There had been times in his life when Andrew Carlyle could have sworn that his mother could read his mind. Part of her ability to do that, he discovered much later, had been related to her secretly devouring daily installments of his diary. He wondered now about the envelope in his pocket. Had she looked at the contents? If so, had she somehow guessed his intentions? He hadn't really examined the envelope when he took it from her. It had seemed all right at first glance, but he couldn't very well drag it out now and check it again in the middle of traffic. No, he said eventually. They're in the past, and the past is over and done with. I've got my future to think about. I wonder what kind of a baby she had, a boy or a girl. For Christ's sake, Mama, what does it matter? he demanded his voice rising, despite his intentions of staying calm and collected, of not letting her provoke him. "'Do we have to talk about this?' "'Don't yell at me, Andrew. I was only wondering. Maybe I wouldn't be so curious if I'd ever had any grandchildren of my own, you know.' "'Well, you didn't,' he thought savagely. "'And you're not ever going to either by the time I get through with you.' "'Give it a rest, Mama," he said. I always told you I wasn't the marrying kind. You should have been. You're a smart man, Andrew, and smart men should father lots of babies. It's our only hope, you know. Civilization's only hope. It was an old, old argument, one they'd had countless times before. But this time, under pressure, anxious to get on with the tasks at hand, and worrying about whether or not the Valiant would keep on running, it was too much. "'Jesus Christ, Mama, would you please just shut up about that?' About that time they arrived at the You Store It Here lot. There Andrew Carlyle encountered the straw that broke the camel's back. The gate was locked, closed and locked. Afraid to turn off the ignition, he put the Valiant in neutral, set the emergency brake, and left it running. He swore a blue streak as he headed for the small, converted RV that served as an office. The door was latched with a metal padlock and bore a hand-lettered sign that said, Back in fifteen minutes. Frustrated and fuming, he headed back toward the car. He turned just in time to see the Valiant lurch forward and knock down the gate. For a second he thought the emergency brake must have slipped, but then, in a cloud of dust, the Valiant roared into reverse. Myrna Louise was definitely at the wheel. Mama! Carlyle yelled. Stop! Instead, the Valiant charged out of the driveway and shot all the way across the street, smashing into a rubber dumpster before coming to a stop. Carlyle took off after the Valiant at a dead run. He almost caught it, too, but as he reached for the door handle, the car blasted forward and careened drunkenly away, leaving him in a cloud of dust. As the car swerved crazily down the flat two-lane roadway, Myrna Louise clipped a brown El Camino on one side of the street and a second dumpster on the other. Neither one was enough to stop her. In fact, they barely slowed her down. It was the last straw for Myrna Louise as well. Not the locked gate. She didn't care at all about that. But having Andrew yell and curse at her and tell her to shut up, that was just too much. It was supposed to be a fun trip for her, a vacation, he had told her. But this wasn't fun at all. As soon as they started having car trouble, he grew more and more surly and upset. She knew from personal experience that Andrew had a vile, mean temper. 
Myrna Louise didn't want it turned on her, and if he was already angry with her, what would happen if he ever figured out she had looked at those two precious $150 pieces of paper? When he got out of the car to go to the storage unit office, Myrna Louise was still smarting. How dare he talk to her that way? No matter how old they were, children shouldn't tell their parents to shut up. How could he show her so little respect? She deserved better than that. After all, how many other mothers would have opened their homes and their arms to a son when he came dragging home from doing a stretch in prison? She gave herself high marks for being loyal and broad-minded both, for not holding a grudge, although God knows she should have. Myrna Louise saw Andrew turn away from the door, shaking his head in disgust, with his mouth twisted into an angry grimace. He was coming back to the car, madder than ever. Seeing him like that scared her, and that's when she decided not to wait. The keys were there, the engine already running. So what if she didn't know how to drive a car? She'd been riding in them for sixty years. She'd seen other people do it, hadn't she? Sliding across the bench seat, she peered nearsightedly down at the gear shift and read the letters P-R-N-D-L. The car was stopped, and the needle pointed to P. That probably meant park, she theorized. R would mean reverse, D drive, and L low. Maybe she should start out in that, low. Cautiously, she moved the gear shift to L, and then put a tentative foot on the gas. The engine raced. The car rocked in place, but it didn't move forward. Something was wrong. Then she remembered. The emergency brake. Jake had always talked about the importance of using the emergency brake. Without letting up on the gas, she released the handbrake. At once the Valiant crashed forward into the gate, breaking the lock, knocking the gate itself loose from its hinges. She glanced in Andrew's direction. The noise had alerted him, and he was coming after her, running hard. Frightened now, desperate to get away, she shoved the gear shift to R and found herself backing up at a terrifying speed. She tried turning the steering wheel, but the car went in exactly the opposite direction of what she intended. She heard, rather than saw the dumpster crumple under the weight of the Valiant's rear bumper. Andrew vaulted forward. Almost at the car, he reached out to grasp the door handle. Myrna Louise had never before seen such looks of unmasked fury distorting her son's face. What would he do to her if he caught her? Not waiting to find out, she shoved the gear shift needle over to D. D for drive. D for disappear. Hit the gas pedal and took off. She never looked back. Slowing but not stopping at the intersection, she made it into traffic on Alvernon only because three other alert drivers managed to dodge out of her way. It served Andrew right, Myrna Louise thought, gripping the steering wheel for all she was worth and seesawing it back and forth. Sons should never talk to their mothers that way, no matter what. Fat Crack arrived at the hospital in cells and found Rita sitting in a wheelchair on the front sidewalk. "'Are you ready to go?' he asked. She nodded. "'I didn't like it in there. I didn't want to wait inside.' Actually, knowing his aunt's opinion about Milgon doctors, Fat Crack was surprised she had stayed put in the hospital for as long as she had. His mother had told him that ever since returning from California, Rita had adamantly refused to visit an Anglo doctor for any reason. She would have done the same thing after the accident, too, but arriving unconscious by ambulance made refusing admission impossible. Fat Crack helped his aunt into the truck. She winced at the high step necessitated by the tow truck's running board. "'How are you?' he asked. "'All right. But the cast is heavy, and my arm aches. I'll try not to hit too many bumps, Fat Crack told her. We have to stop in Crow Hang to see about the singers. Are you sure you want to start with that tonight? Wouldn't it be better to wait until you've rested some more? No, Rita said. Tonight will be fine. At Hawani Nagyak, Crowhang Village. The fat crack left Rita in the truck while he went to negotiate with the singers. 
Rita leaned her head back against the cab window and closed her eyes. She felt weak and tired. She hadn't felt this weak since that long-ago time in California when she got so sick. Late that September morning, when she jumped off the freight train in Redlands, she asked directions and walked the eight miles out of town to the Bailey Orange Farm. She didn't know what else to do. Telling everyone she was going to meet her brother was fine as far as it went, but the truth was she didn't have a brother. Gordon Antone was Louise's brother. He didn't know dancing quail at all. Still, he was someone with a name, someone who would speak her language, and maybe, if she asked him, he really would help her find a job. The sun was going down when she finally found her way to the right ranch. The people she saw working there were mostly Mexicans. When she tried asking them about Gordon Antone, they didn't understand either English or Papago. Almost ready to give up, she tried speaking English to a young, mill-gone child. As soon as she asked about an Indian, he grinned and nodded. Sure, he said. You must mean the chief. He's working at the tool shed. He pointed off toward a small outbuilding. Over there. Dancing Quail found Gordon Antone bent over a file, sharpening the edge of a hoe. He looked up as she stepped into the doorway, blocking out the sunlight and turning the place into dusty gloom. "'Are you the one they call Chief?' she asked, speaking softly in Papago. "'You,' he replied. "'Yes.' Gordon Antone put down the hoe and file. The figure silhouetted in the doorway was that of a young male, but the voice definitely belonged to a female. "'Who are you?' he asked. "'A friend of your sister's, of Louisa's. She said if I came here you might help me find a job.' "'You know Louisa. But she's in Phoenix. How did you get here?' "'On the train,' Rita replied simply. "'Last night I ran away.' "'You came all that way alone from Phoenix?' I rode the freight train with some others. Gordon got up and walked over to the doorway so he could see her better. What is your name? My people call me Dancing Quail, but the mill gun call me Rita. Rita Antone. Your name is the same as mine. Now that she was here, talking to Gordon, she could tell he was someone who was easy to talk to. Just being with him made her feel much better. His saying that made her laugh. Yes, she said, we share the same name. I told the men on the train that you were my brother. With her hair cut short, dressed in boys' clothing, and grimy from travel, Dancing Quail was still a very beautiful young woman. For Gordon Antone, far from home and missing his family and friends, the real miracle was finding another person who spoke his own language. That made her more than beautiful. "'Not your brother,' Gordon Antone said. "'But I will be glad to be your friend.' At least Andrew Carlyle didn't lose his head. He was furious with Myrna Louise, outraged was more like it, but he had sense enough to melt into the background before all hell broke loose. The owner of the El Camino charged out of an apartment across the street and looked up and down the road in both directions, but by then Myrna Louise had disappeared around the corner. When the U Store It Here manager showed up a few minutes later, cops were already on the scene taking their reports. Carlyle chose that momentary confusion to reappear, walk past everyone, and head for his locker. Despite the stifling heat, he went inside his unit and closed the door. He had to think, to plan. By now he had opened the envelope and suspected that Myrna Louise had also opened it. Damn her straight to hell. So what the fuck was she thinking when she grabbed the car and took off like that, he wondered. Would she turn him in? No, that didn't seem likely. Would she know what he was up to? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. That was a tough call. After all, she was his mother, and mothers often refuse to believe bad things about their precious darlings, no matter how convincing the evidence. No, she probably wouldn't turn him in, but would she try to stop him? 
Damn her, she had already done that just by taking the car. What the hell was he supposed to do now? Did she think he'd just give up? Not bloody likely. Go after her and get the car. How could he? For one thing, where would she go? Home, probably, if she could make it that far. He doubted it. The valiant seemed to be pretty much on its last legs. Actually, the more he thought about it, the more he decided it was just as well Jake Spaulding's car was gone. He'd have to get a new one, and that might be inconvenient at the moment, but for what he was planning, he couldn't risk using an undependable vehicle. No, what he needed was a new car. Not necessarily brand new, but certainly different. Reliable transportation, as they say in car dealers' parlance. Once he had another vehicle, he'd figure out some way to make his plan work anyhow, not only for Diana Ladd, but also for Myrna Louise. As of now, she was on his list twice over. It pissed him off that she'd got away clean like that. But he'd get even for that, eventually. His main problem now was one of time. How long before she would open the trunk and discover what was in it? If she did that, maybe she'd turn him in after all. He'd have to move forward, probably a whole lot faster than planned. Standing there, waffling back and forth, he was startled by a knock on the door. His heart went to his throat. Damn! The gun was still in the car along with Myrna Louise. Yes, he called. Police, a voice answered. His hands trembled as he went to open the door. As soon as he did so, he shoved his hands in his pockets. The two uniformed cops he had seen earlier stood outside, both holding clipboards. Carlyle concentrated on keeping his voice neutral and calm. "'What seems to be the trouble, officer?' "'We're investigating the broken gate,' one of them said. "'A car smashed through it. Next it took off and bashed the El Camino across the street. You came not long after that. Do you happen to see anything out of the ordinary?' Carlyle shook his head. "'Nope,' he said. I didn't see a thing. The cops apologized for disturbing him and left. It took a while for his breathing to settle back down, to get his mind back to the problem at hand. First and foremost, he thought, he had to have another car. Focused on solving that one problem, he prepared to leave his storeroom. But first he rummaged around until he found the bulky box that contained not only his first draft of Savage— but Garrison Ladd's manuscript as well. It was a good thing that hot-shot detective had never found either one. Carrying the box, he locked the door and walked toward the street. The cops waved to him as he passed, but that was all. They didn't really notice him, and he was careful to do nothing that would attract their attention. In his search for Andrew Carlyle's mother, Detective Farrell had struck out completely. The apartment complex in Peoria, where Myrna Louise Taylor had been living at the time of her son's trial, was such a transient place that it turned out to be a total dead end. She had evidently moved on from there more than three years earlier. The manager had been on duty for only six months. The complex's group memory didn't stretch back any further than that. Stymied and discouraged, Farrell trudged back to his car, where the steering wheel, door handles, and seats were all too hot to touch. He turned on the car's air conditioning full blast, but it made very little headway. Gingerly fingering the controls on his radio, he called in to check for messages. There were several, but the only one he paid any attention to was from Ron Mallory. The assistant superintendent at the Arizona State Prison was anxious to keep his cushy job. He was doing everything possible to cooperate with Farrell's investigation. Instead of heading straight out of town, Farrell drove to Metro Center, the nearest air-conditioned mall, and went inside to use a payphone. "'What's up?' he asked when he finally had Ron Mallory on the line. "'I've got a name for you,' Mallory said. I had to ask more than once, but when I finally got his attention, Carlyle's ex-cellmate came up with his mother's new last name, Spaulding. It was something else before that. She remarried a year or two ago. Anything else besides last name? Location, maybe? Husband's first name? Sorry. The last name was all I could dredge out of this guy. I was lucky to get that much. You're right. 
Farrell agreed. It is progress. Can't expect the whole case to be handed to me on a silver platter. Myrna Louise made it home in one piece. That in itself was no small miracle. She got the hang of steering fairly well, although she tended to run over curbs going around corners. Her worst problem was keeping steady enough pressure on the gas pedal. She constantly sped up and slowed down. For the last sixty miles, she held her breath for fear of running out of gas. She didn't dare go to a gas station and turn off the motor. What if she couldn't get it started again? All she could think of was how much she wanted to be home, safe in her own little house. If God got her home all in one piece, she promised, she'd never ask him to do anything for her again. Chapter 18 As Diana and Davy returned home from San Xavier, Fat Crack's tow truck was parking in the front drive. Diana was momentarily concerned about the presence of a strange vehicle, but Davy was ecstatic when he caught sight of Rita. He was ready to leap from the car well before it stopped. "'Be very gentle with her, Davy,' Diana cautioned. "'She had surgery, you know. She has stitches, too. "'On her head?' "'No, on her tummy.' "'I'll be careful,' Davy promised, scurrying toward the truck. Reaching the door, just as Fat Crack handed Rita down, Davy stopped short, daunted at first by the huge Indian's presence. Then, remembering who the man was, he stepped forward. Hi, he said shyly to Fat Crack. Davy's first instinct was to throw himself at Rita, but remembering his mother's warning, he hung back until Rita raised her good arm and beckoned him to her. He hugged her gingerly around the waist while she patted the top of his head. The gesture activated his on switch. With a grin, he jumped away from her and pointed to the shaved spot on his head. "'See my stitches?' he boasted. "'How many do you have? Can I see them?' Rita smiled and shook her head. "'No, you can't see them, and neither can I. I'm too fat.' She laughed, and so did Fat Crack. During this exchange, Fat Crack pulled several loaded hospital-issue plastic bags from the truck. "'I'll take these inside,' he said. The Fat Crack went on ahead. Rita limped after him, with Davy holding tightly to her good hand. Diana waited at the front door, holding it open. "'Welcome home,' she said. "'Thank you.' There was a strange formality between the two women, as though neither knew quite how to behave in the presence of Rita's blood kin. "'Do you want him to take your things out back?' Diana asked. Rita nodded. "'I'll go, too. I want to rest.' Davy started to follow her, but Diana called him back. "'You and the dog go outside and play,' she said. "'Rita's tired.' His face fell in disappointment, but Rita came to Davy's rescue. "'It's okay. They can both come along. I missed them.' Despite Duchesne's ass-chewing, Brandon still hung around the office. He wanted to be there in case his mother called, and he didn't want to miss any messages from Jeet Farrell. He took the time to read the Arizona Sun cover to cover, including both the brief account of Toby Walker's ill-fated joyriding incident and the much longer front-page article about the brutal stabbing of Johnny Rivkin, a well-known Hollywood costume designer, knifed to death in his downtown Tucson hotel room. Brandon read about the bloody Santa Rita murder with a professional's interest in what was going on to see what his competition at Tucson PD was doing on the case. He routinely read about homicides committed in the city in case something in the killer's M.O. coincided with one of his unsolved county cases. In this instance, nothing rang a bell. Several times he was tempted to call Diana Ladd to check on how she was doing, but each time he reconsidered. He'd been summarily thrown out of the woman's house both times he'd been there. She wasn't exactly keeping the welcome mat out for him. Brandon Walker knew he was a dog for punishment, but Diana Ladd dished out more abuse than even he was willing to take. Every time he thought about that exasperating woman, he shook his head. 
He wanted so much to make her see reason, to help her understand the error of her ways. It was crazy for her to hole up in that isolated fortress of hers and wait for disaster to strike. Supposing her idea did work. Supposing Andrew Carlyle showed up, and she somehow managed to blow him away. What would happen then? Maybe Carlyle would be dead, but so might she. Whatever the outcome, Walker was convinced an armed confrontation would irreparably harm Davy. Diana didn't realize that her son was a fragile child, Brandon decided. Women always thought their male offspring tougher than they were in actual fact. Davy needed something from his mother, something he wasn't getting. Brandon couldn't tell quite what it was, but he sat there thinking about it, wishing he could help. Gradually, as time passed, a plan began to form in his mind. He would help, after all, whether or not Diana Ladd wanted him to, whether or not she even knew it. As soon as Brandon got off work that afternoon, he would take the county car home, borrow his mother's, stop by the hospital long enough to check on his parents, and then head out for Gates Pass. He'd lie in wait outside Diana's house all night long if necessary. If Andrew Carlyle actually showed up out there, he'd run up against something he didn't expect, an armed cop, rather than some wild-eyed Latter-day Annie Oakley packing a loaded forty-five. In fact, the more Brandon Walker thought about the idea, the better he liked it. As a cop, he had behaved responsibly in doing what he could to talk Diana Ladd out of her foolhardy scheme. But since she was too hard-headed to give up, Walker would use her as a magnet to draw Andrew Carlyle to him. Diana might be the tender morsel necessary to lure Carlyle into the snare, but Brandon Walker would be the steel-jawed trap. Diana went into the kitchen to fix herself a glass of iced tea. The one dusty box she had carried in from the root cellar still sat on the kitchen table. Diana looked at the box and sighed. "'There's no time like the present,' she said aloud, quoting one of Iona's old maxims. Squaring her shoulders, she found a butcher knife and attacked the aging layers of duct tape that sealed the box shut. The labeling may have been done by Francine, her stepmother, but the profligate use of duct tape was Max's specialty. Diana remembered the stack of boxes he had brought down to the car on the morning she left for school in Eugene. Some of the other girls in her class had got real cedar chests for high school graduation. Hope chests, they called them. When Max came with the boxes, Diana had no idea what they were. "'Those aren't mine,' she said. "'I can't take all that stuff.' "'Your mother says you're taking it,' Max said sourly. She left, taking the boxes with her. It wasn't until she was unpacking in her tiny apartment over the garage that she discovered Iona had made a hope chest for her, too, one in cardboard, not cedar, but with hand-embroidered tea towels and napkins, crocheted doilies and tablecloths a brand-new service-for-four set of Safeway coupon Melmac dishes, and a heavy hand-pieced quilt. There were a few pots and pans, some cheap silverware, and a brand-new percolator. Opening each box was an adventure, a reprise of a dozen Christmas mornings. Cloth goods were neatly ironed and folded, the edges crisp and straight. Glassware, there was even some of that, was individually wrapped in store-bought tissue paper. One at a time, as she took out each item and admired each bit of handiwork, Diana wondered how and when her mother had managed to amass such a treasure without arousing Diana's suspicions. After opening the last box, she rode her bike over to the Albertsons and called home from the grocery store payphone. "'What's wrong?' Max demanded when he heard her voice. Long-distance calls cost money. Did you get in a car wreck or what? Nothing's wrong, Diana told him. Just let me talk to Mom. But when Iona came on the phone, Diana was so overcome with emotion that she could barely speak. When did you have time to make all that stuff, Mom? It's wonderful, but how did you do it? 
For years, Diana kept her mother's answer buried in the furthest reaches of her memory. Now it came back to her. Love always makes time, Iona had said. Remembering those words now left Diana awash in a sea of guilt. Love always makes time. Measured against her mother's performance, Diana's relationship with Davy seemed a gigantic failure. She was too busy with her own concerns and ambitions to pay attention to Davy's day-to-day -day needs. Stung by guilt, she was still so busy justifying her continued survival in the face of both her mother's death and her husband's suicide that she forgot to pay attention to the quality of that survival. Luckily for her and for Davy, Rita was there to take up the slack. I'll do better, Diana promised herself. If I live long enough, I swear I'll do better. She peeled the final layer of tape from the box, releasing the lid. In moments, Diana went from remembering her cardboard hope chests to what could only be called hopeless chests, from boxes filled with promise to ones packed with crushed dreams and dashed hopes. That's all Iona Dade Cooper's boxes contained. All the while, the unopened boxes sat stored in the root cellar. Diana had imagined them packed with her mother's few prized possessions, the treasures arranged with the same loving care Iona had used to pack the boxes she sent to Eugene. Except these boxes held no treasures. What was stowed there hardly qualified as personal effects. Francine Cooper had gone through her new husband's house, Iona's house, packing up only what she didn't want, the inconvenient onion chopper with its broken blade, the battered metal pie tins Iona used only as a last resort when the season's current crop of fruit, pumpkin in the fall, mincemeat in the winter, rhubarb in the spring, and fresh peach in the summer, had swamped her supply of good Pyrex pie plates. There were ragged hot pads and oven mitts, not the good ones Iona had used for company meals and church dinners, but the old ones she had used only for canning, and that, by rights, should have been thrown out with the trash long before they were stuffed into boxes. Resolutely now, Diana ripped open the tape on each succeeding box. One rattled ominously as soon as she picked it up. At the bottom of that one, she found the smashed remains of the only really nice thing Iona Dade Cooper had ever owned, a Limoges salt and pepper shaker set she had inherited from her own Grandma Dade, clattered brokenly around in the bottom of the box without even a paper towel as protection against breakage. Grim-faced, Diana set a few things aside on the table to keep. The rest was swept into a waiting trash can. Only in the bottom box, the heaviest one, did Diana strike gold. There were books in there. The whole frayed green set called My Book House, from which Iona had read her daughter countless fairy tales and poems and fables. Seeing the books, Diana felt a flash of recognition. From these volumes she had gained her love of reading, her fascination with the written word. She pulled out each book individually, thumbing through the pages, glancing at the familiar illustrations, remembering her favorite stories, wishing Davy knew them the way she did. And then, in the very bottom of the box, stuffed in hastily, perhaps, so Max wouldn't see, was the real treasure, the one item of her mother's that Diana had really wanted and had counted lost her mother's well-worn Bible. Reverently she picked it up. One corner of the cover had been permanently bent back. She opened the book gently, trying to smooth out the wrinkle. As she did so, a paper fell out. Picking it up, she found it was actually three papers, welded by age into a tightly folded, brittle mass. Carefully she undid them. The outside was a letter. Folded into that were two other pieces of paper, a yellowed newspaper article and a small, flower-covered funeral program dated August 16, 
1943. She glanced at that first, wondering whose it was. Harold Autry Deason. Harold Deason? Who was he? She had never heard of anybody by that name, although she read right there on the program that Harold's parents were George R. and Ophelia Deason. George had a son, Diana wondered. How come she never knew about him? How come nobody ever mentioned him by name? She turned to the newspaper article. The paper was brittle and flaked apart in her hand, but it was from the Le Grand Herald on August 11, 1943, and it told how Harold Autry Deason, only son of George R. and Ophelia Deason, had died in a one-car crash on the highway halfway between Wallawa and Enterprise. Heading back to base at Fort Lewis near Seattle after being home for a weekend, Harold's car had slammed into the highway embankment and then skidded across the road, ending up in the river. There was no clue as to what caused the accident, although the sheriff theorized that he may have braked to avoid hitting an animal that had wandered onto the road, or else he had fallen asleep. Either way, Harold Autry Deason was dead on impact. Reading through the account of the accident, the whole picture of Diana's family history suddenly shifted into focus. She started crying long before she ever picked up the letter. It was little more than a note, but Diana knew instinctively what was written there. Not exactly, not the details, but the general outline. Dearest Diana, Harold had written in a hastily scrawled, immature hand, Thank you for tonight. I don't care what my mother says. You may be Catholic and my mother's Mormon, but that doesn't matter, not to me, and it's not a good enough reason for us not to be together. I can't make it home from Seattle again for at least a month, but when I do, we'll run away together to La Grande or Pendleton or maybe even all the way to Spokane. If we come back married, no one will be able to do anything about it, not even my mother. Please be ready. Love, Harry. Diana let the paper drift from her hands onto the table. She didn't need to count on her fingers. Max and Iona Cooper were married in September of 43. She was born in May of 44. No wonder George Deason had brought her Waldo. George Deason had been her real grandfather. But why hadn't someone told her the truth? Under normal circumstances, Davy would have fought tooth and nail at any suggestion of a nap, but that day, when Rita lay down on her old-fashioned box-spring mattress with its frail metal headboard, Davy climbed up onto the bed while Bone settled down comfortably on a nearby rug. Because of the cast, Rita lay on her back with her arm elevated on pillows. Davy nestled in close to her other side and fell sound asleep. Davy slept, but Rita didn't. She looked around the room, grateful to be home, glad to have survived whatever the mill-gun doctors had dished out. To be fair, Dr. Rosemead was a whole lot different from the first white doctor she'd met, an odd-looking little man with strange rectangular glasses and a huge red-veined nose who had been called in for a consultation when she first got sick in California. The Baileys hadn't needed another girl of all work, so Gordon found her a job at a farm a few miles up the road. There, barely a month later, she began to feel tired. A cough came on, accompanied by night sweats. She tried to hide the fact that she was sick, because she didn't want to risk losing her job and being sent home, but finally, when the lady found her coughing up blood, she sent Rita to bed and summoned the one itinerant doctor who treated the Valley's Indian and Mexican laborers. Dr. Aldous was his name, and Rita never forgot it, no matter how hard she tried. He came to see Dancing Quail in the filthy worker's shack where she lay in bed, too sick to move. He examined her and then spoke to the foreman who waited in the background to take word to the farm owner's wife. "'We'll have to take the baby,' the doctor said. "'The girl may live, but not the baby. 
Go bring my things from the car. Ask the cook to set some water boiling. The doctor came back to the bed and loomed over dancing quail. It's going to be fine, he said. Everything's going to be okay. Those were the exact same words Dr. Rosemead had used all these years later. But with Dr. Aldous, everything was definitely not okay. His breath reeked of alcohol. He swayed from side to side as he stood next to her bed. No, Dancing Quail pleaded, struggling to get up. Leave my baby alone. But he pushed her back down and held her pinned until the foreman returned, bringing with him the doctor's bag and a set of thick, heavy straps. Somehow the two of them strapped her to the bed frame, imprisoning her, holding her flat. The doctor pressed an evil-smelling cloth to her face. Soon Rita could fight no longer. She woke up much later, once more drenched in sweat. The straps were gone. She felt her flattened belly and knew it was empty. She was empty. The straps were gone, and so was her baby. She cried out. Suddenly Gordon was there, leaning over her in the doctor's stead, his broad face gentle and caring. "'Why didn't you call me?' he asked, speaking in Papago. "'Why didn't you send someone to tell me you were sick so I could come take care of you?' Rita couldn't answer. All she could do was cough and cry. Around four, Rita shook Davy. "'Wake up,' she said. "'Fat crack will come soon, and I must be ready.' Davy sat up, rubbing his eyes. "'Ready for what? Where are you going?' "'To cells. For a ceremony.' "'What kind of ceremony? Do you have to leave again? You just got here.' "'It's important,' she said. "'The ceremony's for you, Olhoni. His eyes widened. "'For me? Really?' she smiled. "'Really. The singers will start tonight.' On the fourth night you will be baptized. A medicine man will do it. A real medicine man? What will he do? Don't ask so many questions, little one. You will see when time comes. He will baptize you in the way of the Tohono O'otham. Have you spoken to the priest yet? Priest? Davy returned. Oh, the, the one out at San Xavier? Rita nodded. Mom saw him this morning. She said he was coming to see me today. This afternoon, I guess. I don't know why. Rita sighed in relief. Father John had asked, and Diana had consented. I do, she said. Listen, Olhoni, you must listen very carefully. You are very old not to be baptized, not in your mother's way and not in the Indian way either. Most people are baptized when they are babies. This is not good, so we are going to fix it. I asked Father John to speak to your mother, because where the Anglo religion is concerned, it is better for Milgan to speak to Milgan. Do you understand? Davy nodded seriously, but Rita doubted she was making sense. When Father John comes to see you, do whatever he asks. But what will he ask? He will speak to you of the Milgan religion, of your mother's religion. But I thought you said a medicine man— Olhoni, Rita said sternly, you are a child of two worlds, a child with two mothers, are you not? Davy nodded. Then you can be a boy with two religions, two instead of none, isn't it? Davy thought about it a moment before he nodded again. So tonight, Rita continued, whenever Fat Crack comes to get me, I will go out to cells and be there for the start of the ceremony. I will return during the day, but each night I must go again. On the fourth night, the last night, you will come too. Either your mother will bring you or I will come back for you myself. Will there be a feast? he asked. Yes. Now get up. 
I need your help. Davy scrambled off the bed. What do you want, Nanadot? Over there in the bottom drawer of my dresser there is a small basket. Bring it. Davy did as he was told, carrying the small rectangular basket back to the bed. What's this? he asked. My medicine basket. As he handed it to her, something rattled inside. What's in it, Nana Dodd? Can I see? With some difficulty, Rita had managed to pull herself up on the side of the bed. Now she patted the mattress, motioning for Davy to sit beside her. You'll have to, she smiled. I can't. Davy worked at prying off the tight-fitting lid. It was a testimony to understanding woman's craftsmanship that even after so many years, even with the repairs Rita had made from time to time, the lid of the basket still fit snugly enough that it required effort to remove it. When it finally came loose, Davy handed the opened basket back to Rita. One at a time she took items out and held them up to the light. After looking at each one, she handed it to Davy. First was the awl, the awish, Rita called it. Davy knew what that was for because he had often watched her use the sharp tool to poke holes in the coiled cactus to make her baskets. Next came a piece of pottery. What's that? Davy asked. See the turtle here? Rita asked, pointing to the design etched into the broken shard. Davy nodded. This is from one of my great-grandmother's pots, Olhoni. When a woman dies, the people must break her pots in order to free her spirit. My grandmother kept this piece of her mother's best pot and gave it to me. Next she held up the seashell. Grandfather brought this back from his first salt-gathering expedition, and this spine of feather is one my father once gave to his mother when he was younger than you are now. The clay doll was used for healing. Next Davy saw a hank of black hair. What's that? he asked. It's something we used to use against the ob, the Apaches, Rita explained. Something to keep our enemies away. At the very bottom of the basket were two last items, a piece of purple rock and something small made of metal and ribbon. What are those? A spirit rock, Rita answered, holding up the fragment of geode. A rock that's ordinary on the outside, but beautifully colored on the inside. And that? he asked. That is my son's, she said softly, fingering the frayed bit of ribbon. Gordon's, his purple heart. The army sent it to me after the war. What war? The Korean, she said. Did your son die too? Navy asked. I guess she answered. He joined the army during World War II and stayed in. He never came home after Korea. The army said he was missing, but he's been missing for twenty-six years now. I don't think he's coming home. His wife, Gina's mother, ran off someplace. With no husband, she didn't want a baby. I took care of Gina the same way I take care of you. Rita looked down at the little cache of treasure lying exposed on the bedspread. Put them all back for me now, Davy. I want to take them with me. One at a time, with careful concentration, Davy put Rita's things back in the basket, and then he fitted the lid on tightly. I've never seen this basket before, have I? he asked, handing it back to her. 
She took it and slid it inside the top of her dress, where it rested out of sight beneath her ample breast and above her belt. No, Orhoni, you have to be old enough before you can look at a medicine basket and show it proper respect. Am I old enough now? You have not yet killed your first coyote, she said, but you are old enough to see a medicine basket. By four o'clock that afternoon, Carlyle had set up camp on the rocky mountainside overlooking Diana Ladd's home in Gates Pass. Using Myrna Louise's cash, she had bought an AMC Matador from a used car dealer downtown who claimed to be ugly but honest. So far, that seemed to be true of the car as well. The layers of vinyl on the roof were peeling off and the paint was scarred, but the engine itself seemed reliable enough. He had constructed a rough shelter of mesquite branches. The greenery not only provided some slight protection from the searing heat, it also offered cover from which he could spy on the house below without being detected. Sitting there with his high-powered binoculars trained on the house, he watched the comings and goings, counted the people he saw, and planned his offensive. During the long hours he had to fight continually to stave off panic. In all his adventures this was the very first time things had gone so totally wrong. He bitterly resented the fact that his own mother was the main fly in the ointment. In taking the valiant, Myrna Louise had complicated his life immeasurably. For one thing, she had forced him to spend some of his limited cash on a new vehicle. More seriously than that, Margie Danielson's gun was still in the trunk of the car Myrna Louise had stolen right out from under his nose. So was Johnny Rivkin's suitcase, for that matter. The bag containing the clothing and wigs Andrew Carlyle had planned to use for his getaway. But far more serious than all the others put together was the loss of time. Everything had to be compressed and hurried, without opportunity for the kind of careful planning Andrew Carlyle considered to be the major prerequisite for getting away with this particular murder. Instead of having days to work out the logistics of his attack against Diana Ladd, it would have to be done in a matter of hours. He would have to retrieve the damning evidence from his mother either before or after the main event. Carlyle knew that his mother hated staying in hotels, and she had severely limited resources besides. Like an old warhorse, she would, in all likelihood, head directly back to the barn, unless, of course, the cops picked her up for reckless driving somewhere along the way. The very thought of that possibility caused his heart to beat faster. Damn that woman, anyway. He'd teach her to interfere. A door opened in the yard below. He trained his binoculars on a long-legged Diana lad. Tanned and wearing shorts and a tank top, she emerged from the back of the house carrying a tall plastic trash can that she emptied into a rusty burning barrel at the far end of the yard. Then, using a series of matches, she set fire to the contents of the barrel and stood watching them burn. While she tended the fire, a huge black dog gambolled up to her and dropped a tennis ball at her feet. Obligingly, the woman picked it up and threw it across the yard. The dog raced off at breakneck speed to retrieve it. They played like that for several minutes. When the woman went inside a short time later, so did the dog, still carrying the ball and leaving Andrew Carlyle sitting alone on the mountain, pondering this newest wrinkle in his well-laid plans. That dog would have to go, he thought. He worried about the gun she was wearing. Someone might have warned her. Why else would Diana Ladd be walking around with a leather holster strapped to her hip? Of the two, the gun and the dog, the dog was really far more serious. Surprise could take away any advantage having a weapon gave her, but the dog could bark and rob him of the initiative. Andrew Carlyle thought about the problem for some time, considering the issue from every angle like a scientist dealing with some small but pesky detail that stands in the way of completing a major project. When the idea finally came to him, he acted on it at once. Sticking to the thin cover as much as possible, 
He made his way down the mountainside and back to the matador, which he had left parked at a shooting range parking lot half a mile away. Once in the car, he headed for the nearest grocery store. Cheap hamburger was easy to find in any part of town, but liquid slug bait wasn't. For that, he would have to go a little farther afield, to a top-notch nursery halfway across Tucson proper. He hurried through traffic, careful not to speed, not calling any undue attention to the all-too-distinctive red and black car. A nice white Ford would have been better, but the Matador's price was right. Besides, he didn't expect to keep it for long. Driving was easier than sitting on the mountain watching the house. It calmed his nerves. The more he thought about it, the more determined he was that he would be careful. Just because he'd been forced to telescope his plans didn't mean he had to blunder around or make any more costly mistakes. Letting Myrna Louise slip away was bad enough. But if things worked out the way he hoped, he'd soon have her back in hand. They say it happened long ago that a woman lived near the base of Babo Kivari Mountain with her husband and her baby. During the day, the husband would go to work in the fields that were close to the village. After working hard in the fields, he often did not want to make the long trip home, so he would stay in the village and visit with friends. This made the woman sad, but she stayed with her baby and waited for her husband, who did not come home. One night, when the woman was all alone, she heard Ban, Coyote, call. But this was not the usual call of Coyote, so she went out to look for him. It was very dark. At first she could not see, but finally she saw his eyes, glowing like coals in the firelight. He was a large, old Coyote, but even when she came close to him he did not move. At last she came close enough to see that he was lying beside a pool of water. Brother, she said, for this was when the Tohono Ho'otham, the desert people, still knew Iitoi's language and could speak to the animals. Large old coyote, why did you call to me? I came to this pool to drink the water, he told her. This rock shifted and trapped my foot. Will you help me? So the woman moved the rock, but by then the large old coyote's foot was so badly injured that he still could not walk. So the woman fed him and watered him and nursed him back to health. She called him Old Lame Coyote. In the evening, when the woman's husband did not come home and she was very lonely, Old Lame Coyote would tell her news of the desert, where to find honey, when the rains would come again, where the best pinion nuts could be found. In this way, the lonely woman and lame old coyote became good friends. Once she got out of the car, it was all Myrna Louise could do to make it into the house and down the hall to her room. Without taking off her clothing, she fell sideways across the bed. She was no longer angry with Andrew, and she hoped by now that he was over being angry with her. It was too bad that whenever they spent any time together they always ended up quarreling. She was awakened by a knock on the door, and there was Lida from next door, holding the newspaper and two pieces of mail. "'Back so soon?' Lida asked. "'From the way Phil talked this morning, I thought you'd be gone for at least a week. I already told the newspaper boy to stop delivery, just like Phil said, but he had to deliver today's and maybe tomorrow's. Here's your mail. I picked that up, too. No sense leaving it for someone to go snooping through. Myrna Louise stared blankly. Lida's words made no sense. She had stopped the paper and was collecting the mail? What was going on? I'm sorry, Lida, Myrna Louise said. I'm not feeling well. No wonder you came back. I was afraid the kind of trip Phil was planning would be too much for you. Driving to the Grand Canyon isn't my idea of a picnic. Grand Canyon, Myrna Louise thought. Who's going there? It was more than Myrna Louise could stand. You'll have to excuse me, Lida. I've got to go back and lie down. 
Brandon Walker took off right at five. He drove straight to the house. He parked the Galaxy and pocketed the keys. Then he drove his mother's olds to the hospital. Luella was sitting in the ICU waiting room. Brandon had planned to stay at the hospital for only a few minutes. But as soon as he saw his mother's ravaged face, he knew there was trouble. She ran to him and buried her head against his shoulder. "'I'm so glad you're here,' she sobbed. "'I've done what the first doctor said. I've turned off the machine. The nurse told me I could go in now and wait, but I'm afraid to be there alone. Stay with me, Brandon, please. Stay until it's over.' What could he do? Tell his mother he had a prior commitment? Taking Luella gently by the shoulders, he looked down into her grief-stricken face. "'I'll have to make a phone call,' he said. "'You won't leave me, will you?' "'No, Mom,' he said, shaking his head. "'I'll be right back.'" Chapter 19 Sorting through Iona's boxes was all the emotional baggage Diana could handle for one day. Gary's would have to wait. When she finished, she carried the garbage outside, dumped it, and set fire to the trash barrel. As she stood there watching it burn, she felt a peculiar satisfaction, the lifting of a lifetime's burden. Diana watched the flames lick through Iona's ancient oven mitt, and understood at last why her mother considered herself damaged goods, why she had stayed with Max Cooper no matter what. Iona owed him. He grudgingly lent Iona the use of his name for her baby, for Diana, thus saving Iona's family and reputation from savaging by Joseph's sharp-tongued scandal-mongers. But Iona paid a heavy price for that dubious privilege, paid with every waking and sleeping moment of her life. The flames in the burning barrel soared higher, kicking up and over the surrounding metal. In the leaping flames, something else caught fire, something more than just Francine Cooper's useless cast-offs. Max Cooper's hold on his supposed daughter was being consumed as well. At last, Diana grasped why Max had despised her so why he had hated her and berated her for as long as she could remember. She understood now why he had so resented the Rodeo Queen escape hatch that a resourceful Iona, with George Deason's timely help, had managed to open for her. But knowledge brought with it an ineffable sadness. If only she had known the truth earlier, while there was still time to ask her mother about her real father, or maybe even ask George Deason himself. Would he have told her, if she had asked him on one of those endless Saturday mornings when it had been just the two of them out in the corral with Waldo? Would things have been different if she had known the old man was really her grandfather? What was it the Bible said? The truth will set you free? Was Diana Cooper Ladd free now? Maybe. She felt lighter than she had in years. As the flames charred through the debris, not only did Max lose his grip on her, so did the past. Just then, Bone dashed up and dropped a tennis ball at her feet. With a laugh, she ruffled the dog's shaggy head, then threw the ball for him as hard as she could. Eagerly, he raced off after it, returning with it, prancing and proud, tail a wag. "'You funny old dog,' she said, and threw the ball again. Over and over she threw the ball— over and over he brought it back. It surprised her to find that each time Bone retrieved the ball, the silly, pointless game made her laugh. Laughter felt good, and so did the hot sun on her back. "'Come on, Mr. O'O,' she said at last, when the dog was panting so hard his scrawny sides shook. "'Let's go inside, cool off, and figure out what's for dinner.' After their naps, Davy and Rita entered the main house to the surprising but familiar smell of baking tortillas. In the kitchen they found Diana struggling with stiff wads of tortilla dough, waxed paper, and a rolling pin. A stack of misshapen tortillas sat on a platter next to a smoking electric griddle. The tortillas were amazingly ugly, thick in some places, 
punched full of holes in others. Some were more than slightly burned, but for a first attempt they weren't too bad. Rita touched one of the balls of dough still sitting in a mixing bowl on the countertop. A little more shortening next time, she suggested. Then you can pat them out by hand instead of using a rolling pin. Mom, did you make these all by yourself? Davy asked wonderingly. Can I have one? If you're brave enough, Diana told him, they're pretty pitiful. Slathering a load of peanut butter on one side, Davy tried a bite and diplomatically pronounced the tortilla almost as good as Rita's. With a second peanut butter covered tortilla in one hand and a plain one for bone in the other, Davy and Ho Oh went outside to play. Rita sat down beside the kitchen table and watched Diana work. The Anglo woman seemed self-conscious under the papago scrutiny, but she kept on rolling the dough and tossing the resulting crooked sheets onto the waiting griddle. While I was just lying there in cells, Rita began, I was thinking about how you helped me after Gina died, when people wanted me to leave because I was bad luck. Forget it, Diana said determinedly. What they thought doesn't matter. I've been delighted to have you with me. With us, she added. But it does matter, Rita returned. I thought I was leaving there just to go somewhere and die. But helping you and taking care of Davy gave me back my luck. It made me young again. The other day the doctor said I was dead in that ambulance. But thinking about Davy made me want to live, made me want to come back. Diana Ladd put down the rolling pin and brushed her hair from her sweat-dampened face, leaving a white smudge of flour on her face. Rita, Davy has always been as much yours as he is mine. You are the one who spent all the time with him, who's taught him things and taken care of him. If you're worried about the Indian baptism, don't be. Father John told me about it this morning when I saw him at San Xavier. He did? Diana nodded. He explained the whole thing. Good, Rita said. You don't mind? No. How could I mind? When will it happen? Because of the... Um, Rita paused, groping for the proper word. What she felt coming toward them was far more serious than mere danger. Weak as it sounded, that was the only mill-gun word she could think of to express the problem. Diana Ladd would not understand the word ob. Because of the danger to us all, Rita continued, the baptism ceremony starts tonight. It will continue for four days and nights. Four nights from now we go to cells for the last night of singing and for the feast. On that night the medicine man feeds the child's parents gruel made from corn and clay. Diana made a face. That sounds even worse than my tortillas. But it won't kill me, will it? Rita smiled. No, it won't kill you. What about you? Diana asked. You said parents. I'm only one. Will you eat the gruel with me, Rita? The two of us can be Davy's parents together. The offer came from a generous heart and caused a dazzling smile to suffuse Rita's worn face. She looked twenty years younger. Yes, Nawaj, she said softly. We will eat the gruel together. Just then, out in the yard, Bone started up a noisy racket. They heard him scrabbling over the high stone wall just as Davy burst in through the back door. A car's coming, Davy announced. Oh, oh, went after it. I couldn't stop him. Dusting the flower from her hands, Diana hurried to the window and looked out. An unfamiliar late-model Buick was easing into the driveway, while Bone, up to his usual tricks, attacked the front tires for all he was worth. Diana recognized Father John before he rolled down the window. Oh, oh, she called sharply. Here. 
With one final offended woof, the dog abandoned his attack and came to the porch, where Diana led him into the house. "'It's Father John,' she told Davy. "'Take Bone back outside and keep him there while I bring the company into the house.' Father John entered the house warily, holding his hat in front of him. "'That's quite some dog you've got there,' he said. "'Are you sure it's safe?' "'Believe me, Bone's exactly the kind of dog we need at the moment,' Diana returned. "'But don't worry. Davy took him outside. "'Would you care for something to eat?' "'No, no, thank you. I, I just came to speak to the boy. "'Something to drink, then? Iced tea? Tea would be fine.' Diana started for the kitchen, but paused when she found the kitchen doorway blocked by Rita's stocky frame. The old woman stood staring at the priest. Eventually Rita moved aside and let Diana pass, but she did so without taking her eyes away from Father John. For a long moment the two old people faced one another in awkward silence. When Father John had invaded the hospital room in cells, it had been without Rita's knowledge or permission. The man who came there was the same one who had abandoned her years earlier, the one who had caused her to be sent away in disgrace. But now, by helping with Davy, Father John had redeemed himself somewhat in the old woman's eyes. She no longer saw him through a cloud of bitterness. The old woman broke the silence. "'Thank you for helping with Davy,' Father John nodded. "'I was,' he said. "'Friend, it's is nothing.' He moved into the room. At once his eyes were drawn to the large basket hanging on the wall over the couch, a plaque, actually, two and a half to three feet in diameter. Schooled in the subtle aesthetics of Papago Indian basketry, the priest immediately recognized the superior workmanship in the rare yucca root basket. The red design, a finely woven rendition of the traditional papago maze, spread out in the four sacred directions. At the top stood the square-shouldered man in the maze. Father John studied the basket for some time before turning to Rita. "'You made this?' he asked. She nodded. "'Understanding woman taught you well,' he continued. "'It is very beautiful.'" Back on the rocky mountainside with a styrofoam meat package full of poisoned hamburger, Andrew Carlyle thanked his lucky stars that he had taken the precaution of climbing up to reconnoiter one last time before approaching the house. While he watched in dismay, the crazy dog set up a frenzied roar of barking and then vaulted over the fence to attack an approaching car. Carlyle couldn't believe it. The ugly mutt charged the front tires of the still-moving vehicle as if he were going to tear them apart. Christ! How had the dog done it? That stone wall must be at least six feet tall and it hadn't slowed him down one damn bit. Carlyle knew that if he tried approaching the house on foot, the dog would have him for lunch. So the problem was finding a way to get the poison to the dog without losing either an arm or a leg in the process. Through binoculars trained on the household below, Carlyle saw the woman hustle the dog inside while a man, who appeared to be a priest, got out of the car and started for the house. The man went in the front door while the dog and the child came out through the back. The boy left the dog pacing in unhappy circles on the rear patio. Clearly the dog wanted in. If he was generally an inside dog, it wouldn't be long before someone relented. Carlyle realized he would have to act quickly. Carlyle's first problem was to lure the dog out of the fenced backyard. Having witnessed the frenzied attack on the Buick, that didn't seem difficult. Carlyle figured just showing his face would be enough to provoke the dog into another battle. The trick was maintaining enough of a safety margin to make escape possible. Carlyle hiked back down to the matador and drove as near the house as he dared, stopping just beyond a sharp curve that concealed the car from anyone inside the house. 
After turning the car around so it faced back in the opposite direction, Carlyle took the slug bait laced meat with him and walked to the middle of the roadway. First he dropped chunks of meat in a wide pattern over the pavement. Then, lying down flat on the rocky shoulder, he whistled one short, sharp burst. At once the dog responded with a fit of barking. Carlyle whistled again, and the dog barked again. Someone came to the back door. Diana herself emerged from the shadow of the patio and surveyed the area, using one hand to shade her eyes from the glare of the setting sun. Carlyle kept his head low to the ground and prayed that no other traffic would appear on the road. Satisfied there was nothing amiss, Diana spoke to the dog. Quiet, Bone. It's all right. Be still. Carlyle heard her voice floating up to him from below. The very sound of it was enticing. Hearing her voice, combined with the knowledge that he was almost within touching distance of her, gave him an instant erection and made his breath come in short, harsh gasps. If you only knew, little lady, he thought, stifling an urge to laugh, the dog's smarter than you are. Below him, the sliding glass door slammed shut behind her as Diana Ladd returned to the house. For a moment, Carlyle was afraid she might have taken the dog with her. He breathed a sigh of relief when he peered over the bank and saw that the dog was still pacing restlessly in the yard below, still staring up in his direction. He whistled again. "'Come here, little doggie,' he whispered under his breath. "'Nice little doggie. Come and get it.' This time the dog made no sound at all. He simply leaped over the wall and came crashing up the embankment. Carlyle waited until the last possible moment before making his dash for safety. He had spread the meat over a wide segment of the roadway so the dog would be sure to find it. Now he ran straight through the meat to his car so the dog—bone was a funny name for a dog—following his scent would be led directly to the poison. Carlyle jumped into his matador and drove away, hoping against hope that his plan had worked. After that, Iitoi struck the water with his stick. The bank broke, and the water from the lake and from all the oceans ran together. And then Iitoi, who could make himself either very large or very small, climbed into the basket he had made, and Ban, Coyote, climbed into his hollow cane, and the waters began to rise. Soon the waters rose high enough to wash them away. Iitoi told Ban to follow him to the west, but Coyote did not listen, and the waters continued to rise. Soon all the villages on the flat were covered with water, and the people drowned. The people who lived near Gihuo Th'og, Burden Basket Mountain, saw the water coming. They hurried to the highest part of the mountain, thinking they would be safe, but as the water came up, the mountain split in two, and all the people were drowned. In another part of the valley, a very powerful medicine man led his people up to the highest mountain and told them that there they would be safe. As the water rose, the medicine man sang a powerful song, and the mountain rose higher and higher. The water rose and fell, rose and fell, until it had risen and fallen four times. Then the Indians on the mountain were happy, because everything in nature goes by fours, and they thought that now they would be safe. The medicine man said that there would be a great feast, and the people began to get ready, some cooking, some grinding corn. Now it happens that the people had with them on the mountain only one gogs, one dog. The people sent dog down the mountain to see how high the water was. Dog went to the edge of the mountain, and then he stretched himself and came back. The water is going down, dog said. It will not rise again. And right then, at that very moment, as dog spoke, all the people on the mountain were turned to stone. They changed to stone just as they were when Dog spoke, some cooking, some eating, and some grinding corn. If you go to the place called Superstition Mountain, you can see them to this day. 
And that is why, Nawaj, my friend, you must never permit a dog to speak to you, for if you do, you may be turned to stone. Davy and Father John were talking quietly at the kitchen table. Rita had returned to her room. After cleaning the kitchen, Diana had barely started reading the newspaper in the living room when the dog whined and scratched at the front door. How did Bone get back out front? Diana asked irritably as she hurried to let him in. She was worried that he might make a dash for the kitchen and scare Father John. Instead, the dog plodded in slowly, shambled past her without even looking up, and walked directly into the opposite wall with a resounding thump. Oh, oh, she said alarmed. What's the matter with you? Bone stood splay-footed, long tail tucked between his legs, head down. He swayed drunkenly. Davy, hearing the concern in Diana's voice, called from the kitchen, Mom, what is it? I don't know. Something's wrong with Bone. I let him inside, and he walked straight into the wall. Davy hurried into the room, followed by a still apprehensive Father John. The dog, who had once seemed so ferocious, now showed absolutely no interest in attacking the priest. Instead, he put one tentative foot in front of the other and tried to walk, only to fall down flat on his belly. "'That dog's been poisoned,' Father John announced decisively. "'I've seen it before. We've got to get him to a vet.' "'Poisoned?' Diana repeated. "'How can that be?' "'Look at him. I had a dog die of poisoning once. He came inside acting just like this. The vet said that if I'd brought him in right away, he might have saved him. There's no time to lose.' Uncertain what to do, Diana glanced at her watch. A quarter to six. The vet's office would close in fifteen minutes. Rita appeared just then. "'What's wrong?' she asked. "'It's oh, oh Father John thinks he's been poisoned. We'd better load him in the car. Davy, Rita, come on. We'll all go.' Rita shook her head. "'Fat Crack will be here soon. You go on. If we all go, Davy and I will just be in the way. We'll wait here. I'll call Dr. Johnston and tell him you're coming.' On the floor between them, Bone's body shook convulsively. One look at the suffering animal convinced her. "'All right,' Diana said. "'You stay here.' Diana knelt beside the quaking dog. "'Bone, come,' she ordered. With a whimper, the dog tried valiantly to get up, only to stumble and collapse once more. Diana attempted to pick him up by herself, but he was well over a hundred pounds of dog, far more than she could lift or carry. "'Father John, would you help me load him into the car?' "'Of course.' Lifting together, they raised Bone off the floor and carried him outside. "'My car's out back,' Diana said, heading that way. "'No,' Father John corrected. "'We'll take mine. It's closer.' They reached the car and eased the stricken animal into the back seat. As Diana straightened up, she found that Davy had followed them and was starting to climb into the car with Bone. Diana stopped him. "'You stay here with Rita,' she ordered. "'If she has to leave before I get back, you can go along with her.' Davy, close to tears, barely heard her. "'Is O, -O going to die?' he asked. "'I hope not, but I don't know,' Diana answered grimly. She climbed into the car and closed the door behind her while the priest started the engine. Before driving out of the yard, Father John stopped the car beside the distressed child and rolled down his window. "'Remember how we were talking about prayer a while ago?' the priest asked. Davy nodded. "'Would you like me to pray for Bone?' The boy's eyes filled with tears. "'Yes, please,' he whispered. "'Heavenly Father,' the priest said, bowing his head, "'we pray that you will grant the blessing of healing to your servant Bone, that he may return safely to his home.' We ask this in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Does that mean he'll be all right now? Father John shook his head gravely. When God answers prayers, he can say either yes or no. Right now it's too soon to tell. You keep on praying while we take him to the vet, okay? Okay, Davy said, his voice quavering. I will.
Andrew saw the priest and the woman drive away in a hurry. The dog was with them in the car. They were probably taking the mutt to a vet. Maybe it would work, but he doubted it. He had put enough slug bait in that hamburger to choke a horse. This was, however, one very large dog. Carlyle turned back toward the house in smug satisfaction and saw the boy walk dejectedly back into the house. Everything had worked like a charm, just the way he'd planned it. The boy was as good as his. It was stupid of Diana to leave him there alone, but that was her problem. Diana was gone, and the boy was unprotected, and Andrew Carlyle wanted Davy in the very worst way. Sliding down the mountain, not caring now whether or not he stayed out of sight or made too much noise, Andrew Carlyle started toward the house. He had spent seven long years waiting for this moment. Now that it was finally starting, he could barely contain himself. Diana Ladd was going to make it all worthwhile. At ten minutes to six, when the phone rang in the house on Weber Drive, Myrna Louise was waiting. She had gone out to the car to bring in her suitcase from the trunk, and had subsequently discovered everything hidden there. Her bank book, her blank checks, the gun, the bag of lime, and the luggage with someone else's name on it. She didn't bother to open the luggage. It had been stolen from someone else, as surely as her own savings account book had been stolen from her. And her cash, too, as she discovered moments later. For half an hour now she had sat quietly in her rocking chair, wondering what it all meant. She had already assimilated the idea that Andrew, her own son, had meant to kill her, would have killed her, if she hadn't taken the crazy notion into her head to drive off in the car. Sure knowledge of Andrew's murderous intentions had shocked her at first, but initial shock had worn into fuming anger. Now she sat rehearsing what she would say to him when Andrew finally called her, as she knew he would. She had considered turning him in herself, but decided against it. Someone else would have to do the dirty work, not her, not his own mother. But if the cops happened to come to her house looking for him, she wouldn't raise a hand to stop them. Constantly rephrasing her speech, she decided to tell Andrew that if he ever came near her again, if he ever darkened her doorstep or wrote her a letter or even so much as tried to contact her by phone, she would see to it that he rotted in prison for the rest of his natural life. How did that sound? Andrew had finally stepped beyond Myrna Louise's considerable threshold of tolerance. Having once reached the end of a rope, she determined to no longer have a son— she would declare him null and void. As far as she was concerned, Andrew Carlyle would cease to exist. So when the phone finally rang, it was his voice she expected to hear on the other end of the line, whining and blathering. Instead, the voice was that of a total stranger. "'Is Andrew there?' the man asked. Myrna Louise's heart skipped a beat as she tried to conceal her disappointment. "'Who's calling, please?' she asked guardedly. A friend of his, the man said. Is he there? Not right now. May I take a message? It sounded as though the person on the other end of the line let out a long sigh, but Myrna Louise couldn't be sure. No, he said. That's all right. I'll call back later. He hung up, slammed the phone down in her ear, actually. She hung up, too, sitting there for a long time afterward, with her hand still resting on the receiver. She wished it had been Andrew on the phone, so she could have had it out with him once and for all, but it wasn't. For that, she would have to wait a little longer. The human body isn't quite like anything else, Brandon Walker thought. People talk about pulling the plug, but just... Turning off life-sustaining machines doesn't necessarily mean it's over, doesn't mean the person gives up the ghost and dies the way a light goes off when you disconnect a cord from the socket. It wasn't that simple. Nothing ever is. The machines had been silenced for over an hour now, but Toby Walker stubbornly clung to life, persisting in breathing on his own, much to the doctor's surprise and dismay. 
His blood pressure was gradually falling, but there had been no marked or sudden change. Nurses looked in on them every once in a while, respectfully, as though conscious that their presence was now an intrusion, not a help. Their concern focused on the two non-patients, a woman, quiet at last, worn out from continual weeping, and a man, the son, whose narrow jaw worked constantly, but who sat beside his dying father, stiff and straight, dry-eyed and silent. Brandon Walker had forgotten he was a cop in all this, forgotten that there was another duty calling. Sitting there, he was nothing but a grieving son, a lost, abandoned, and nearly middle-aged child, facing his own bleak future in a universe suddenly devoid of its center, an unthinkable world where his father didn't exist. The three people waited together in a room where the silence was broken only by the old man's shallow breathing. No words were necessary. They had all been spoken long ago, and Brandon was convinced that in that broken shell of a man on the bed there was no one left to listen. Detective G. T. Farrell was well outside his Pinal County jurisdiction. He should have contacted the local law enforcement agencies, either Maricopa County or, in this case, the Tempe Police Department, to ask for backup, but that would have taken time. Farrell knew in his gut there was no time to lose. He was propelled forward by the common force that drives all those who pursue serial killers, the horrifying and inevitable knowledge that time itself is the enemy. Refusing to be rushed, Farrell had systematically worked the problem, marching down the Spalding column in the phone book, calling each number in turn, always asking for Andrew, a first name Andrew, rather than giving out any further information. He had tried Spalding's in Phoenix proper. Next he worked the suburbs. Halfway through that process, a frail-sounding old woman answered the phone. As soon as he asked for Andrew and heard the sharp, involuntary intake of breath, he knew he had hit paydirt. Even while he talked to her, making sure his voice on the phone stayed calm and noncommittal, he was frantically tearing the page with her name on it out of the book. This was no time for scribbling notes. But once in the car, Farrell couldn't risk lights or siren. That would have raised too many unpleasant questions had anyone stopped him. He drove only as fast as the traffic would bear. A resourceful man, who always carried a selection of maps in his car, Jeet headed east on Camelback in the general direction of Tempe, using crosstown stops at lights and the usual rush-hour slowdowns to locate the exact whereabouts of Weber Drive and to pinpoint the address in his Thomas Guide. Farrell figured it would take him about forty-five minutes to get there. His actual elapsed time was thirty-eight minutes flat. Getting out of the car on Weber Drive, half a block away from the address, he patted his holster and felt the reassuring presence of his thirty-eight special. It was possible that the old woman had lied, and that her son had been right there in the room with her all along, but Farrell doubted it. The old woman didn't sound as though she was that glib or that fast on her feet. She wasn't that capable a liar. At least... Jeet Farrell fervently hoped she wasn't. Taking a deep breath, Farrell opened the gate, strode up the long walkway, and rang the doorbell. Almost immediately he heard movement inside the small house. He swallowed hard to calm himself as the door opened, and an old woman peered near-sightedly out at him through a screen door. "'Yes?' she asked. "'Carefully,' Using deliberate gestures, he brought out his badge. "'I'm a police officer,' he said, holding it up to the screen so she could see it. "'I'm looking for Andrew Carlyle.' The woman squinted at the badge without reading it. "'He isn't here,' she said. "'Could I talk to you, then? Are you his mother?' "'For the time being,' she answered. Farrell wondered what that meant— he wondered, too, if she recognized his voice from the phone. If so, her next question gave no hint of it. "'What do you want with him?' "'We want to ask him some questions, that's all,' Farrell answered. 
There are a few matters we need to clear up. Me too, the old woman added, opening the screen door, motioning him inside. I have some matters I'd like Andrew to clear up for me too. Something in the woman's injured tone suggested a switch in tactics from investigator to sympathizer, from potential enemy to ally. "'What kind of matters, ma'am?' Farrell asked innocently. "'He stole my money, for one thing,' she answered with ill-concealed fury. "'My money and my bank books. Then, when he saw I was leaving, he was so angry that I think he would have killed me if he could have gotten close enough, but I fooled him. I drove away all by myself. I drove all the way here. Can you believe it?' Andrew never thought I would, and neither did I. After all, I'm sixty-five years old and had never driven a car before in my life, but I did. So help me, I did. I wouldn't have done it, either, if he hadn't treated me so badly. "'Maybe you ought to tell me about it, ma'am,' Jeet Farrell said. "'This could be important.' Davy was surprised when he saw the bald-headed man standing outside the glass patio door. The man was wearing funny brown-colored clothes, the kind with plants painted on them that soldiers sometimes wore in the movies. "'Nana Dodd,' he called. "'Someone's here.' Davy expected the man would wait outside until Rita came to the door to talk to him. Instead, he shoved the door open and stepped inside. "'Who are you?' Davy demanded. "'What do you want?' "'You,' the man answered. "'You are what I want.' The man lunged for him. Davy tried to dart out of the way, but the man was too quick. He caught Davy by one arm, spinning him around. He swung the child up in the air and held him two feet off the ground. "'You were talking to somebody, kid. Who was it? Where are they?' "'I'm right here,' a woman's voice said behind him. "'Don't hurt him.' "'Nana Dodd,' the boy complained. "'He just came right in the house. He didn't even knock.' Suddenly the man's arm clamped tight around Davy's throat, choking off his air. He kicked and fought, but he couldn't get away. The last thing he heard before he blacked out was the man saying, "'I don't have to knock, because as long as I have you, I own the place. Isn't that right, old woman?' Davy didn't see Rita's answering nod. It was true. As long as he had Davy, Andrew Carlyle could have anything else he wanted. Around the Pinal County Sheriff's Department, Detective Jeet Farrell had a considerable reputation as a ladies' man. With men, he could be tough and hard-nosed as hell. But with women, he gentled them along until even the bad ones offered to give him the shirts off their backs. Slowly, but Urgently, Jeet Farrell worked Myrna Louise Spaulding. He didn't rush her, but he didn't allow any unnecessary delays, either. Within minutes he had talked her into showing him the contents of the battered Valiant's packed trunk. He recognized Johnny Rivkin's name as soon as he saw the tag on the luggage, but he didn't let anything betray his exultation, because it was too soon. He needed to know more. So he led the garrulous old lady through her entire day, encouraging her to remember everything from the moment she woke up until he himself had arrived on her doorstep. Myrna Louise loved having an appreciative audience. She warmed to the telling, and was totally engrossed by the time she got to the part about going into the office in Tucson to pick up those mysterious papers with those two women's names on it. Only then, as she was telling the detective about the papers, did she fully allow herself to know what those two names meant what Andrew was really going to do. It hit Detective Farrell at the same time, like a fierce, double-fisted blow to the gut. "'Where is he now?' he demanded savagely. All gentleness disappeared from the man, transformed instantly into a single-minded intensity that was frightening to see. "'I don't know,' Myrna Louise whimpered. "'I don't have any idea.' "'We gotta find him. Where was he when you left him?' I already told you, at the storage unit in Tucson. Can I use your phone? he asked. Yes, she whispered, barely containing the despairing sob that rose in her throat. Go ahead. Help yourself. Chapter 20 
Dr. Johnston, the vet, was guardedly optimistic about the dog's chances for survival as he sifted a pinch of yellow powder into Bone's eyes. "'This is apomorphine,' he explained. "'An emetic. It gets into the bloodstream through the conjunctival sacs. It'll make him barf his guts out within minutes. He's certainly exhibiting all the classic symptoms of slug-bait poisoning. Where'd he pick it up?' "'I don't know,' Diana said. "'He was fine just twenty minutes or so earlier when we put him outside. He came back in acting drunk. He could barely walk.' The vet shook his head. "'You've got a neighbor who hates dogs.' "'I don't have any neighbors,' Diana started to say, and then stopped. A chill ran down her spine. Perhaps this was it, she thought, the beginning of what Rita called the wind coming to the windmill, the reason she was wearing a gun. "'You'd better go on out now, Diana,' Dr. Johnston warned. "'The bone is going to be one miserable dog here for a while.' But if we caught it as soon as you say, he should pull through. I'd like to keep him overnight, though, if you don't mind. But Diana did mind. She dreaded the idea of going home without the dog. Bone was her first line of defense. She glanced at her watch. It wasn't dark yet. It wouldn't be for some time. But once it was, she wanted the dog with her. I'd rather wait if it's not going to be too long. Suit yourself, Dr. Johnston said. It won't take long, but it isn't going to be pretty. Half an hour earlier, and 120 miles away, Pinal County Homicide Detective Jeet Farrell had considered his options and hadn't liked any of them. He tried calling Brandon Walker directly, but there was no answer, either at his office or at home. Farrell refused to waste any more time in stationary phoning, but he didn't want to abandon his questioning of Myrna Louise Spaulding either. There might be more she could tell him, details he had so far neglected to ask. Farrell flung the phone back on the hook. You do know what he's up to, don't you? Myrna Louise nodded. I do now. I'm going to try to stop him, the detective continued grimly. Will you help? I'll need you to come with me. Yes, Myrna Louise answered, rising unsteadily to her feet. I'll do whatever I can. Just let me get my purse. They left Weber Drive in a spray of gravel and headed for I-10. Once across the Pinal County line, Detective Farrell switched on lights and sirens and drove like a bat out of hell. They sped south on the interstate through the hot desert evening, while Farrell's mind grappled with the problem on three different levels. First, he dealt with the car, navigating with fierce concentration. Second, he played radio tag, trying to get a good enough connection to be patched through to someone in Tucson who could actually help him. Third, he listened to Myrna Louise Spaulding's seemingly endless story. It wasn't until a Pinal County dispatcher hooked him up with the counterpart dispatcher in Pima, a guy named Hank Maddern, that Farrell finally felt as though he was talking to somebody real, somebody with a sense of urgency. "'What can I do for you, Detective Farrell?' Maddern asked. Brandon Walker told me to expect your call. Where is he? At the hospital. His father's dying. Sorry as hell to hear it, but this can't wait. You gotta get him on the phone for me. Why? Tell him we got trouble. Tell him it's bad. I just don't know how bad. It could take some time, Maddern cautioned. They're in the ICU at Tucson Medical Center. Can anyone else help? Considering what Myrna had told him about Carlyle's illegal purchase of police records, and what Farrell himself knew about the graft and corruption in the Pima County Sheriff's Office, the detective was leery about bringing in any more players whose loyalty might be questionable. Maddern sounded like the genuine article, but Farrell remained skeptical. Someone high in Duchesne's administration had helped Andrew Carlyle at least once before. It might very well happen again. I don't want to have to brief someone else if it isn't necessary, Farrell hedged. Try getting through to Walker. I'm just now passing Picacho Peak. If you can't reach him within a matter of minutes, then we'll have to do something else. By 6.30, Wanda Ortiz, Fat Crack's wife, was finishing the last batch of tortillas. She had started out early that morning by making six dozen tamales, a big vat of pinto beans, and another of chili. With a dozen preparations left to do before the singers arrived, she was hot 
sweaty, and tired. She was also annoyed. She was annoyed because her mother-in-law, Juanita, had refused to lift a finger to help her. Real Presbyterians didn't participate in pagan baptisms, Juanita had archly informed Fatcrack when he had gone to his mother's house asking for help. She wouldn't lend her support to looks at nothing's crazy idea, not even as a favor for her own sister. So Wanda had done all the cooking herself, not complaining, but with a layer of very unchristian-like anger seething just beneath her seemingly placid surface. This was Wanda's second church-related battle with her mother-in-law in less than a month. The first had been over whether or not Juanita's grandchildren would attend Presbyterian Daily Vacation Bible School. Juanita had won the skirmish hands down, since the Presbyterian Church also happened to own the reservation's only swimming pool. There were times, Wanda thought, slapping the last tortilla on the griddle and picking it off with nimble fingers, that she wished all the Anglo missionaries would go back where they came from. Even Fat Crack's Christian science studies sometimes provoked her. Wanda was still nursing her grudge when Looks at Nothing pounded on the door with his walking stick. She wasn't especially happy to see him, either. At that particular moment, the Indian medicine man was more trouble than all the others put together. "'What is it?' she asked curtly, wiping her hands on her apron. "'Where is your husband?' "'Taking a nap. He has to stay up all night with the singers. He wanted to sleep before going to get Rita.' "'We must go now,' looks at nothing said urgently. "'It's started.' Wanda shook her head. Gabe had given her strict orders not to wake him up until seven. He had spent the whole afternoon dragging a stalled BIA road grader out of a sandy wash, and he had wanted to sleep as long as possible. Looking at the agitated old man, Wanda wondered if perhaps he was crazy in addition to being blind. "'No,' Wanda replied. "'Nothing has started yet. It's too early. The singers don't come until nine. "'Not the singers,' he snapped. "'The ob. We must go quickly, or it will be too late.' In Dr. Johnston's waiting-room, Diana Ladd alternately sat and paced, while Father John thumbed through a worn pet-food catalogue. She berated herself for leaving Rita and Davy home alone, for being stupid about waiting for the dog, for not accepting Brandon Walker's offer of help. When Dr. Johnston's receptionist got up to leave, Diana asked to use the phone. The phone at home rang nine or ten times without anyone answering. That in itself wasn't alarming. When Rita was out in her room, she and Davy sometimes didn't hear the phone ringing. Just as Diana started to hang up, Rita answered. Hello. Rita, it's me, Diana. Is everything okay there? Okay. Rita's voice seemed distant, hollow. Yes, everything here is okay. Bone still with Dr. Johnston, Diana rushed on. We're waiting for him. We'll be home as soon as we can. Did Davy tell you he can go with you if you have to leave before I get home? No. Rita replied, "'He didn't tell me, but that's good.' Rita hung up, too preoccupied to think it odd that Rita had answered the phone instead of Davy. Without leaving the desk, Diana decided to swallow her pride and call Brandon Walker. The least she could do was let him know what had happened and ask for his advice, but he wasn't in. With a frustrated sigh, Diana sat back down. It was probably just as well. What she and Rita planned for Andrew Carlyle should be kept totally secret. If she talked to Brandon Walker, she might accidentally let something slip. Father John glanced at her. "'The dog's going to be fine,' the priest said reassuringly, misreading her agitation as concern for bone. "'We got him here so soon after it happened that I'm sure he'll be okay.' Diana nodded, but said nothing. According to Rita, things were still all right at home, 
But with Andrew Carlyle on the loose, the dog was really the least of her worries. She sat there wishing she'd left the forty-five at home with Rita. It's taking so long, she said, glancing at her watch for a, the second time in less than a minute. Some things can't be rushed, Father John replied. Diana started to argue, and then thought better of it. What Father John didn't know wouldn't hurt him. If he thought she was only worried about the dog, so be it. Now that he was actually inside Diana Ladd's house, Carlyle felt downright invincible. His plans were working perfectly. Still holding the boy, Carlyle ordered the old woman to sit down on the couch. She did so at once. Her immediate compliance gratified him. Carlyle was sure that holding the boy hostage would work exactly the same magic on Diana Ladd. With Davy in jeopardy, she would have to submit to his every demand, give him whatever he wanted, when and how he wanted it. The phone blared, startling him so that he almost dropped the child. He held the knife to Davy's throat. "'Answer it!' he growled at the old woman. "'Try anything funny and the boy dies!' Clumsily, Rita heaved herself off the couch and hobbled over to the phone. Carlyle nodded with satisfaction at her curt answers. As far as he could tell, she made no attempt to pass along any secret messages. "'Who was it?' he asked when she put the phone back in the cradle. "'Diana, lad!' the old woman nodded. "'What did she say?' "'She'll be back soon.' "'Good,' he said. "'We'll be waiting, won't we?' Pull the cord out of the wall. The old woman hesitated, as though she didn't understand him. He brandished the knife over the now fully awake boy. Seeing the knife, the boy regarded him through terrified eyes, but he made no effort to fight. I said pull it out, Carlyle repeated. No more phone calls. Rita yanked the phone cord from its receptacle, and Carlyle smiled. Good. Now back on the couch. He almost laughed aloud at the way the old woman jumped to do his bidding. He was enjoying having them all by the short hairs. Carlyle knew firsthand how abject submission works. If he had learned nothing else, his tormentors in Florence had taught him that lesson well. He had seen how, in order to avoid pain, victims can become so eager to please that they transform themselves into willing participants in their own destruction. The old woman's reaction was a textbook case. Diana Ladd's would be as well. With the younger woman, though, he would have to be careful. Pacing would be everything. He would have to restrain himself in the beginning and not go too far. The kind of dehumanizing submission he wanted from her would take time and effort and a certain amount of finesse. There were those in the prison community who took the position that raping a rapist qualified as poetic justice, and maybe even as a kind of aversion therapy. Well, Andrew Carlyle was here to tell those jokers that it hadn't worked out that way for him. Physical violation hadn't cured him at all. Instead, it had only added fuel to his Diana Ladd bloodlust, giving him something else to blame her for. He'd spent years planning every move of his campaign against her. He wouldn't settle for anything less than total capitulation. He looked forward to having Diana Ladd crawling naked on the floor before him. He wanted to see her on her hands and knees, subject to his every whim. He wanted the pleasure of hearing the bitch beg. Carlyle sat the boy down on one end of the couch and ordered him to stay still while he tied up the old woman. Busy with the twine, Carlyle found he was having difficulty concentrating. His whole body pulsed with eagerness for the coming confrontation. What would happen in those first crucial minutes, he wondered? Would she fight or give in at once? Would the very sight of him strike terror in her heart? Would she guess what was in store for her? He didn't think so. The others hadn't. Why should she? For the first time, Carlyle considered whether or not she'd bring the priest back with her. He hoped not. Carlyle was not a religious man, nor was he terribly superstitious, but the idea of killing a priest lacked appeal. Not only that, 
He was reluctant to expend his energies on any side issue that might dull his appetite for the main course. "'What are you going to do?' the old woman asked, intruding rudely into his thoughts. He didn't answer immediately. Finished tying her one good hand to the cumbersome cast, he went to work binding her swollen ankles together, hobbling her like a horse with the short lengths of twine he had cut up and brought along for that express purpose. Advance planning was everything. "'Whatever I want,' he replied nonchalantly, "'I'm going to do whatever I want.' Diana was about to call home again when Dr. Johnston returned to the waiting room. It was almost seven, a whole hour after the veterinarian's office had been scheduled to close. "'I think we're over the hump now,' Dr. Johnston said. "'He's been one sick puppy, but I believe he's going to be okay. Plenty of rest, plenty of liquids. Tell Davy not to overtax him for the next few days.' He's probably through the worst of it, but we'd better cover your car seat with some old blankets, just in case. Dr. Johnston's assistant, a burly teenager named Scott, carried the ailing dog back out to Father John's car and laid him gently on a layer of hastily assembled blankets. With a huge sigh, the dog put his chin on his front paws and closed his eyes. "'Call me in the morning.' Dr. Johnston said, and let me know how he's doing. Diana replied with a grateful nod. I'll call first thing. That was weird, Scott said, as Father John's Buick pulled out of the office parking lot. What's weird? Dr. Johnston asked. How come that lady was wearing a gun? A gun? Was she really? Dr. Johnston sounded startled. I was so concerned about the dog that I never even noticed. The old woman sat silently at one end of the couch. Carlyle ordered Davy to the opposite end, where he began tying the boy up as well. He wanted his prisoners relatively immobile, but easily transportable when necessary, because Carlyle had no intention of playing out his whole game in Diana Ladd's house. It was fine for the first major skirmish to take place here. Invading Diana's private territory and bloodying her there was an essential part of his psychological warfare against her. But after that, after he'd humiliated her and established a pattern of absolute control, then he would take his prisoners to the cave, to Gary Ladd's own special cave for dessert. Carlyle theorized that the isolated cave by what had once been Rattlesnake Skull Village was eminently suited to his purposes. No one, not even that wise-ass young detective, had ever figured out that the cave, not the Charco, had been the actual scene of Gina Antone's last moments on this earth. During the pre-trial proceedings, Carlyle had made absolutely sure that no one knew of the existence of Gary Ladd's manuscript with its whining references to the cave. Once he left three more bodies there to rot, he would have all the more reason to see that Gary Ladd's crude manuscript disappeared off the face of the earth. Too bad Myrna Louise hadn't thrown that in the burning barrel instead of Savage. She would have been doing something useful for a change. He thought longingly about the cool, dark cave, about how the timeless limestone walls would swallow up whatever agonized sounds his particular brand of pleasure might wring from his captives. In that dusky cave, with the added luxury of total isolation, no one would interrupt him or interfere with the process. There, once and for all. Carlyle had tried explaining that same thing to Gary Ladd years before, the morning after their little debacle, but the man had been hysterical when he learned the girl was dead, astounded that things had got so far out of hand while he slept. Even then things would have been fine if Ladd hadn't lost his nerve and gone back later to move the body so she could have a proper burial. The fool dumped her in a waterhole, for God's sake, thinking people would be stupid enough to believe she had drowned. With a rope burns around her neck and her nipple bitten off? 
What the hell kind of dumbass idea was that? And then, a week later, if Carlyle hadn't stopped him, Ladd would have gone to town and confessed for them both, taking his tell-tale manuscript with him. Thanks a lot, buddy, but no thanks. Carlyle shivered at the tantalizing memory, letting his imagination travel back to the cave, remembering that long-ago desert night and the girl. Despite her objections, he had coaxed her into that huge and immensely silent place. He had started a small fire, for light, he had told her, but light wasn't all the fire was for, not at all. He had other plans for those burning twigs and coals. To begin with, she had liked being tied up, giggling drunkenly as he bound her, thinking it nothing but some kind of kinky game. Gradually, as she learned the terrible truth, her tipsy laughter changed, first to fear, and then to terror, and dread, as the tenor of the night changed around her. Carlyle hadn't much liked her screaming when it finally came to that. Screaming showed a certain lack of delicacy and finesse on his part. He much preferred the small, animal-like whimpers of pain and the begging. God, how her begging had excited him! Even though it was in a language he didn't speak, he had understood her well enough. He hadn't stopped when she asked him to, of course, but he had understood. And all the while that jackass of a Gary lad was dead drunk in the pickup. When he did wake up, finally, after the fun and games were all over, Carlyle managed to convince Gary that he, too, had been an active participant in all that had gone before, that being too drunk to remember was no excuse. But she's dead, Lad had protested, as though he couldn't quite believe it. Of course she was dead. Carlyle had always intended that she would be. That was the whole idea, wasn't it? But Gary Ladd was far too cowardly to value or take advantage of what he was learning and he hadn't been smart enough to keep his mouth shut, either. Carlyle shook himself out of what was almost a stupor, and found he was sitting on the floor in front of Diana Ladd's couch. Both the boy and the old woman were tied up, although he didn't remember finishing the job. They were both watching him with strange expressions on their faces. Had he blacked out for a moment, or what? These episodes were beginning to bother him. It had happened several times of late, and it scared the shit out of him. Was he losing his mind? He'd come back to himself, feeling as though he'd been asleep, when he knew he hadn't been. Sometimes only seconds would have passed, sometimes whole minutes. He inspected the knots. They were properly tied, but he had no recollection of doing it. Somehow it seemed as though his body and his mind functioned independently. He'd have to watch that. It could be dangerous, especially in enemy territory. "'Who are you?' the boy demanded. Carlyle looked hard at the child, recognizing some of Gary Ladd's features, but the boy had a certain toughness that had been totally lacking in his father. "'Well, son,' Carlyle said in a kind tone that belied his words, "'you can just think of me as retribution personified.' a walking, talking eye for an eye. Davy Ladd frowned at the unfamiliar words, but he didn't back off. What does that mean? Andrew Carlyle laughed, giving the boy credit for raw nerve. It means that the sins of the father are visited on the sons, just like the good book says. It also means that if you don't do every single goddamn thing I say, then I use my trusty knife. And you and your mother and this old lady here are all dead meat. Do you understand that? Davy nodded. The room was quiet for a moment, when suddenly, sitting there, looking him directly in the eye, the old lady began what sounded like a mournful, almost whispered chant in a language Carlyle didn't recognize. He glowered at her. Shut up, he ordered. She stopped. I'm praying, she said, speaking calmly. I'm asking Ee Toy to help us. That made him laugh, 
even though he didn't like the way she looked at him. You go right ahead, then, if you think some kind of Indian mumbo-jumbo is going to fix all this and be my guest. But I wouldn't count on it, old woman. Not at all. Why did you do it? she asked. Do what? Why did you kill my granddaughter? Prosecutors and lawyers and police tend to limp around questions like that. Carlyle wasn't accustomed to such a direct approach. It caught him momentarily off guard. Because I felt like it, he said with a grin. That's all the reason I needed. A while later, Coyote followed the trail to where Cottontail was sitting. Brother, you tricked me back there, and now I really am going to eat you up. Please, said Cottontail, don't eat me yet. I don't want to die until I have seen a jig dancer one last time. Do this for me, and then you may eat to your heart's content. All right, said Coyote. What do you want me to do? Come with me over here, said Cottontail. First I will plaster your eyes shut with pitch. Then, when your eyes are shut, you will hear firecrackers popping. When that happens, you must dance and shout. When the dance is over, then you may eat me. So Cottontail plastered Coyote's eyes shut with pitch. Then he led him into a cane field. When Coyote was in the middle of the field, Cottontail set fire to it. Soon the cane started crackling and popping. Coyote thought these were the firecrackers Cottontail had told him about, so he began to dance and shout. Soon he began to feel the heat, but he thought he was hot because he was dancing so hard. At last, though, the fire reached him and burned him up. And that, my friend, is the story of the second time Cottontail tricked Coyote. From the sound and cadence of that softly crooned chant, someone listening might have thought Rita Antone was giving voice to some ancient traditional Papago lullaby. It included the requisite number of repetitions, the proper rhythm, but it was really a war chant, and the words were entirely new. Do not look at me, little Olhoni. Do not look at me when I sing to you. So this man will not know we are speaking. So this evil man will think he is winning. Do not look at me when I sing, little Olhoni, but listen to what I say. This man is evil. This man is the enemy. This man is Ob. Do not let this frighten you. Whatever happens in the battle, we must not let him win. I am singing a war song for you, little Olhoni. I am singing a hunter's song, a killer's song. I am singing a song to Iitoi, asking him to help us, asking him to guide us in the battle so the evil Ob does not win. Do not look at me, little Olhoni. Do not look at me when I sing to you. I must sing this song four times, for all of nature goes in fours. But when the trouble starts, when the ob attacks us, you must remember all the things I have said to you in this magic song. You must listen very carefully and do exactly what I say. If I tell you to run and hide yourself, you must run as fast as wind man. Run fast and hide yourself, and do not look back. Whatever happens, little Olhoni, you must run and not look back. Remember it is said that long ago Iitoi made himself a fly and hid himself in the crack. Iitoi hid in the smallest crack when Eagle Man came searching for him. Be like Iitoi, little Olhoni. Be like Iitoi, and hide yourself in the very smallest crack. Hide yourself somewhere, and do not come out again. Do not show your face until the battle is over. Listen to what I sing to you, little Olhoni. Listen to what I sing. 
Be careful not to look at me, but do exactly as I say. The song ended. Rita glanced at Davy, who was looking studiously in another direction. He had listened. He was only a boy, one who had not yet killed his first coyote, but she had trained him well. He would do what he'd been told. In the gathering twilight, Rita glanced at the clock on the mantel across the room. Seven o'clock. Fat Crack must come for her soon, because the singers were scheduled to start at nine. The very latest he could come was eight o'clock, an hour away. One hour, she thought, sixty minutes. If they could stay alive until Fat Crack got there, they might yet live. But deep in her heart Rita feared otherwise. As he tied them up, she had looked into Andrew Carlyle's soul. All she saw there were the restless, angry spirits of the dead Apache warriors from Rattlesnake Skull Village. They had somehow found this mill-gone soul and infected it with their evil. Andrew Carlyle was definitely the danger the buzzards had warned her about, the evil enemy who looks at nothing said was both ob and not ob, Apache and not Apache. And although the process had been started, Davy was still unbaptized. The man sat on the floor in front of her, unmoving, seemingly asleep, although his eyes were open. She had heard of these kinds of horror-sickness trances before, although she herself had never witnessed one. She knew full well the danger. Looking away from their captor, Rita stared over her shoulder at the basket maze hanging on the wall behind her. She remembered the ancient yucca she had harvested to find the root fiber to make it. Howie, a yucca, an old cactus, had willingly sacrificed itself that Diana Ladd might own this basket. And suddenly Rita knew that E.E. E. Toy had heard her song and sent her a message, even without the use of looks at nothing, sacred smoke. She would be like the plant that had given up its life so E.E. E. Toy's design could spread out from the center of the basket. Davy Ladd had become the center of Rita Antone's basket. She would be his red yucca root. Whatever you're going to do, she said softly, The boy should not see. Andrew Carlyle seemed startled, as though she had peered into his brain and read the secret plans written there. Do you have a better idea? Rita nodded. There's a root cellar, she said. Off the kitchen. Put the boy in there. I will stay with him. A root cellar? Carlyle sounded almost disbelieving. He had been worried about how to handle the growing number of hostages in case the priest showed up as well, but now here was the old lady helping out, solving the problem for him. Carlyle knew all about root cellars. There had been one in his grandmother's home, a place where he'd been left on occasion for disciplinary purposes. A root cellar would do nicely. He rushed into the kitchen to see for himself, worried now that Diana might return before he was ready. And the old lady was absolutely right. Except for a stack of musty old boxes and a few canned goods, there was nothing else there. Back in the living room he grabbed the boy and carried him into the root cellar. Then he hauled the old woman to her feet and helped her shuffle along. With both prisoners safely stashed inside the room, he slammed the door shut and locked it with the old-fashioned skeleton key that was right there in the lock. For safekeeping, he put the key in his boot, along with his hunting knife. Smiling to himself, Carlyle hurried back to the living room and stationed himself out of sight behind the door. Actually, the more he thought about it, the more he liked the idea of having those first few minutes with Diana all by himself, just the two of them, one-on-one, -on -one, sort of a honeymoon. He pulled a whetstone from his pocket and began to sharpen the blade of the hunting knife. It wasn't 
necessary. The blade was already sharp enough, but it gave him something to do with his hands while he waited. The dog had already had two accidents in the priest's car between Dr. Johnston's office and the driveway. Diana was embarrassed. The vet had been right all along. She should have left Bone there overnight to recuperate. "'I'm sorry about your car, Father,' she apologized. "'Don't worry about it,' Father John said, driving into the yard and stopping in front of the house. "'These things happen. Would you like him inside?' Diana shook her head. "'I don't think so. There's no sense taking him inside and having him be sick in there as well. If you can, take him on out to the back patio while I work on cleaning up this mess. Ask Davy to fill his water dish with fresh water and take it out there for him.' The vet had sent the ailing bone home on a borrowed leash. Using this, Father John coaxed the now docile dog through a gate at the side of the house and into the backyard. Meanwhile, Diana dealt with the lingering physical evidence of the dog's illness, removing soiled blankets from the priest's car and draping them over the wall for a quick hose-down. She was surprised that Davy wasn't waiting on the porch to greet them, but she was so busy cleaning up after the dog that the idea never quite surfaced as a conscious thought. Leaving the windows open to let the car air out, she started into the house. With his heart hammering in his chest, Carlyle watched the car pull into the driveway. Damn! The priest was there. What the hell should he do now? The man and woman in the car spoke briefly. Then the priest got out, opened the door, and bent into the back seat. What was he doing? Getting the dog? God damn! The dog was back, too! What the hell kind of constitution did that dog have? For a moment, Carlyle vacillated between following the man and staying to keep an eye on Diana Ladd. At first he couldn't understand what was going on, but then, when she pulled the blankets out of the car and turned on the hose— he realized he was getting another chance. There was time to do both. He headed for the kitchen at a dead run. Father John left the dog resting on the dusky patio and rose to go into the house. Seeing no sign of Rita or Davy, he stepped up to the sliding patio door, which had been left slightly ajar. "'Hello,' he called. "'Anybody home?' Hearing no answer, he crossed the threshold and turned to close the door behind him, just as something heavy crashed into the back of his skull. The root cellar door flew open. From the darkened kitchen, something heavy was thrown in with them before the door slammed shut again. Davy felt with his feet and realized it was a person lying flat on the floor, someone who didn't move when Davy touched him. At first the child was afraid it might be his mother, but finally he realized the still body belonged to Father John. "'It's the priest,' he whispered to Rita. Before locking them in, Carlyle had warned they would die if they made noise, so Davy and Nana Dodd spoke in subdued whispers. "'Try to wake him up,' Rita said. Davy moved closer to the man and nudged him, but the priest didn't stir. His labored breathing told them he wasn't dead. "'He won't wake up,' Davy said. "'Keep trying,' Rita told him. Diana stepped onto the porch and turned the doorknob. Suddenly, with no warning, the door gave way beneath her hand, yanking Diana into the house. Before she could make a sound, before she could reach for the handle of the forty-five, Iron fingers clamped down over her face and mouth. The razor-sharp blade of a hunting knife pressed hard against the taut skin of her throat. "'Welcome home, honey,' Andrew Carlyle said. "'You're late. It's not nice to keep a man with a hard-on waiting.' Diana shook her head wildly, struggling to escape, 
but he ground his punishing fingers deep into the tender flesh of her face. Oh, no, you don't, lady. Make one sound and everybody dies, starting with you. Chapter 21 So Iitoi -E went to see gopher boys, who guard the gates of those who live below. I need people to come help me, Iitoi -E said. I have people from the east and the west, from the north and the south, who will help me fight evil Sewani. Are there any people here who will help me fight my enemy? First, said Gopher Boys, you must sing for four days to weaken your enemy. After that, come again, and we will open the gates. Meanwhile, evil Sewani worried about how many warriors Iitoi would bring with him. So he sent Coyote to see. Coyote ran to the top of Babo Kivari and looked down just as Gopher Boys opened the gates. The people who would help Ee Toy started coming out, more and more of them all the time. It is said that long ago, if Coyote didn't like something, he could laugh and change it. So Coyote laughed and said, Will these people never stop coming? Right then the hole in the earth slammed shut and no more people came out. Coyote ran back to tell evil Siwani that Iitoi -E was on his way with many warriors. Wherever there were people who heard about the coming battle, they were happy to join forces with Iitoi. -E Finally, Iitoi's -E warriors camped for the night just a little way from evil Siwani's village. Iitoi -E called his people together. Whoever kills first in the morning will have first choice of the place he wants to live. She wanted to scream, but she couldn't, not with his hand clamped over her face, crushing her cheeks and nostrils together, cutting off her ability to breathe. Carlyle had grabbed her from behind. She felt his hot breath on the back of her neck. "'Take the gun out of the holster,' he ordered. "'Nice and easy. Hold it by the handle with your thumb and forefinger. We're going to walk over and put it down on the table very carefully.' "'Where are Davy and Rita?' she wondered. "'Where is Father John?' If he was still out behind the house, he might come in and help. The blade of the knife pressed against her skin. I don't want to cut you, baby. Blood's real messy for what I have in mind, but I will if I have to. Don't try me. The gun. Now. Faint from lack of oxygen, she thought maybe that was all he intended, strangling her. But then he eased his pincer-like pressure, allowing her to gulp desperate mouthfuls of air. The gun, he repeated. She reached for it silently, cursing Brandon Walker as she did so. He had been right, damn him. She'd never had a chance to touch the gun, to say nothing of using it. All having the gun had done was to make her stupid, to give her a false sense of security. She removed the gun from its holster and held it as she'd been told. With Carlyle clutching her from behind, they glided from door to table like a pair of grotesque waltzing skaters. That's better he muttered once the forty-five was resting on the tabletop. Much better. Now turn around and let me look at you. Where's Davy? she asked without turning. What have you done with Davy and Rita? His voice rose menacingly. I gave you an order, goddammit, turn around. He grabbed her by one shoulder and spun her toward him. The abrupt motion threw her slightly off balance. She almost fell, but he caught her by one wrist and held her upright. The knife seemed to have disappeared into thin air, but as soon as his powerful fingers closed around her wrist, Diana knew he didn't need the knife. Not really. His hands alone were plenty strong enough. "'Where's Davy?' she asked again, trying to keep her voice steady, trying not to let it expose her rising terror. He grinned back at her. "'Where's Davy?' he mocked. "'Where do you think he is? What'll you give me if I show him to you?' A kiss, maybe? A piece of tail? Carlyle's tone was light and bantering, but Diana's wrist ached from the punishing pressure of his fingers. She knew then, with a sinking heart, that strangling wasn't it. Carlyle would never let her off that easy. Someone seeing the frozen tableau from outside the window might have thought the man and woman to be lovers, standing face to face, might have imagined them holding hands and exchanging endearments in preparation for a romantic kiss. The man was smiling. 
Only a glimpse of the woman's stricken face betrayed the reality of their desperate life-and-death struggle. "'Let me go,' she started to add. "'You're hurting me,' but she didn't. Life with Max Cooper had taught her better than that. In an uneven contest where defeat is inevitable, she had learned to show no reaction at all, to deny her tormentor his ultimate gratification, the perceptible proof of his victim's pain. "'You know you're going to give me whatever I want, don't you?' he leered at her, relentlessly pulling her closer. Stealing herself, she refused to shrink away from him, refused to cringe. But even as she struggled against him, she was beginning to fear the worst. Davy and Rita were dead. They had to be. If not, they would have given her some sign, some reason to hope. "'One way or another,' Carlyle continued, "'like it or not, I'm going to have you six ways to Sunday, little lady, so you could just as well get used to the idea.' Lay back and enjoy it, as they say. Now tell me, how's it going to be? Hard or easy? She didn't respond. That was a joke, he said, laughing. <laughs> didn't you get it? By then their lips were almost touching. For an answer, she brought her knee up and rammed it into his groin. Stunned, he doubled over, grabbing himself, groaning with pain. Momentarily he let go of her hand, giving her the chance she needed— Dodging backward into one side, Diana groped for the handle of the forty-five. The gun was a mere three feet away, but it could just as well have been three miles. She picked it up and used both hands to pull back the hammer, but before she could aim or pull the trigger, Carlyle tackled her, slamming her hard against the wall, knocking the wind from her lungs, forcing her hand up into the empty air overhead. The gun discharged with an ear-splitting roar, blasting a hole in a stucco ceiling before he knocked it from her hand and sent it whirling across the room. "'That's going to cost you, bitch!' he snarled. "'That cute little trick is really going to cost you!' He came after her then in a blind heat of rage, tearing the clothes from her body, sending her sprawling. They crashed to the floor together with him on top, using Diana's body to cushion his own fall. The back of her head bounced off the Mexican tile— a kaleidoscope of lights danced before her eyes. The room swirled around her while she drowned in a sea of despair. Davy's dead, she thought. My son is dead. By the time she could see again, or breathe, or move, resistance was useless. Carlyle was on her, inside her, pounding away. Davy was still trying to waken the priest when the root cellar was rocked by the roar of gunfire. Frightened, the boy cringed against the wall. No one had to tell him what the sound meant. That terrible man, that ob, was out there with his mother trying to kill her. Maybe he already had. Out in the living room, braced by Nana Dodd's secret song, it had been easy to pretend to be brave, but now cowardly tears sprang to his eyes. Don't let him kill my mommy, Nana Dodd, he sobbed. Please don't let him. Quiet, Rita ordered. Davy was startled by the harshness in Nana Dodd's voice. Never had she spoken to him so sharply. Listen, come help me with the medicine basket. I can't get it out by myself. Davy scrambled over the priest's prone form. He felt around Rita's body until he located the medicine basket, still hidden beneath the ample folds of her dress. The basket was too large to slip out without first unfastening some of the buttons. "'Hurry!' she urged, as he struggled in the dark with the buttons and the slippery material. When the basket came free, it popped out and fell to the floor. "'Find it!' Rita ordered. "'Take off the lid and give me the owage!' Davy groped on the floor until he found the basket with its tight-fitting lid still securely closed. After some struggle, he finally pried open the lid and fumbled inside until his fingers closed around the awl. "'Here it is,' he said. "'Good. Put it in my good hand, then come close. Hold your hands steady and as far apart as you can.' "'What are you going to do?' he asked. For an answer, she poked at the twine around his wrists with the sharp point of the awl, the same way she had poked it through thousands of strands of coiled cactus. Pulled taut, the twine cut sharply into Davy's wrists. The child yelped with pain. "'Quiet!' she commanded. 
Don't make a sound, old honey, no matter how much it hurts. He bit his lip to stifle another cry. Once we are free, Rita continued, we must stand on either side of the door and be absolutely silent. When the door opens, the ob will be there. He will expect us to be tied up just as he left us. When he does not see us, he will step into the cellar. I will try to hit him with my cast or stab him with the owage. We will have only one chance. You must not wait to see what happens. Like I said in the song, you must run somewhere and hide. But what about you and my mother? Davy whispered. No matter what happens, you must stay hidden until morning, until someone you know comes to find you. Looks at nothing sat hunched forward in the speeding tow truck, as though by merely peering blindly ahead through the windshield he could somehow remove all obstacles from their path. How soon will we be there? he asked. Fat Crack was driving flat out, red lights flashing. Fifteen minutes, he said, not daring to take his eyes from the road long enough to check his watch. Ten, if we're lucky. For a time there was no sound in the cab other than the wind rushing through the open windows. We will probably have to kill him, you know, the old man said finally. Before it's over, one of us may kill the ob. Have you ever killed before? It was a startling question. Asked in the same manner, looks at nothing might have inquired about the weather. But this was no rhetorical question, and it demanded a serious answer. No, Fat Crack replied. I have, looks at nothing continued. Long ago, when I worked in the mines in Aho, I accidentally killed a man, another Indian. Afterward there was no one to help me paint my face black, no one to bring me food and water for sixteen days. That is one of the reasons Iitoi took away my sight. If you are the one who kills the ob, I will bring you food and water. If I do, will you bring it to me? As a child, Fat Crack had heard stories of how ancient Papago warriors who killed in battle were forced to remain outside their villages, purifying themselves by eating very little and by praying for sixteen days until the souls of those they killed were finally quiet. This was 1975. He was driving a two-ton tow truck, not riding a horse. After-battle ceremonies should have been a thing of the past, but they were not. Looks at nothing was absolutely serious, and Fat Crack could not bring himself to deny the medicine man's request. Yes, old man, Fat Crack replied. If you kill the ob, I will bring food and water. Luella Walker left Toby's bedside long enough to use the restroom down the hall. When she returned, she touched Brandon's shoulder. Although his eyes were wide open, he jumped as though wakened from a sound sleep. She nodded toward the door, and he followed her into the hallway. "'What is it?' he asked. "'There's a phone call for you at the nurse's station.' He seemed dazed. "'A phone call for me?' he asked vaguely. She nodded. Over there. Watching him go to the phone made her heart ache. He looked much as his father had looked years earlier, the same impatient gestures, the same lean features. But Brandon was almost a stranger to her. She had expended so much energy and concentration denying what was happening to Toby that she had totally lost touch with her son. Putting down the phone, he turned back toward her with his face contorted by anger or grief, Luella couldn't tell which. She wondered who had been on the phone. From his look, the news must have been as bad or worse than what was going on beyond the swinging door of her husband's room. "'Brandon,' she said, reaching out to him, "'what's wrong?' He pushed her hand aside and shook his head. "'Nothing,' he said irritably. "'It's work.' "'Don't lie to me,' Luella flared. "'It isn't nothing. It must be important. I can see it in your face.' To her dismay, Brandon exploded in anger. "'You're right. It is important. Terribly important. But what the hell am I supposed to do? I can't be in two goddamn places at once.' 
With her child of a husband far beyond help, Luella searched her heart for strength enough to once more be a mother to her child. "'It's all right, Brandon,' she said, giving his shoulder a reassuring pat. "'You do what you have to. Your father and I will stay right here. We'll be fine until you get back.' As Davy's hands came free, Rita's heart overflowed with thanks to understanding woman for giving her granddaughter the owage, for teaching dancing quail to be an expert with it. There was no tool Rita knew better, nothing she had held in her hands longer. At once she reached down and went to work on the twine binding Davy's feet. It was important that he be totally free and capable of running, even if her own knots were still securely tied. Breathing shallowly, the priest lay still, while no sounds at all came from the rest of the house. The ominous silence filled the old woman with misgiving. She knew some of what had been done to Gina, and she hated to think what that hook, that monster, might be doing to Diana. Whatever it was, at least Davy wouldn't see, not if he followed her directions and did as he'd been told. The twine around Davy's legs tugged free at last. Rita turned her attention on her own bindings. With one arm in a cast, it should have been much more difficult. But her craftsman's fingers quickly learned the secrets of Andrew Carlyle's crude knots, which melted apart beneath the probing point of her awe. With Davy quaking beside her, Rita began to pray. First she addressed Iitoi, asking that the boy and his mother both be granted strength and courage. Then she spoke to Father John's God, asking that the priest be spared from dying there on the root-cellar floor. Finally, to comfort herself as much as the boy, she took up the refrain of her song, crooning softly in the darkness. "'Remember what I say, little old honey. You must run swiftly and not look back. That is the only way to help your mother. That is the only way to help me.' Be like Itoi, little Olhoni. Hide in a crack and do not come out. Get dressed, he whispered in her ear, snapping her head back with a savage pull on her hair that loosened some of it from the roots. As tears sprang to her eyes, the ghost of an elusive memory fluttered briefly, but she couldn't capture it. It required all her mental stamina to resist the temptation to cry out. Earlier, Sinking his teeth deep into the tender flesh of her breast, he had elicited one involuntary gasp of pain. She had sensed his excited, eager response. She was grimly determined not to let it happen again. Carlyle let go of her hair, and she fell limply back to the bed. I said move! Diana had lost all sense of time. She might have been battling with him for minutes, or hours, or days. After his first frenzied attack, he had dragged her from the living room to the bedroom where he had assaulted her again. Survival instinct warned her to obey his commands, but her body refused. Bruised and bloodied, her flesh functioned at a level that was somehow beyond whatever further violation Andrew Carlyle could inflict. Davy's dead. The words ran through her head like a broken record. Davy's dead, and so is Rita. Grappling with catastrophe, the Diana lost all will to carry on. Whatever happened to her no longer mattered. Carlyle grabbed one ankle and twisted it until Diana was forced onto her back. She lay naked on the bed while he feasted his eyes on her. He particularly admired the series of angry bruises around her swollen nipples. He congratulated himself for his self-restraint, for being able to let go once he had fastened his teeth on her. He was saving the nipples for later. He enjoyed the look of wary watchfulness in her eyes. She must be wondering, dreading to learn what might come next. He regretted that he couldn't get it up again right that minute but there was plenty of time. He would show her that, hard on or not, he was still full of surprises. Her gritty silence annoyed him. 
Diana Ladd was one tough cookie, but he knew she wouldn't be able to deny him forever. He'd find her weakness eventually. In the face of his carefully focused efforts, she wouldn't always keep quiet. When the agonized sounds finally escaped her lips, they would be music to his ears. He'll come around, he thought, smiling down at her. Carlyle had begun the complicated process of subjugation. Having once established dominance, it was important to consolidate his control, to show Diana Ladd exactly who was boss. Stepping from the foot of the bed to the side of it, he reached down and yanked ruthlessly on the exposed mound of auburn pubic hair, pulling out a handful of the stiff, curly stuff. She winced and gritted her teeth, but again she refused to cry out. Damn her! She was deliberately spoiling his fun! He moved to the head of the bed and stood looking down at her, hoping that she'd shrink away from him and try to get away. But she lay beneath his gaze without moving, staring brazenly back at him, daring him to hit her. And so he did, slapping her hard across the face. He smiled at the rewarding droplet of blood that appeared almost instantly at the corner of her mouth. Maybe now he'd start getting through to her. He hit her three times in all, twice open-handed and once with the back of his hand. He didn't have to put much effort into it. The blows were gratuitous, stinging slaps, administered mechanically and without emotion, calculated more to humiliate than to hurt. Andrew Carlyle hit the woman primarily for effect and for his own amusement. He hit her because she dared stare back at him. He hit her because he could. It never occurred to him that hitting her was a tactical blunder. That thought never crossed his mind. Diana tasted blood in her mouth where a tooth had cut through her cheek. She focused on the salty taste, and that, combined with the teeth-rattling blows, shocked Diana out of her stunned lethargy and forced her to remember that other man who had once hit her like this, who had pulled her hair out by the roots. The sudden surge of memory galvanized her in a way Carlyle couldn't possibly have foreseen or predicted. It rekindled the spark of her old anger, relit a raging fire that lost hope had almost extinguished. Without a word, she sat up. "'Get dressed!' he ordered again flinging a pair of shorts and a tank top in her direction. "'Wear these, but no shoes. I like my serving women dressed, but barefoot.' She stared blankly at the clothing. They weren't what she'd been wearing before. Those, torn from her body in his initial fierce attack, still lay in a heap on the living-room floor. Carlyle leered at her from the doorway, savoring the marks he'd left on her sore and naked body but she refused to turn away from him while she dressed. "'Hey,' he said jokingly, "'except for a few stretch marks here and there, you got a pretty good bod. Anybody ever tell you that?' A flush of embarrassment crept up her face. She said nothing. He came over to where she sat on the edge of the bed and shoved the muzzle of the gun hard into the tender flesh of her already bruised breast. "'Don't you have any manners at all?' he demanded. Didn't your mother teach you that when somebody pays you a compliment, you're supposed to say thank you? Thank you, she murmured. That's better. Now get moving. We're going to the kitchen. I want you to fix me some dinner, or better yet, breakfast. Sex always makes me hungry. How about you? Without answering, she started for the kitchen at once, hoping he would read defeat and submission in her every action. But Diana Ladd knew she was fighting him again, and Andrew Carlyle was far too pleased with himself to notice. There were two sounds in the room, the priest's breathing and the mouse-like twitchings of Rita's owage picking at the twine. Davy wished Bone were there. He longed for the dog's comforting presence. But Bone was at the vet's, or dead now, too, along with everybody else. Forbidden to make a sound, Davy thought about what Rita had told him, for him to run away, to find a crack, to hide a crack. 
He thought about cracks, about the jagged one in the lumpy plaster beside his bed. He always examined that crack in great detail when he was supposed to be taking a nap, wondering if it had grown bigger or smaller since the last time he saw it. But a fly could never hide in there. Davy couldn't even put his thumbnail in it. Flies were bigger than that. A crack. The verse came to him, sing-song, the way he had heard it at school. Step on a crack, you break your mother's back. But that was a sidewalk crack. Again, not big enough. There was fat crack, but he wasn't a crack at all. He was a person. Then... Finally, Davy remembered the cave he and Bone had found, the chimney in the mountain behind the house. Now that he thought about it, maybe that cave wasn't a cave at all. It was a crack, a crack in the mountain. That was where he would go, where he would run to hide if he ever got a chance. Suddenly there were voices on the other side of the door. Davy's heart pounded, wondering how soon the door would fly open again, how soon before he would have to make his dash for freedom. At first Davy heard only the man's voice talking on and on, but then he heard another voice, that of a woman, softer and higher. Straining, he recognized his mother's voice. She wasn't dead after all. Rita had finally managed to free herself. Davy tugged at the old woman's hand, wanting to tell her the news, but she laid her finger on his lips, warning him to silence. Carefully they moved into position. A sliver of light had appeared under the door. They used that as a guide. They stood on either side of the door for what seemed like forever. Eventually the smell of frying bacon came wafting into Davy's nose. It was a long time since he and the bone had shared their last tortillas. The smell of that frying bacon filled Davy's nostrils and made his mouth water. His feet itched. He needed to go to the bathroom. Davy began to doubt that the door would ever open. He fidgeted a little, but Rita clamped her good hand down hard on his shoulder, poking him painfully with the awl in the process. After that, he stood quietly and waited. A hundred or so yards from the turnoff, Fat Crack doused the lights and parked the truck. He had kept the lights flashing almost the entire way, but as they neared the house he turned off everything, flashers and headlights included. "'Now what?' he asked, shutting down the ignition and parking the truck just beyond a curb that concealed the house from view. "'We go down there and try to take him by surprise.' "'Good luck,' Fat Crack returned. "'What about the dog?' "'Dog?' Rita has a huge dog named ho -Oh. When I was here earlier, he almost bit my leg off. He must be inside, looks at nothing said. Right, Fat Crack thought. Sure he is. Famous last words. With a disgusted shake of his head, the younger man hurried around to the passenger side and helped looks at nothing climb down. Moving as quietly as possible, they headed for the driveway that led down to the house. The dark made no difference to the blind medicine man, but when they stepped off the pavement, Fat Crack had some difficulty negotiating the rocky terrain. They'd gone only a few steps when Fat Crack saw, a mile or so away, the approaching headlights of another vehicle. That other car worried him. What if looks at nothing was wrong? What if the ob was only now coming to the house, only now beginning his attack? If he drove up right then, they would be trapped in the open driveway with no means of retreat or defense. "'I have my stick,' the old man was saying. "'What will you use for a weapon?' "'A rock, I guess,' Fat Crack replied. "'I don't see anything else.' "'Good,' looks at nothing said. "'Get one.' Fat Crack was bent over, picking one up, when he heard the dog. This time there was no warning bark, only a hair-raising, low-throated growl. The night was black, and Bone was a black and brown dog, totally invisible to the naked eye. 
The fat crack straightened up and looked around, expecting to fend off an all-out attack. Instead, looks at nothing, spoke forcefully into the darkness. Oh, oh, Yehub, the medicine man commanded. Bone, here. To Fat Crack's astonishment, the dog obeyed at once, materializing out of the brush beside the road. He went directly to the old man, tail lowered and wagging tentatively. Preoccupied with the dog, they failed to notice the other car again until it braked at the head of the drive. Too late, Fat Crack tugged at Looks at Nothing's arm, trying to pull him down the hill toward the meager cover of a mesquite tree. All the way from Tucson Medical Center, Brandon had cursed himself for being in his mother's car instead of the galaxy, for being cut off from all communications. If only he had talked to Mattern again, they might have coordinated some kind of game plan. As it was, the only thing he'd thought to tell Hank was for him to call Diana and warn her. He reached down and checked the thirty-eight Smith & Wesson Special in his ankle holster. Police officers were required to be armed at all times. Ankle holsters were the only feasible choice when wearing ordinary clothing. Brandon's car sped over the top of the rise and roared down the long canyon road. Ahead and to the right, he could see lights glowing peacefully in the windows of Diana Ladd's solitary house. Maybe he and Farrell were pushing panic buttons for no good reason. Walker slowed and switched on his turn signal. As his tires dropped off the hard surface onto the dirt driveway, the headlights caught two shadowy figures dodging into the underbrush ahead of him. Walker felt a rush of adrenaline. He had surprised them, caught them in the act. He jammed on the brakes, cutting the motor, turning off the lights. Expecting gunfire, he ducked down on the seat and drew his weapon. Heart pounding, he lay there waiting, with the desert night still and expectant around him. Two of them, he thought. So who had that bastard Carlyle brought along with him? Whoever it was, Brandon thought, they're going to get more than they bargained for. Not only was he here, Jeet Farrell was on his way with plenty of reinforcements. In addition, there was that god-awful dog. If those two jokers ran into bone out there in the dark somewhere— they'd have yet another rude awakening. Carlyle scrounged through the refrigerator and came away with a pound of bacon and half a dozen eggs, which he handed over to Diana. Bacon crisp, eggs over easy, toast, orange juice and coffee. Think you can handle that, honey? You know, if you're a good enough cook, maybe I'll keep you around a while. We'll play house, just the two of us cooking and fucking, not necessarily in that order. What do you think of that? Diana said nothing. Carlyle, enamored with the sound of his own voice, didn't notice. While he continued with his rambling monologue, Diana gathered what she needed for cooking. Frying pan, salt and pepper shakers, the spatula. What would happen if she turned on the gas in the oven and didn't light it? Would enough propane accumulate to cause an explosion? Or would the oven just come on eventually when the gas seeped out far enough to reach the pilot lights on top of the stove? Anything was worth a try. Diana turned on the control. She worked mechanically, trying not to think about Rita and Davy. That would divert her, take her mind away from the problem. She put a few pieces of bacon into the frying pan, started the fire under it, and loaded coffee and water into the percolator. Still talking, Carlyle had meandered into a long, self-pitying dissertation about prison life. "'Do you know what they do to people like me in places like that?' he was saying. "'Do you have any idea? Answer me when I speak to you.' "'No,' she said. "'I have no idea.' A spatter of hot fat leaped out of the frying pan as she turned the bacon, stinging Diana's wrist. She jumped back, but the pain on her bare wrist gave her the beginning glimmer of an idea. Quickly she dumped the rest of the pound of bacon into the frying pan and turned up the heat. "'How do you like your eggs?' she said. "'I already told you. Over easy. Same as I like my women. Get it?' he laughed. <laughs> Pay attention, girl. 
You pay attention to everything I say, and maybe I'll let you hang around a little longer. She nodded, knowing it was a lie, and stirred the sizzling bacon, willing the fat to render out of it, welcoming the painful spatters that found their way to the bare skin of her arm and wrist. That was Gary's problem, you know, he continued offhandedly. He didn't pay attention. That's why I had to get rid of him. Trying to shut him out, Diana almost missed Carlyle's throwaway admission. Then, when she did understand, the what of it, if not the how, she fought off the temptation to react. It was still too soon. Ducking down on the seat to make himself less of a target, Brandon waited for the bark from Bone that would signal the dog's attack, or at least alert those in the house to their danger. The expected bark never came. "'Damn!' Walker muttered. The dog was probably inside the house, sleeping on the job. The detective lay there and tried to strategize. He had to assume that both his opponents were armed and dangerous. Two-to-one odds aren't very good, especially for a cop dealing with crooks who may not care that much if they live or die. He considered honking the horn to alert the people in the house of the impending danger, but that might do more harm than good. If Diana came outside to see what was going on, she might possibly fall into the wrong hands. What if the crooks took off with her before help arrived? Finally, Walker hit on the only strategy that seemed feasible. He would attempt to make his way to the house undetected. Once inside, he and Diana could probably hold the bad guys off long enough for help to arrive and catch them in a crossfire. Once the decision was made, Walker moved to put it into action. Closing his eyes so the overhead light wouldn't rob him of night vision, he eased open the passenger door and quickly dropped to the ground. The door closed behind him with a dull thud, and he scuttled silently off into the desert, swinging wide and hoping to make it to the side of the house before Carlyle and his pal realized what he was up to. The bacon turned to hard, brittle curls in the pan, but an oblivious Andrew Carlyle continued talking. There are tools for rape, you see, things you wouldn't normally think about. But in prison you have to use whatever's handy. You'd be surprised what people get off on. This gun, for instance. What would you think if I crammed that all the way up inside you? Would it make you come? The metal gun sight might bother you a little, don't you think? Diana's stomach lurched with dread, and the hand holding the wooden spatula trembled uncontrollably. His voice rose in pitch. Look at me when I speak to you. I asked you a simple question. What would you think of it? She looked. He was grinning at her, holding the forty-five, fondling it, sensually stroking the long barrel with his fingertips. I wouldn't like it, she said. Wouldn't you? he asked, eyeing her speculatively. I think you would. Maybe after I eat we could have a lesson. I'll show you how it works right here on the kitchen table. Mr. Colt has a permanent hard-on for you. I think he'd enjoy it. He paused, as if waiting for Diana to comment. When she didn't, he bent over and pulled something out of the top of his boot. She saw him out of the corner of her eye and trembled to think that he had retrieved his knife, which he would use on her as well, but when he straightened up he wasn't holding the knife at all. Between his fingers was a key a familiar, old-fashioned skeleton key. "'Or maybe, little mama," he added with a malicious grin, "'since you don't think you'd like it, maybe I should bring that kid of yours out here and cram it down his throat, or maybe up his ass a couple inches. How much could he take? How much could you? What would you do then, Diana? Would you ask me to stop? Would you beg me to do it to you instead of him?' Would you crawl on your hands and knees on the floor and kiss my feet and beg? A shock of recognition sent needles and pins through her hands and feet. Davy wasn't dead after all. 
He was alive and in the root cellar. There was still hope, still a chance. Suddenly, frowning, Carlyle stood up. Hey, wait a minute. Aren't you burning the bacon? Putting the key down on the table and retrieving the gun, he started toward the stove. When he was three steps away, Diana grabbed the overheated handle of the frying pan and heaved it full in his face. Pieces of blackened bacon clung to his skin wherever they landed. He screamed as fiery hot fat burned through his clothing, sealing it to his skin. Diana dodged to one side as the gun roared to life, shattering the window behind her. Walker, riveted by both the ungodly scream and the gunfire, knew his worst nightmare had come true. Somehow his opponents had made their way inside and were firing guns. Someone was hit and dying. Forgetting about cover, Walker charged toward the house himself, circling around the thicket of gigantic prickly pear and coming up on the front porch from the opposite direction. He tried the door handle and found it locked. He tried kicking it in, but the stout old door didn't give way. The windows all had screens. From inside the house, Walker heard the sounds of an ongoing battle, but off to the side of the porch, the detective caught sight of movement. "'Stop!' he shouted. But two shadowy figures simply disappeared into the darkness beyond the porch. Two of them, he thought. Some inside, and at least two still out here. How the hell many of them are there? Walker wondered grimly. In silent pursuit, he moved sideways off the porch. At the side of the house, he encountered only a massive wall with a tall wooden gate. He tried the gate, but it appeared to be latched from the inside. Through a nightmare of searing pain, Andrew Carlyle tried to wipe the clinging grease from his face and eyes. He could see nothing. I'm blind, he thought furiously. The bitch blinded me. He slipped on the greasy floor and crashed into the table, banging it into the wall before managing to right himself. With superhuman effort, he pulled himself above the terrible pain. I'll kill you, he whispered hoarsely. So help me, God, bitch, I'll kill you if it's the last thing I do. Diana watched in horror as Carlyle attempted to wipe the blistering grease from his skin and eyes. Pieces of his face seemed to melt away with his hand, dissolving like the water-soaked Wicked Witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz. "'I'll kill you,' Carlyle muttered over and over. It was a chant and incantation. "'I'll kill you.' Somehow he still held Diana's forty-five. Frozen with fear, Diana stared at the weapon, waiting for the death-dealing explosion that would end her life. But for some strange reason, Carlyle didn't seem to be pointing it at her. He turned around and around, like a child playing blind man's bluff. "'Where are you, bitch?' he demanded. Only then did Diana realize that he couldn't see. The bacon grease had blinded him. Holding her breath for fear the sound might betray her whereabouts, Diana glanced around the room, looking for an escape hatch or a place to hide. On the floor beside the upended table, she spied the fallen key to the root cellar. As soon as she saw it, she dived for it, even though Carlyle was between her and the key. Hearing movement, Carlyle lunged in her direction. They collided in midair and crashed to the floor together. The force of the blow knocked the forty-five from Carlyle's hand. It spun across the floor, coming to rest at the base of the sink. Of the two, he was far stronger, but being able to see gave Diana a slight advantage. Twisting away, she eluded his grasp and retrieved the key. She scrambled toward the root cellar door and was almost there when his powerful fingers clamped shut around her ankles. She kicked at his fingers, but her bare feet had no effect on the hands inexorably dragging her away from the door. She fought him desperately but despairingly, realizing she was no match for him, that it was only a matter of time. Dimly, Diana became aware of Bones' frantic scratching on the sliding glass door. If only she could let him into the house, maybe with the dog's help. Suddenly, for the barest moment, Carlyle let go of her. She scrambled away from him, and this time managed to shove the key into the lock before he grabbed a hold of her again. She tried to push him away, only to have a smarting pain shoot across her hand and up her arm. Shocked, Diana looked at her arm and hand as blood spurted out. 
Carlyle had his knife again. This time she knew he would kill her with it. There would be no escape. Stymied by the latched gate, Brandon Walker dropped back and then vaulted over the barrier, which seemed to be covered by a layer of wet blankets. Inside the yard he landed on something soft and yielding, something human. His added weight brought the other man down. They fell to the ground as one and grappled there briefly until he glimpsed Fat Crack's face in the pale starlight. Fat Crack! Walker exclaimed. What the— It's the detective, Fat Crack said simultaneously. From deeper in the yard came Looks at Nothing's commanding voice. We must hurry. Come, he ordered. The Fat Crack let go at once, and they both struggled to their feet. In the melee, Walker had dropped his thirty-eight special. They wasted precious seconds searching for it. At last Fat Crack found it and gave it back. "'If you're out here,' Brandon whispered, "'who's in there?' "'The ob,' Fat Crack answered. "'It's the ob.' Faced with her bloodied arm and inarguable evidence of her own mortality, Diana resolved that even if she died, somehow her son would live. Once more Carlyle's fingers locked onto her ankle. Once more he dragged her toward him and toward the raised knife held above his head, waiting to plunge it into her. She searched desperately for something to hold on to, something to give her purchase on the slippery floor. Suddenly her flailing hands encountered heat, the still, fiery, hot frying pan. Ignoring the blistering handle, she picked it up and drove it with all her strength toward Andrew Carlyle's forehead. He couldn't see it, but Carlyle felt the superheated frying pan whizzing toward him. He drew back in panic, holding up his arms in an attempt to ward off the blow. The frying pan missed his skull, but struck his hand, knocking the knife away from him. While he groped blindly for it, he heard her scrabbling away from him again. Weaponless except for his bare hands, he crawled after her. Partway across the room, something rushed past him, making for the outside door. He turned to it as if to follow. The momentary respite gave Diana one more chance. This time she made it all the way to the root cellar door. Still on her knees, she reached up and turned the key in the lock. Before she could move out of the way, the door banged open knocking her backward into the wall. At the sound of the second gunshot, Davy almost burst into tears. Once more Rita shushed him. "'Ready now,' she whispered. "'When the key turns, open the door and run.' "'I'll kill you,' the man was saying over and over outside the door. "'I'll kill you.' Davy's heart leaped to his throat. His mother was still alive. Would she be when the door opened? He crossed his fingers and tried to remember how to pray. The key filled the lock. The tiny keyhole-shaped patch of light disappeared. But the key didn't turn. The door didn't open. Again they waited. Davy heard another sound now, the bone scratching frantically at the back door, wanting to be let in. Oh, oh, was home but he couldn't get inside to help them. And then, miraculously, the key did turn. Davy shoved the door with all his might, flung it open, and dashed outside. In the middle of the room he encountered a man, at least it looked like a man, crawling toward him on his hands and knees. This terrible apparition, its face a misshapen mass of bloodied blisters, must be the ob. Pausing long enough for only one look at that terrifying visage, Davy turned and raced for the sliding glass door. The pain was terrible, beyond anything he could have imagined. But what was worse, Carlyle feared Diana Ladd had escaped. He started toward the door. Where are you, bitch? Here, Diana responded from some place else in the room. I'm behind you. To decoy Davy's safe escape, she wanted Carlyle's attention focused solely on her. Where? Right here, she answered again, and it sounded as though she was laughing at him. 
doggedly, like an unstoppable monster from an old B-grade movie, Andrew Carlyle whirled and came crawling toward her. But before he made any progress, something heavy landed on his back. Horrified, he felt a dog's inch-long canines plunge into the back of his neck. Too stunned to move, and trying to stem the flow of blood from her own arm, Diana could do nothing but watch. The dog was everywhere at once, huge jaws snapping. He leaped up and backward and sideways, always staying just out of the man's reach. Finally, Bone's jaws closed over Carlyle's wrist. While the man howled in inhuman rage, the dog shook his massive head. Bones crunched in Carlyle's mangled wrist. Tendons and nerves snapped like so many broken rubber bands. Arm upraised, Owich in hand, Rita emerged from the root cellar, ready to do battle. She, too, stood transfixed, watching the man struggle to escape the attacking dog. Trying to save his mangled wrist, Carlyle attempted one last kick. The dog let go of the hand and pounced on the foot. As the dog's jaws closed once more, Carlyle folded himself into a fetal position. Rita remained where she was for a moment, surveying the room, while Carlyle sobbed brokenly. Get the dog off me! Please get him off! The Indian woman pocketed her owage. It was no longer needed. Across the room she saw both the knife and the gun. She hurried at once to retrieve them. Only when she had them both firmly in her possession did she speak to the dog. Oh, oh, Ihab! The dog came to her side at once, wagging his tail, waiting to be petted. Good gogs, she crooned, patting his shaggy head. It's over. Rita turned from the dog and placed the gun in Diana's lap. Here, she said, if you wish to shoot him, now's your chance. Do it quickly. Diana looked from Rita to the stricken form of Andrew Carlyle, who lay sobbing on the floor in a widening pool of his own urine. Finally, Diana looked down at the gun and shook her head. No, she said. I don't have to now. It wouldn't be self-defense. A radiant smile suffused Rita's weathered old face. Good, she said. Itoi would be proud of you. Behind them, Brandon Walker burst into the room. Bone turned to fend off this new attack, but before he could, the oven door blew off its hinges with a resounding thump, knocking the dog to the floor. Crying and laughing both, Diana knelt beside Bone and cradled his massive head in her lap. The dog looked up at her, gratefully, and thumped his long tail on the floor. He wasn't hurt, but it had been a hard day for a dog. He didn't want to get up. Detective Farrell and Myrna Louise arrived just ahead of a phalanx of police cars dispatched by Hank Maddern at the Pima County Sheriff's Department. For the first time in her life— she refused Andrew's summons when he asked for her. Stone-faced and without getting out of the car, Myrna Louise watched while her son was loaded into a waiting ambulance. Ironically, he was taken first. Of all the injuries, his were deemed the most serious. But not serious enough, Myrna Louise thought bitterly. Not nearly serious enough. If she'd been lucky— and she had never been lucky where her son was concerned, Andrew would have died. Someone would have put a bullet through his wretched head and taken him out of his misery the way they used to do with rabid dogs. After that, another stretcher came out of the house with someone strapped to it. The old Indian woman—what was her name again?—limped heavily along beside the stretcher and climbed into the waiting ambulance to ride to the hospital although she herself didn't seem to be hurt. A few minutes later, Myrna Louise recognized Diana Ladd. 
She, too, was carried past the detective's car to an ambulance, with a man walking along beside her. "'Thank God they weren't dead,' Myrna Louise thought gratefully. She never could have lived with herself if that had happened. Myrna Louise sat there quietly, knowing that eventually it would be her turn to answer questions. What would she say about Andrew when they asked her? "'Tell the truth,' she thought. And what would happen when the neighbors on Weber Drive found out that Andrew Carlyle was her son? Would they speak to her? Myrna Louise sighed. She could always move again, she supposed. She'd done it before. Maybe she'd get herself one of those U-Hauls. What did they call that? An adventure in moving? She'd drive herself far away and start over again, somewhere where nobody knew her. But first, she thought, she'd have to get herself a driver's license and maybe even a pair of glasses. Davy sat in the crack and waited. That's what he would call it from now on, Itoy's e -E crack. He wondered how it would feel to be a fly and to go back down to the house. He would be able to see what was happening, but nobody would know he was there. He wanted to know, and yet he didn't. He was afraid to know. His mother was still alive when he ran past her, and so was Nana Dodd. But were they still? He couldn't tell. Bone had wanted to come with him, but he had ordered the dog to stay. Now he wished he hadn't. Why didn't Bone come looking for him? Why didn't someone else? While he watched, a string of cop cars came streaming down the canyon road, lights flashing. It looked like a parade, except it wasn't. There were no floats, no marching bands. The police cars were all going to his house. What would they find there? Would his mother still be alive? When he first reached the cleft in the rock, he was panting, out of breath, afraid that the terrible man was right behind him. Now, as more time passed, he wondered who would come for him. Nana Dodd had been very specific about that. She had told him he must wait until morning, wait for someone he knew. He shifted his body. The sharp rocks behind his back were growing uncomfortable. What if they forgot all about him and nobody came? Maybe he'd end up living there forever. How long was forever, anyway? Three more sets of flashing lights came down the winding road and pulled in at the driveway. How many police cars did it take, he wondered. What was happening? He kept thinking his mother would come for him, or Rita, but the longer it went without anyone coming, the more he was afraid they were dead. What happened to you after you were dead? That was one of the things he was supposed to talk about with Father John the next time he saw him. Davy thought about Father John lying there so still on the root cellar floor, and he thought about what the priest had said as they were leaving to take Bone to the vet. How had that prayer gone? Davy squeezed his eyes shut and concentrated, trying to remember the exact words. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The Father he could understand, and he could understand the Son— but who was the Holy Ghost? Maybe, thought Davy, the Holy Ghost was e -E Toy. So he bowed his head, just as he had seen Rita do, just like Father John, and he said a prayer for his mother, for Nana Dodd, for Father John, and also for Oh. -O. He finished by praying, In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of e -E Toy. Amen. It sounded a little different, but Davy was sure it meant the same thing. Just then, as he finished the prayer, he heard a rock go scrabbling down the face of the cliff. He drew back inside the rocky cleft, making himself as small as possible, holding his breath, afraid that somehow the ob had managed to escape and was coming after him. He listened. Clearly now he could hear footsteps coming closer and closer, as though whoever was coming knew the path to the crack as though they knew all about Davy's secret hiding place. All horny! Someone was calling his name, his Indian name. 
but it wasn't Nana Dodd. Who could it be, then? No one else called him that. The voice wasn't familiar, and Nana Dodd had given him strict orders to wait for someone he knew. Then, suddenly, Bone thrust his spiked head into the entrance to the crack and covered the boy's face with wet, slobbery kisses. Behind the dog, a man's face peered in the small opening. "'All horny? Are you in there?' Weak with relief, Davy let his breath out. It was Fat Crack. "'You—' uh, he answered. "'Yes.' "'Come on, boy,' the Indian said, gently moving the dog aside. "'An old man and I are waiting to take you to the hospital.' "'Hospital?' The word made Davy's heart hurt. "'Is my mother all right?' he asked. "'Is none a dod?' "'Your mother is hurt, but not bad,' the Indian said quietly. "'Rita went with Father John. "'Come on. Everyone will be better once they know you are safe.' As soon as Davy was outside the cave, Bone careened around him in ecstatically happy circles. But the boy was not ready to play. This was still far too serious. What he had lived through that day was anything but a game. "'What about the ob? Davy asked. "'Is he dead?' "'No, now was,' Fat Crack replied. "'The ob isn't dead. But he didn't win. He's in the hospital, too. Your dog almost bit his hand off.' Rita wouldn't let him. She should have, Davy said angrily. What will happen to him now? The fat crack shrugged. The mill gun will send him back to the mill gun jail, I guess. Will he get out again? Davy asked. Who knows? Fat crack said, shaking his head. That, Olhone, is up to the mill gun, isn't it? Epilogue Wanting to be the first to kill, Rattlesnake crept close to Evil Siwani's camp, so the next morning, when the battle started, Rattlesnake killed first, and he chose the place that is now called Rattlesnake House. When the battle was finally over, Evil Siwani was dead, and his house and all his people had been destroyed. So Iitoi told the warriors who had helped him that they should choose where they wanted to live. Some people wanted to be farmers, and they went to live by the river. Since then they have been called Akimel O'Otham, or the river people. Some of the warriors were hunters, so they went to live near Waugiwulk, which means constricted rock, and which the mill gun call Babo Kivari. There they found plenty of mule deer to hunt, and lots of other good food to eat. The people who stayed there have been called Tohono Ho'otham, or the Desert People. And that is the story of how the Desert People emerged from the center of the earth to help Iitoi battle the evil Siwani, and how they came to live here in this desert country where, now watch, my friend, they still continue to live even to this day. The feast was well under way. In four days' time, word had got around the reservation that Rita Antone's luck had changed for the better. 
The ritual singing had been well attended, and the feast was a rousing success. The expense was more than Rita alone could have managed, but someone else was helping to defray the cost. Eduardo José, the bootlegger from Angam, whose grandson, Lucky One, had recently been released from the Pinal County Jail, was more than happy to help out. Rita had spent two days sitting at Father John's bedside at St. Mary's Hospital. Now she sat at the head of the long, oilcloth-covered table in the feast house at Sells. Davy, his face still bearing the tell-tale traces of red chili, sat on one side of her. Diana Ladd sat on the other. Shyly, a girl of sixteen or seventeen sidled up to Rita's chair, hanging back a moment before daring to say what she had come to say. "'I remember you,' she said, almost in a whisper. "'You used to make us eat our vegetables.' Instantly Davy's ears perked up. "'Wait a minute! You two? I thought I was the only one!' Rita laughed. "'No,' she said. "'I try to get all children to do that. Gordon taught me to eat my vegetables when I was sick in California.' "'Gordon, your son?' Davy asked. "'No. Gordon, my husband. I was very sick.' and he and Mrs. Bailey, the mill gun lady he worked for, told me that if I ate all my vegetables it would make me better, and it worked. I'm still here, aren't I? They all laughed at that, even Diana. In four days that was the first time Davy had heard his mother laugh. So maybe now she would be all right, just like Detective Walker said. He had told Davy it would take time, that the Ob Carlyle had hurt her badly, but that if they were very careful of her, she would be okay. The boy looked around, noticing for the first time that the men had all disappeared. "'Where's Fat Crack?' he asked. Rita shrugged. "'Out by the truck, I guess.' Davy promptly set off to find him. The four men gathered in an informal group around the hood of Fat Crack's tow truck. The medicine man tried to explain horror sickness to the detective. He told him it was staying sickness, and not the bacon grease that had caused Andrew Carlyle's blindness. This was all quite strange to Brandon Walker, although he tried to listen with an open mind. No one was surprised when Looks at Nothing opened his leather pouch and pulled out one of his cigarettes. Walker watched with renewed amazement as once again the old man flicked open his Zippo lighter and unerringly lit the cigarette. Upon hearing Brandon would be driving the boy and the two women out to the reservation for the baptism feast, Hank Maddern had warned his friend about not being sucked into some strange kind of peyote ritual. Brandon had quickly put Hank's worries to rest. "'Believe me,' he said, "'tobacco's the only thing in that old man's cigarettes, and it's not very damn good tobacco either.' Looks at nothing, took a deep drag, said, Now watch, and then passed it along to Father John. The priest had spent three full days in the hospital being treated for a concussion, but he had convinced the doctor that he had to be dismissed in time to go to a feast in cells on Friday. The doctor had grumbled, but in the end he had let the old man have his way. The cigarette passed from the priest to Fat Crack to the detective and back at last to the medicine man. Far to the west, a thundercloud rose over the desert. Periodically, lightning lit up the cloud's billowing interior, but the rains had not yet come. The California river toads still slept quietly in their hardened mud beds. 
He is a good boy, looks at nothing said. But I am worried about one thing. What's that? Father John asked. He was sure it would be some complaint that the other part of the bargain, the Milgan baptism, was going too slowly. But he had only just got out of the hospital that very afternoon. Davy Ladd was scheduled to be baptized during the eleven o'clock mass at San Xavier the day after tomorrow. What more did the old man want? But looks at nothing's objection had nothing to do with that. Eh, Dagith, Jok Jee, he said, calling Davy by his new Indian name. One with two mothers, this boy has too many mothers and not enough fathers. There are four of us, looks at nothing continued, and all nature goes in fours. Why could we not agree to be father to this fatherless boy, all four of us together? We each have things to teach, and we all have things to learn. As soon as Brandon heard the words, he knew looks at nothing was right. No matter how much Rita Antone and Diana Ladd loved Davy, they could not be his father. A lump caught in Brandon Walker's throat as he listened. The fatherless himself, for three days now, Brandon Walker felt for Davy Ladd almost as much as he hurt for himself. It grew quiet in the circle. No one said aloud that he would or would not accept the assignment. That was a foregone conclusion. The decision had been made for them long before they were asked. Looks at nothing had decreed it so, and that was the way it would be. Davy himself came running up just then. "'What are you guys doing?' he demanded. "'I looked around the feast house and you were all gone.' We were talking, Brandon Walker said. What about? You. About me? What were you saying? That somebody needs to take you into Tucson for a haircut, Brandon said, affectionately ruffling Davy's hair, but being careful about the stitches. You mean it? Davy asked. Honest? To a real barber? That's right. Brandon Walker replied with a slight grin. You see, Davy, mothers don't give crew cuts. Barbers do. And so concludes Hour of the Hunter by J. A. Jantz. For Books in Motion in Spokane, Washington, this has been your reader, Gene Edgeny. Thank you for listening. <laughs>